Section Zero of Between the Lines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Between the Lines by Boyd Cable, Section Zero. To the editor of the Corn Hill, Reginald John Smith, for whose helpful criticism and advice. Kindly consideration and unfailing courtesy to an unknown writer, a sufficiency of grateful appreciation can never be expressed by the author. Forward. This book, all of which has been written at the front within sound of the German guns, and for the most part within shell and rifle range, is an attempt to tell something of the manner of struggle that has gone on for months between the lines along the western front and more especially of what lies behind and goes to the making of those curt and vague terms in the war communiques. I think that our people at home will be glad to know more, and ought to know more, of what these bald phrases may actually signify, when, in the other sense, we read between the lines. Of the people at home, whom we at the front have relied upon and looked to more than they may know, Many have helped us in heaping measure of deed and thought and thoughtfulness, while others may perhaps have failed somewhat in their full duty, because, as we have been told and retold to the point of weariness, they, quote, have not understood, and, quote, do not realize, and, quote, were never told. If this book brings anything of interest and pleasure to the first, and of understanding to the second, it will very fully have served its double purpose. Boyd Cable, Somewhere in France, September 15th, 1915 End of Section Zero Section One The Advanced Trenches of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Near blank, on the dash dot front, a section of advanced trench changed hands several times, finally remaining in our possession. For perhaps the twentieth time in half an hour, the lookout man in the advanced trench raised his head cautiously over the parapet and peered out into the darkness. A drizzling rain made it almost impossible to see beyond a few yards ahead, but then the German trench was not more than fifty yards off, and the space between was crisscrossed and interlaced, and a bristle with the tangle of barbed wire defences erected by both sides. For the twentieth time the lookout peered and twisted his head sideways to listen, and for the twentieth time he was just lowering his head beneath the sheltering parapet when he stopped and stiffened into rigidity. There was no sound apart from the sharp cracks of the rifles near at hand, and running diminuendo along the trenches into a rising and falling stutter of reports, the frequent whine and whistle of the more distant bullets, and the quick hiss and zip of the nearer ones, all sounds so constant and normal that the lookout paid no heed to them, put them, as it were, out of the focus of his hearing, and strained to catch the fainter but far more significant sound of a footstep squelching in the mud, the snip of a wire-cutter at work, the low tang of a jarred wire. A few hundred yards down the line, a dazzling light sprang out, hung suspended, and slowly floated down, glowing nebulous in the misty rain, and throwing a soft radiance and dusky shadows and gleaming lines of silver along the parapets and wire entanglements. Intent, the lookout stared to his front for a moment, flung muzzle over the parapet and butt to shoulder, and snapped a quick shot at one of the darker blotches that lay prone beyond the outer tangles of wire. The blotch jerked and sprawled, and the lookout shouted, slipped out the catch of his magazine cut off, and pumped out the rounds as fast as his fingers could work bolt and trigger, the stabbing flashes of the discharge lighting with sharp vivid glares his tense features, set teeth and scowling eyes. There was a pause, and stillness, 
for the space of a couple of quick-drawn breaths, and then pandemonium. The forward trench flamed and blazed with spouts of rifle fire, its slightly curved length clearly defined from end to end by the spitting flashes. Very lights and magnesium flares turned the darkness to ghastly vivid light, the fierce red and orange of bursting bombs and grenades threw splashes of angry colour on the glistening wet parapets. The flat khaki caps of the British, the dark overcoats of the Germans struggling and hacking in the barbed wires. The eye was confused with the medley of leaping lights and shadows. The ear was dazed with the clamour and uproar of cracking rifles, screaming bullets and shattering bombs, the oaths and yells, the shouted orders, the groans and outcries of the wounded. Then from overhead came a savage rush and shriek, a flash of light that showed vivid even amidst the confusion of light, a harder, more vicious crash than all the other crashing reports and the shrapnel ripped down along the line of the German trench that erupted struggling, hurrying knots of men. A call from the trench telephone, or the sound of the burst of bomb and rifle fire, had brought the gunners on the jump for their loaded pieces, and once more the guns were taking a hand. Shell after shell roared up overhead, and lashed the ground with shrapnel, and for a moment the attack flinched and hung back, and swayed uncertainly under the cruel hail, for a moment only, and then it surged on again, seethed and eddied in agitated whirlpools amongst the stakes and strands of the torturing wires, came on again, and with a roar of hate and frenzied triumph leaped at the low parapet. The parapet flamed and roared again in gusts of rapid fire, and the front ranks of the attackers withered and went down in struggling heaps before it, but the ranks behind came on fiercely and poured in over the trench. The lights flickered and danced on plunging bayonets and polished butts. The savage voices of the killing machines were drowned in the more savage clamour of the human fighter, and then comparative silence fell on the trench. The attack had succeeded. The Germans were in, and, save for one little knot of men who had escaped at the last minute, the defenders were killed, wounded, or taken prisoners. The captured trench was shaped like the curve of a tall, thin capital D, a short communication trench leading in to either end from the main firing trench that formed the back of the D, and a prolongation outwards from it. The curve was in German hands, but no sooner was this certain than the main trench sprang to angry life. The Germans in the captured curve worked in a desperation of haste, pulling sandbags from what had been the face of the trench and heaving them into place to make a breastwork on the new front while reinforcements rushed across from the German side and opened fire at the main British trench a score of yards away. Then, before the gasping takers of the trench could clear the dead and wounded from under their feet, before they could refill their emptied magazines or settle themselves to new footholds and elbow wrists, the British counter-attack was launched. It was ushered in by a shattering burst of shrapnel. The word had passed to the gunners, careful and minute adjustments had been made, the muzzles had swung round a fraction, and then suddenly and quick as the men could fling in a round, slam the breach and pull the firing lever, shell after shell had leapt roaring on their way to sweep the trench that had been British, but now was enemy. For ten or fifteen seconds the shrapnel hailed fiercely on the cowering trench. Then, at another word down the telephone, the fire shut off abruptly to reopen almost immediately further forward over the main German trenches. From the main British trench an officer leaped. Another and another heaved themselves over the parapet, and in an instant the long level edge of the trench was crowded with scrambling, struggling men. With a hoarse yell they flung themselves forward, and the lost trench spouted a whirlwind of fire and lead to meet their rush. But the German defenders had no fair chance of resistance. Their new parapet was not half-formed, and offered no protection to the stream of bullets that sleeted in on them from rifles and maxims on their flanks. The charging British infantry carried hand-grenades and bombs and flung them ahead of them as they ran, and finally there was no thicket of barbed wire to check the swing and impetus of the rush. The trench was reached, and again the clamour of voices raised in fear and pain, the hoarse rancour of hate, the shrill agony of death rose high on the sounds of battle. The rush swept up on the trench, engulfed it as a wave engulfed the cleft on a rock beach, boiled and eddied about it, and then, and then, 
swept roaring over it and on. The counter-attack had succeeded, and the victors were pushing their advantage home in an attack on the main German trench. The remnants of the German defenders were swept back, fighting hopelessly but none the less fiercely. Supports poured out to their assistance, and for a full five minutes the fight raged and swayed in the open between the trenches and among the wire entanglements. The men who fell were trampled, squirming underfoot in the bloody mire and mud. The fighters stabbed and hacked and struck at short arm length, fell even to using fists and fingers when the press was too close for weapon play and swing. But the attack died out at last without the German entanglements being passed or their earthwork being reached. Here and there an odd man had scrambled and torn away through the wire, only to fall on or before the parapet. Others hung limp or writhing feebly to free themselves from the clutching hooks of the wire. Both sides withdrew, panting and nursing their dripping wounds, to the shelter of their trenches, and both left their dead sprawled in trampled ooze, or stayed to help their wounded crawling painfully back to cover. Immediately the British set about rebuilding their shattered trench and parapet, but before they had well begun, the spades had to be flung down again and the rifles snatched to repel another fierce assault. This time a storm of bombs, hand grenades, rifle grenades, and every other fiendish device of high explosives preceded the attack. The trench was wrecked and rent and torn, sections were solidly blown in, and other sections were flung out bodily in yawning crevasses and craters. From end to end the line was wrapped in billowing clouds of reeking smoke and starred with bursts of fire. The defenders flattened themselves close against the forward parapet that shook and trembled beneath them like a live thing under the rending blasts. The rifles still cracked up and down the line, but in the main the soaking clay-smeared men held still and hung on, grimly waiting and saving their full magazines for the rush they knew would follow. It came at last, and the men breathed a sigh of relief at the escape it meant from the rain of high explosives. It was their turn now, and the roar of their rifle fire rang out, and the bomb-throwers raised themselves to hurl their carefully saved missiles on the advancing mass. The mass reeled and split and melted under the fire, but fresh troops were behind and pushing it on, and once more it flooded in on the trench. Again the British trench had become German although here and there throughout its length knots of men still fought on, unheeding how the fight had gone elsewhere in the line, and intent solely on their own little circle of slaughter. But this time the German success was hardly made before it was blotted out. The British supports had been pushed up to the disputed point, and as the remnants of the last defenders straggled back, they met the fierce rush of the new and fresh force. This time it was quicker work. The trench by now was shattered and wrecked out of all semblance to a defensive work. The edge of the new attack swirled up to it, lipped over, and fell bodily into it. For a bare minute the defense fought, but it was overborne and wiped out in that time. The British flung in on top of the defenders like terriers into a rat pit, and the fighters snarled and worried and scuffled and clutched and tore at each other more like savage brutes than men. The defense was not broken or driven out, it was killed out, and lunging bayonet or smashing butt caught and finished the few that tried to struggle and claw away out up the slippery trench sides. Hard on the heels of the victorious attackers came a swarm of men running and staggering to the trench with filled sandbags over their shoulders. As the front of the attack passed on over the wrecked trench, and pressed the Germans back across the open, the sandbags were flung down and heaped scientifically in the criss-cross of a fresh breastwork. Other men, laden with coils of wire and stakes and hammers, ran out in front and fell to work erecting a fresh entanglement. In five minutes, or ten, for minutes are hard to count and tally at such a time and in such work, the new defense was complete, and the fighters in the open ran back and leapt over into cover. Once more a steady crackle of rifle fire ran quivering up and down the line, and from their own trenches the Germans could see, in the light of the flares, a new breastwork facing them, a new entanglement waiting to trap them, a steady stream of fire spitting and sparkling along the line. They could see, too, the heaped dead between the lines. 
and in their own thinned ranks make some reckoning of the cost of the attempt. The attempt was over. There were a few score dead, lying in ones and twos and little clumped heaps in the black mud. The disputed trench was a reeking shambles of dead and wounded. The turn of the stretcher-bearers and the Red Cross workers had come. There would be another column to add to the casualty list presently, and another bundle of telegrams to be dispatched to the next of kin. And tomorrow the official dispatch would mention the matter coldly and tersely, and the papers would repeat it, and a million eyes would read with little understanding, changed hands several times, finally remaining in our possession. End of section one. Section two. Shells of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the right, a violent artillery bombardment has been in progress. Actual extract from official dispatch. Number two platoon of the Royal Blanks was cooking its breakfast with considerable difficulty and an astonishing amount of cheerfulness when the first shell fell in front of their firing trench. It had rained most of the night, as indeed it had rained most of the past week or the past month. All night long the men had stood on the firing step of the trench, chilled and miserable in their sodden clothing, and sunk in soft, sticky mud over the ankles. All night long they had peeped over the parapet or fired through the loopholes at the German trench a hundred yards off, and all night long they'd been galled and stung by that, quote, desultory rifle fire that the dispatches mention so casually and so often, and that requires to be endured throughout a dragging day and night before its ugliness and unpleasantness can be realized. Number two platoon had two casualties for the night. A corporal, who had paused too long in looking over the parapet while a star shell flared and caught it, neatly through the forehead, and a private who, in the act of firing through a loophole, had been hit by a bullet which glanced off his rifle barrel and completed its resulting ricochet in the private's eyes and head. There were other casualties further along the trench, but outside the immediate ken of Number 2 Platoon, until they were assisted or carried past on their way to the ambulance. Just after daybreak the desultory fire and the rain together had almost ceased, and Number 2 Platoon set about trying to coax cooking fires out of damp twigs and fragments of biscuit boxes, which had been carefully treasured and protected in comparative dryness inside the men's jackets. The breakfast rations consisted of army bread, heavy lumps of a doughy elasticity one would think only within the range of badness of a comic paper's Mrs. Newlywed, flint-hard biscuits, cheese, and tea. The only complaint against the rations being too much plum jam said a clay-smeared private, quoting from a much derided eyewitness report, as he dug out a solid streak of uncooked dough from the centre of his half-loaf and dropped it in the brazier. Then the first shell landed. It fell some yards outside the parapet, and a column of sooty black smoke shot up and hung heavily in the damp air. Number two platoon treated it lightly. "'Good morning!' said one man cheerfully, nodding toward the black cloud. "'And have we not used pears soap?' "'Bless me if it ain't our old friend the coal box said another. "'We haven't met one of his sort for weeks back.' "'And it is pal Whistling Willie,' said a third, and they sat listening to the rise and fall, whistling sh 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 of a high-angle shell. As the whistle rose to a shriek, the group of men half made a move to duck, but they were too late, and the shell burst with a thunderous bang just short of the front parapet. Mud and lumps of earth splashed and rattled down into the trench, and fragments of iron hurtled singing overhead. The men cursed angrily. The brazier had been knocked over by a huge clod. Half boiling water was spilt, and worst of all, the precious dry wood had fallen in the mud and water of the trench bottom but the men soon had other things than a lost breakfast to think of. A shrapnel crashed overhead and a little to the right, and a sharp scream that died down into deep groans told of the first casualty. 
Another shell, and then another, roared up and smashed into the soft ground behind the trench, hurting no one, but driving the whole line to crouch low in the narrow pit. "'Get down and lie close, everyone!' shouted the young officer of Number 2 platoon. But the crump, crump, crump of another group of falling shells spoke sterner and more imperative orders than his. For half an hour the big shells fell with systematic and regular precision along the line of the front trench, behind it on the bare ground, and further back toward the supports trench. The shooting was good, but so were the trenches, deep and narrow and steep-sided with dugouts scooped under the bank and strong traverses localizing the effect of any shell that fell exactly on the trench. There were few casualties, and the royal blanks were beginning to congratulate themselves on getting off so lightly, as the fire slackened and almost died away. With the rest of the line, number two platoon was painfully moving from its cramped position and trying to stamp and shake the circulation back into its stiffened limbs, when there came a sudden series of swishing rushes and sharp vicious craps overhead, and ripping thuds of shrapnel across and across the trench. The burst of fire from the light guns was excellently timed. Their high velocity and flat trajectory landed the shells on their mark without any of the whistling rush of approach that marked the bigger shells and gave time to duck into any available cover. The one gust of light shells caught a full dozen men, as many as the half-hour's work of the big guns. And then the heavies opened again as accurately as before and twice as fast. The trench began to yawn in wide holes and its sides to crumble and collapse. Number two platoon occupied a portion of the trench that ran out in a blunted angle, and it caught the worst of the fire. One shell falling just short of the front parapet dug a yawning hole and drove in the forward wall of the trench in a tumbled slide of mud and earth. A dugout and the two men occupying it were completely buried, and the young officer scurried and pushed along to the place shouting for spades. A party fell to work with frantic haste, but all their energy was wasted. The occupants of the buried dugout were dead when at last the spades found them, and broken fingernails and bleeding fingertips told a grisly tale of the last desperate struggle for escape and for the breath of life. The officer covered the one convulsed face and staring eyes with his handkerchief, and a private placed a muddy cap over the other. "'Get back to your places and get down,' said the officer quietly, and the men crawled back and crouched low again. For a full hour the line lay under the flail of the big shells that roared and shrieked overhead and thundered crashing along the trenches. For a full hour the men barely moved, except to shift along from a spot where the shaken and crumbling parapet gave insufficient cover from the hailing shrapnel that poured down at intervals, and from the bullets that swept in and smacked venomously into the back of the trench through the shell rifts in the parapet. A senior officer made his way slowly along the sodden and quaking trench. He halted beside the young officer and spoke to him a few minutes, asking what the casualties were and hoping vaguely they would ease off presently. "'Can't our own guns do anything?' asked the youngster. "'Or won't they let us get out and have a go at them?' A senior nodded toward the bare stretch of muddy plough before their trench and the tangle of barbed wire beyond. "'How many men do you suppose would get there?' he asked. Well, "'Some would,' said the youngster eagerly. "'And anything would be better than sticking here and getting pounded to pieces.' "'We'll see,' said the Major, moving off. "'They may ask us to try it presently, and if not, we'll pull through, I dare say. See that the men keep down, and uh, keep down yourself, Grant. Watch out for our ruts, though. This may be a preparation for something of the sort.' He moved along, and the lad flattened himself again against the side of the wet trench. A word from a man near him turned him round. A Terry Observer officer coming. Perhaps our guns are going for him at last. The gunner officer stumbled along the trench toward them. Behind him came his signaller, a coil of wire and a portable telephone in a leather case swung over his shoulder. Number two platoon watched their approach with eager anticipation, and strained ears and attention to catch the conversation that passed between their officer and the artilleryman and a thrill of disappointment pulsed down the line at the gunner's answer to the first question put to him. Uh, no, 
he said. I have orders not to fire unless they come out of the trenches to attack. We'll give them jip if they try it. My guns are laid on the front trench, and I can sweep the whole of this front with shrapnel. But why not shut up their guns and put a stop to this? asked the officer, and his platoon fervently echoed the question in their hearts. Not my pigeon, said the gunner, cautiously peering through the field glasses he leveled through a convenient loophole. That's the heaviest job. I'm field, and my guns are too light to say much to these fellows. Look out! And he stooped low in the trench as the rising rush of sound told of a shell coming down near them. Yeah, that's about an eight-inch, he said. After the shell had fallen with a crash behind them, a spout of earth and mud leaping up and spattering down over them, and fragments singing and whizzing overhead. Just uh, tap in on the wire, Jackson, and raise the battery. The telephonist opened his case and lifted out his instrument groped along the trench wall a few yards and found his wire, joined up to his instruments, dashed off a series of dots and dashes on the buzzer, and spoke into his mouthpiece. Number two platoon watched in fascinated silence, and again gave all their attention to listening as the artillery officer took the receiver. That you, Major? As is Arbuthnot, in the forward-firing trench. Yeah, yes, pretty lively. Big stuff they're flinging mostly in some fourteen-pounder shrap. No, no. No signs of a move in their trenches. All right, sir. I'll take care. I can't see very well from here, so I'm going to move along a bit. Very well, sir. I'll tap in again, higher up. Goodbye. He handed back the instrument to the telephonist. Back up again, he said, and come along. When he had gone, Number 2 Platoon turned eagerly on the telephonist, and he ran a gauntlet of anxious questions as he followed the forward officer. Nine out of ten of the questions were to the same purpose, and the gunner answered them with some sharpness. He turned angrily at last on one man who put the query in broad Scots accent. Now, he said tartly, we ain't trying to silence their guns. And if you particular wants to know why we ain't, well... Perhaps them Glasgow townies of yours can tell you. He went on, and Number Two Platoon sank to grim silence. The meaning of the gunner's words were plain enough to all, for had not the papers spoken for weeks back of the Clyde strikes and the shortage of munitions? And the thoughts of all were pithily put in the one sentence by a private of Number Two Platoon. I'd stop cheerful in this blanky hell for a week, he said slowly. If so be I had them strikers here alongside me getting the same dose. All this time there had been a constant, though not a heavy, rifle fire on the trenches. It had not done much damage, because the Royal Blanks were exposing themselves as little as possible and keeping low down in their narrow trenches. But now the German rifles began to speak faster, and the fire rose to a dull roar. The machine guns joined in, their sharp ratchet tat tat sounding hard and distinct above the rifles. As the volume of rifle fire increased, so for a minute did the shell fire, until the whole line of the Royal Blank's trenches was vibrating to the crash of the shells and humming with rifle bullets which whizzed overhead or smacked with loud whip-crack reports into the parapet. The officer of Number 2 Platoon hitched himself higher on the parapet and hoisted a periscope over it. Almost instantly a bullet struck it, shattering the glass to fragments. He lowered it and hastily fitted a new glass, pausing every few moments to bob his head up over the parapet and glance hastily across at the German trench. A second time he raised his instrument to position, and in less than a minute it was shot away for a second time. The artillery officer came hurrying and stumbling back along the trench, his telephonist laboring behind him. They stopped at the place where they had uh, tapped in before, and the telephonist busied himself connecting up his instrument. The artillery officer flung himself down beside the platoon commander. My confounded wire cut again, he panted, just when I wanted it to. Sounds as if they meant a rush, hm? The infantryman nodded. Will they stop shelling before they rush? he shouted. Not till their men are well out in front. The guns can keep going over their heads for a bit. Are you through, Jackson? Tell the battery to eyes front. It looks like an attack. The telephonist repeated the message, listened a moment, and commented, The Major says, sir, when his officer interrupted sharply. Three rounds, gunfire, quick. 
Three rounds, gunfire, quick, sir, bellowed the telephonist into his mouthpiece. Here they come, lads. Let them have it, yelled the platoon commander, and commenced himself to fire through a loophole. At the same moment there came from the rear the quick thudding reports of the British guns, the rush of the shells overhead, and the sharp crash of their shells over the German parapets. All fired, sir, called the telephonist. Battery fire one second, the observing officer shouted without turning his head from his watch over the parapet. Number one fired, two fired, three fired. The signaler called rapidly, and the observing officer watched narrowly the white cotton wool clouds of the bursting shrapnel of his guns. Number three, ten minutes more right. All guns, drop twenty-five, repeat, he ordered, and in swift obedience the guns began to drop their shrapnel showers, sweeping along the ground in front of the German trench. But the expected rush of Germans hung fire. A line of bobbing heads and shoulders had showed above the parapet, and only a few scattered groups had clambered over its top. They're beat, shouted the infantry officer exultingly. They're dodging back. Give it to them, boys. Give it... Ow! He broke off and ducked down with a hand clapped to his cheek where a bullet had scored its way. Get down, get down, make your men get down, said the gunner officer rapidly. It's all... Again there came the swishing rush of the light shells, a series of quick following bangs and a hail of shrapnel tearing across the trench before the men had time to duck. Oh, a false alarm just a dodge to get your men's head up within reach of their fizz-bang shrapnel, said the artilleryman and called to the signaler. All guns raised twenty-five. Section fire five seconds. Hello, hit, he continued to the platoon officer as he noticed him wiping a smear of blood from his cheek. Just a nice little scratch, said the lad, grinning. Enough to let me swank about being wounded and show off a pretty scar to my best girl when the war's over. Afraid that last shrapnel burst gave some of your fellows more than a pretty scar, said the gunner. But I suppose I'd better slow my guns again. Jackson, tell them the uh, attack's evidently stopped. Section fire ten seconds. Well, can't you keep on belting them for a bit? asked the platoon officer. Might make them ease up on us. The gunner shook his head regretfully. I'd ask nothing better, he said. I could just give those trenches beans. But our orders are strict and we daren't waste around on anything but an attack. I'll bet that's my major, wanting to know if he can't slack off a bit more. He continued, as the signaler called something about, wanted to speak here, sir. He went to the instrument and held a short conversation. Told you so, he said, when he returned to the infantry officer. No attack, no shells. We're stopping again. Doesn't seem to be too much stop about the germs, grumbled the infantryman, as another series of cracking shells shook the ground close behind them. He moved down the line, speaking a few words here and there to the crouching men of his platoon. "'This is getting serious,' he said when he came back to his place. "'There's more than half of my lot hit, and the most of them pretty badly. These shrapnel bullets and shell splinters make a shocking mess of a wound, you know.' "'Yes,' the gunner said grimly. "'I know.' "'A perfectly brutal mess,' the subaltern repeated. "'A bullet now is more or less decent.' But those shells of theirs, they don't give a man a chance to pull through. Ours are as bad, if that's any satisfaction to you, said the gunner. I suppose so, agreed the subaltern. Ghastly sort of game altogether, isn't it? Those poor fellows of mine now, the, the killed, I mean, think of their fathers and mothers and wives or sweethearts. I'd rather not, said the gunner. And I shouldn't advise you to. Better not to think of these things. I wish they'd come again, said the platoon commander. It would stop the shells for a bit, perhaps. They're getting on my nerves. One's so helpless against them, sticking here waiting to know when the next will drop. And they don't give us, fellow, the ordinary four-to-one chance of a casualty being a wound only. They make such a cruel, messy smash of a fellow. Are you going? Must find that break in my wire, said the gunner and presently he and the telephonist ploughed off along the trench. The bombardment continued with varying intensity throughout the day. There was no grand finale, no spectacular rush or charge, no crashing assault, no heroic hand-to-hand -hand combats, no anything but the long-drawn agony of lying still and being hammered by the crashing shells. This was no 
artillery preparation for the assault. Although the Royal Blanks did not know that, and so dare not stir from the danger zone of the forward trench. They were not even to have the satisfaction of giving back some of the punishment they had endured, nor the glory, a glory carefully concealed from their friends at home, and mostly lost by the disguising or veiling of their identity in the newspapers, but still a glory of taking a trench or making a successful attack or counter-attack. It was merely another, quote, heavy artillery bombardment, lived through and endured all unknown, as so many had been endured. The Royal Blanks were relieved at nightfall when the fire had died down. The artillery observing officer was just outside the communication trench at the relief hour and saw the casualties being helped or carried out. A stretcher passed and the figure on it had a muddy and dark-stained blanket spread over and an officer's cap and binoculars on top. "'An officer?' asked the gunner. "'Who is it?' "'Mr. Grant, sir,' said one of the stretcher bearers dully. "'Number two platoon.' The gunner noted the empty sag of the blanket where the head and shoulders should have been outlined, and checked the half-formed question of badly hit to how was it. "'Shell, sir. A fizz-bang hit the parapet just where he was lying. Caught him fair.' The bearers moved on, leaving the gunner groping in his memory for a sentence in the youngster's last talk he had heard. "'Ghastly business.' "'Cruel, messy smash,' he murmured. "'Beg pardon, sir,' said the telephonist. The forward officer made no answer, but continued to stare after the disappearing stretcher-bearers. The signaller shuffled his feet in the mud and hitched up the strap of the instrument on his shoulder. "'I suppose it's over now, sir,' he said. "'Yes, all over. Except for his father or mother or sweetheart,' said the officer absently. The signaller started. Uh, I meant the shelling, sir. Oh, ah, yes. The shelling, Jackson. Yes, I dare say that's over for tonight, since they seem to have stopped now. Perhaps we might see about some food, sir, said the signaller. Food, yeah, to be sure, said the officer briskly. Eat, drink, and be merry, Jackson, for... I'm hungry, too, now I think of it. And, oh, Lord, I'm tired. Number two platoon were tired, too, as they filed wearily out by the communication trench, tired and worn out mentally and physically, and yet not too tired or too broken for a light word or a jest. From the darkness behind them a German flare soared up and burst, throwing up bushes and shattered buildings, sandbag parapets, broken tree stumps, sticks and stones in luminous-edged silhouette. A machine-gun burst into a stutter of fire, the report sounding faint at first, and louder and louder as the muzzle swept round its arc. <laughs> the bullet swept overhead, and Number 2 platoon halted and crouched low in the shallow communication trench. "'Oh, shut it, blast ye!' growled one of the men disgustedly. "'Hey, we had enough for one day!' "'It's only him singing his little evening hymn as usual.' said another. Just say it as good-bye and send in a few parting souvenirs. And another sang, Say your revoir, but not good-bye. Stop that howling there, a sergeant called down the line. And stop smoking those cigarettes and talking. Certainly, sergeant, a voice came back. And um, please, sergeant, will you allow us to keep on breathing? The light died, and the line rose and moved on, squelching softly in the mud. A man clapped a hand to his pocket, half halted, and exclaimed in annoyance, "'Blast if I haven't left my mouth organ back there,' he said. "Hut," said his next file. "'Be glad you've a mouth left, or a head to have a mouth in. It might be worse, and you might be left back there yourself, decorating about ten square yards of trench.' <laughs> went the maxim behind them again. Oh, tut tut yourself, you stammer and split blighter, said the disconsolate mouth organ loser. And do you think we can chance a smoke yet? As the platoon moved out on the road and behind the shelter of some ruined house walls. Platoon by platoon, the company filed out and formed up roughly behind the houses. 
The order to move came at last, and the ranked fours swung off, tramping slowly and stolidly in silence until someone struck up a song. Crump, 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 says the big bursting shells. A chorus of protest and a give the shells a rest stopped the song on the first line, and it was to the old regimental tune, the canteen and sing song favorite, the sergeant's return that the Royal Blanks settled itself into its packed shoulder straps and tramped on. I'm the same old fellow that you always used to know. Oh, oh, you know you used to know. And it's years since we parted way down on Plymouth Ho. Oh, oh, so many years ago. I've roamed around the world, but I've come back to you. For me art has never altered, me art is ever true prolonged and noisy imitation of a kiss. Ain't that got the taste you always used to know? The colonel was talking to the adjutant in the road as the companies moved past, and he noted with some concern the ragged ranks and listless movement of the first lot to pass. They're looking badly tucked up, he said. Oh, they've had a cruel day, said the adjutant. That's the worst kind, agreed the O.C., and I doubt if they can stand that sort of thing so well now. The old regiment is not what it used to be. We're so filled up with recruits now, youngsters too. There's B Company, about the rawest of the lot, and caught the worst of it today. How do you think they stand it? But it was B Company that answered the question for itself, and the old regiment, singing the answer softly to itself in the O.C. as it trudged by, on the same old feller as you always used to know. Oh, oh, you know you used to know. Glad, Malcolm, said the O.C., straightening his own shoulders. They'll do. They'll do. Me art has never altered. Me art is ever true. A remnant of number two platoon sang past him. They haven't shaken us yet, said the O.C. proudly. Ta -ta -ta grumbled the maxim faintly. Ta -ta! End of section two. Section three. The Mine of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A mine was successfully exploded under a section of the enemy's trench. Actual extract from an official dispatch. Work on the saphead had been commenced on what the captain of the sappers called a beautiful night, and what anyone else outside a lunatic asylum would have described with the strongest adjectives available in exactly the opposite sense. A piercing wind was blowing in gusts of driving sleet and rain. It was pitch dark, black as the inside of a cow, as the corporal put it, and it was bitterly cold. But since all these conditions are exactly those most calculated to make difficult the work of an enemy's sentries and lookouts, and the first work of sinking a shaft is one which it is highly desirable should be unobserved by an enemy, for sappers' captains, satisfaction may be understood. The saphead was situated amongst the ruins of a cottage a few yards behind the forward firing trench, and by the time a wet daylight had dawned, the sappers had dung themselves well underground, and securely planked up the walls of the shaft, and had cut a connecting gallery from the ruins to the communication trench. All this meant that their work was fairly free from observation, and the workers reasonably safe from bombs and bullets, so that the officer in charge had good cause for the satisfaction with which he made his first report. His first part of the work had been a matter of plans and maps, of compass and level, of observing the ground, incidentally dodging the bullets of the German snipers who caught glimpses of his crawling form by day, and of intricate and exact figuring and calculating by night, in the grimy cellar of another ruined house by the light of a candle, stuck in an empty bottle. Thereafter he spent all his waking hours, and many of his sleeping ones as well, in a thick suit of clay mud. He lived like a mole in his mine gallery, or his underground cellar, 
saw the light only when he emerged to pass from his work to his sleep or meals and back to his work, and generally gave himself, his whole body and brain and being, to the correct driving of a shallow burrow straight to the selected point under the enemy trench a hundred and odd yards away. He was a youngish man, and this was the first job of any importance that had been wholly and solely entrusted to him. It was not only his anxiety to make a creditable showing, but he was keen on the work for the work's own sake, and he reveled in the creative sense of the true artist. The mine was his. He had first suggested it, he had surveyed it, and plotted it, and measured and planned and worked it out on paper, and now when it came to the actual pick-and-shovel work, he supervised and directed and watched each hour of work and each yard of progress. It was tricky work, too, and troublesome. At first the ground was good stiff clay, that the spades bit out in clean mouthfuls, uh, and that left a fair firm wall behind. But that streak ran out in the second day's working, and the mine burrowed into some horrible, soft, crumbly soil that had to be held up and backed by roof and wall of planking. The subaltern took a party himself and looted the wrecks of houses. There was no lack of these in the village just behind the lines, of roof beams and flooring, and measured and marked them for sawing into lengths, and would have taken a saw with pleasure himself. Then he dived cheerfully into the oozing wet burrow and superintended the shoring up, and restarted the men to digging, and emerged a moment to see more planking passed down. He came, in fact, dangerously near to making a nuisance of himself, and some of his men who had been sapping and mining for wet and weary months past were inclined to resent quite so much fussing round and superintendence. But the corporal got it right. He was an elderly man with a nasty turn of temper that had got him into almost as many troubles in his service as his knowledge, experience, and aptitude for hard work and responsibility had got him out of. "'Leave the lot be,' he had said when some of the party had passed grumbling remarks about too bloomin' much fuss and feathers over a straight, simple, bloomin' job. The corporal had promptly squashed that opinion. "'Leave the lad be,' he said. "'He's young for the job, maybe, but he's not such a simple fool as some that take this for a simple job. It's not going to be all that simple, as you'll find out before you're done. He was right, too. The crumbling soil was one little difficulty promptly and easily met. The next was more troublesome. The soil grew wetter and more wet until at last the men were working ankle-deep in water. The further the mine went, the wetter it became. The men worked on, taking their turn at the narrow face, shoveling out the wet muck and dragging it back to the shaft and up and out and away by the communication trench. They squeezed aside in silence when the subaltern pushed in to inspect the working, and waited with side winks to one another to see what he would do to overcome the water difficulty. Pumps would, of course, have been the simple answer, but the men knew as well as the subaltern knew that pumps were not to be had at that particular time and place for love or money, and that all the filling of all the indents in the R.E., would not produce one single efficient pump from store. The subaltern did not trouble with indent forms or stores. He had had something of a fight to get a grudging permission for his mine, and he felt it in his bones that if he worried the big chiefs too much with requisitions, he would be told to abandon the mine. He shut his teeth tight at the thought. It was his mine, and he was going to see it through if he had to bail the water out with a teacup. He made a quick cast through the shell-wrecked village, drew blank, sat for fifteen minutes on the curb of a rubble-choked well, and thought hard, jumped up and called the corporal to provide him with four men and some odd tools, and struck back across muddy and shell-cratered fields to the nearest farm. The farmer who had remained in possession despite the daily proximity of bursting shells, a shrapnel-smashed tile roof, and a gaping hole where one house corner should have been, made some objection to the commandeering of his old-fashioned farm pump. He was at first supported in this by the officer in charge of the men billeted in the barn and sheds, but the sapper explained the urgency of his need, 
and cunningly clinched the argument by reminding the infantry officer that probably he and his men would soon be installed in the trenches from which the mine ran, and that he, the sapper, although he was not supposed to mention it, might just hint that his mine was only hurrying to forestall an enemy mine which was judged to be approaching the trench the infantry officer would presently occupy. This last was a sheer invention of the moment, but it served excellently, and the sapper and his party bore off their pump in triumph. It was later erected in the mine shaft, and the difficulty of providing sufficient piping to run from the pump to the waterlogged part of the mine was met by a midnight visit to the house where headquarters abode, and the wholesale removal of gutters and rain pipes. As headquarters had its principal residence in a commodious and cobwebby cellar, the absence of the gutters fortunately passed without remark and the sentry who watched the looting and the sergeant to whom he reported it were quite satisfied by the presence of an engineering officer and his calm assurance that it was all right orders an engineer's job the pump did its work excellently and a steady stream of muddy water gushed from its nozzle and flowed down the headquarters gutter pipes to a selected spot well behind the trenches Unfortunately, the pump, being old-fashioned, was somewhat noisy, and all the packing and oiling and tinkering failed to silence its clank-clink, clank-clink, as its arm rose and fell. The nearest German trench caught the clank-clink, and by a simple process of deduction and elimination, arrived at its meaning and its location. The pump and the pumpers led a troubled life after that. Snipers kept an unsteady but never silent series of bullets smacking into the stones of the ruin, whistling over the communication trench and whooping into the mud around both. A light gun took a hand and plumped a number of rounds each day into the crumbling walls and rubbish heaps of stone and brick and burst shrapnel all over the lot. The sappers dodged the snipers by keeping tight and close to cover. They frustrated the direct-hitting fizz bang shells by a stout barricade of many thicknesses of sandbags bolstering up the fragment of wall that hid their shaft and pump, and finally they erected a low roof over the works and sandbagged that secure against the shrapnel. There were casualties, of course, but these are always in the way of business with the sappers and came as a matter of course. The Germans brought up a trench mortar next, and flung noisy and nerve-wracking high-explosive bombs into and all around the ruin, bursting down all the remaining walls except the sandbagged one, and scoring a few more casualties, until the forward trench installed a trench mortar of their own, and by a generous return of two bombs to the enemy's one, put the German out of action. A big Minnenwerfer came into play next, and because it could throw a murderous-sized bomb from far behind the German trench, it was too much for the British trench mortar to tackle. This brought the gunners into the game, and the harassed infantry, who were coming to look on the sapper subaltern and his works as an unmitigated nuisance, and a most undesirable acquaintance who drew more than a fair share of enemy fire on them, appealed to the guns to rid them of their latest tormentor. An artillery observing officer spent a perilous hour or two amongst the shrapnel and sniper's bullets on top of the sandbagged wall until he had located the Minnenwerfer. Then about two minutes telephone talk to the battery and ten minutes of spouting lidite volcanoes finished the Minnenwerfer trouble. But all this uh, above-ground work was by way of an aside to the sapper subaltern, he was far too busy with his mine gallery to worry about the doings of gunners and bomb-throwers and infantry and such-like fellows. When these people interfered with his work, they were a nuisance, of course, but he always managed to find a working party for the sandbagging protective work without stopping the job underground. So the gallery crept steadily on. They had to carry the tunnel rather close to the surface, because at very little depth they struck more water than any pumps, much less their single farmyard one, could cope with. 
the nearness uh, to the surface made a fresh difficulty and necessitated the greatest care in working under the ground beneath the trenches because there were always deep shell holes and craters to be avoided or floored with the planking that made the tunnel roof so the gallery had to be driven carefully at a level below the danger of exposure through a shell hole and above the depth at which the water lay this meant a tunnel too low to stand or even kneel in with a straight back and the men kneeling in mud crouched back on their heels and with rounded back and shoulders struck their spades forward into the face and dragged the earth out spadeful by spadeful and despite the numbing cold mud they knelt in, the men, stripped to shirts with rolled sleeves and open throats, streamed rivulets of sweat as they worked, for the air was close and thick and heavy, and the exertion in the cramped space was one long muscle-racking strain. Once the roof and walls caved in, and three men were imprisoned. The collapse came during the night, fortunately, and still more fortunately behind the line and parapet of the forward trench. The subaltern flung himself and his men on the muddy wreckage in frantic haste to clear an opening and admit air to the imprisoned men. It took time, a heart-breaking length of time, and it was with a horrible dread in his heart that the subaltern at last pushed into the uncovered opening and crawled along the tunnel, flashing his electric torch before him. Halfway to the end, he felt a draught of cold air, and promptly extinguishing his lamp, saw a hole in the roof. His men were alive, all right, and not only alive, but keeping on hard at work at the end of the tunnel. When the collapse came, they had gone back to where their roof lay across the bottom of a shell hole, pulled a plank out, and gone back to work. When the tunnel reached a point under the German parapet, it was turned sharp to left and right, forming a capital T, with the cross-piece running roughly along the line of trench and parapet. Here there was need of the utmost deliberation and caution. A pick could not be used, and even a spade had to be handled gently, in case the sounds of working should reach the Germans overhead. In some places the subaltern could actually hear the movements and footsteps of the enemy just above him. Twice the diggers disturbed a dead German, buried evidently under the parapet. Once a significant crumbling of the earth and fall of a few heavy clods threatened a collapse where the gallery was under the edge of the trench. Well, the spot was hastily but securely shored up with an infinite caution and the least possible sound, and after that the subaltern had the explosive charges brought along and connected up in readiness. Then, if the roof collapsed or their work were discovered, the switch at the shaft could still be pressed, the wires would still carry the current, and the mine would be exploded. At last the subaltern decided that everything was ready. He carefully placed his charges, connected up his wires again, cleared out his tools, and emerged to report, all ready. Now, the touching off of a good-sized mine is not a matter to be done lightly or without due and weighty authority, and that because more is meant to result from it than the upheaval of some square yards of earth and the destruction of so many yards of enemy trench. The mine itself, elaborate and labour-making as it may have been, is, after all, only a means to an end. That end may be the capture of a portion of the ruins of the trench, it may be the destruction of an especially strong and dangerous keep, a point of resistance or an angle for attack. It may even be a mine to destroy a mine which is known to be tunnelling into our own trenches. But in any case the explosion is usually a signal for attack from one side or the other, and therefore requires all the usual elaborate arrangements of reinforcements and supports and so on. Therefore the sapper subaltern, when he had finished his work and made his report, had nothing to do but sit down and wait until other people's preparations were made, and he received orders to complete his work by utterly and devastatingly destroying it. The subaltern found this wait about the most trying part of the whole affair, more especially since he had for a good many days and nights had so much to occupy his every moment. He received word at last of the day and hour appointed for the explosion, 
and had the honour of a visit of inspection from a very superior officer, who pored long and painstakingly over the paper plans, put a great many questions, even went the length of walking down the communication trench and peering down the entrance shaft, and looking over the sandbag wall through a periscope at the section of German trench marked down for destruction. Then he complimented the subaltern on his work, declined once again the offer of a muddy Macintosh and an invitation to crawl down the mine, and went off. The subaltern saw him off the premises, returned to the shaft, and donned the Macintosh and crawled off up his tunnel once more. Somehow, now that the whole thing was finished and ready, he felt a pang of reluctance to destroy it, and so fulfill its destiny. As he crawled along, he noted each little bit of shoring up and supporting planks, each rise and fall in the floor, each twist and angle in the direction, and recalled the infinite labour of certain sections, his glows of satisfaction at the speed of progress at the easy bits, his impatience at the slow and difficult portions. It seemed as if he had been building that tunnel for half a lifetime had hardly ever done anything else but build it or think about building it, and now, tomorrow, it was all to be destroyed. He recalled with a thrill of boyish pleasure the word of praise from the corporal, a far greater pleasure, by the way, than he had derived from the great one's compliments, the praise of one artist to another, the recognition of good work done by one who himself had helped in many good works and knew well of what he spoke. She done, sir, the corporal had said. Oh, if I may say so, sir, she's a credit to you. A mighty tricky job, sir. And I've seen plenty with long years in the service that would have been stumped at times. I'm glad to have had a hand in it with you, sir. And uh, will the men feel the same way about it? Ah, well, the subaltern thought as he halted at the joint of the tea piece. None of them felt the same about it as he himself did. He squatted there a moment, listening to the drip of water that was the only sound. Suddenly his heart leapt. Was it the only sound? What was that other, if it could be called a sound? It was a sense, rather, an indefinable blending of senses like hearing and feeling touch. A faint, barely perceptible thump, thump, like the beat of a man's heart in his breast. He snapped off the light of his electric lamp and crouched breathless in the darkness, straining his ears to hear. He was soon satisfied. He had not lived these days past, with the sound of digging in his ears by day and his dreams by night, not to recognize the blows of a pick. There. They had stopped now, and in imagination he pictured the digger laying down the pick to shovel out the loosened earth. Then, after a pause, the measured bump, thump, went on again. The subaltern crawled along first one arm of the cross-section and then the other, halting every now and then to place his ear to the wet planking or the wetter earth. He located at last the point nearest to the sound, and without more waste of time scurried off down his tunnel to the daylight. He was back in the mine again in less than half an hour, a bare thirty minutes, but each minute close packed with concentrated essence of thought and action. The nearest trench telephone had put him in touch with battalion headquarters, and through them with brigade, divisional, and general headquarters. He had told his story and asked for his orders clearly, quickly, and concisely. The Germans were countermining. Their tunnel could not possibly miss ours, and by the sound would break through in thirty to sixty minutes. What were his orders? It took some little time for the orders to come, mainly because, although he knew nothing of it, his mind was part of a scheme for a general attack, and general attacks are affairs that cannot be postponed or expedited as easily as a cold lunch. But the subaltern filled in the time of waiting, and when the orders did come he was ready for them, or any other. They were clear and crisp. He was to fire the mine, but only at the latest possible minute. That was all he got, and indeed all he wanted, and since they did not concern him, 
there is no need here to tell of the swirl of other orders that buzzed and ticked and talked by field telegraph and telephone for miles up and down and behind the British line. Before these orders had begun to take shape or coherency as a whole, the subaltern was back listening to the thump, thump of the German picks, and busily contemplating his preparations. It was near noon, and perhaps the workers would stop for a meal, which would give another hour for troops to be pushed up, or whatever else the generals wanted time for. It might even be that a fall of their roof, an extra inflow of water to their working, or any one of the scores of troubles that hamper and hinder underground mining might stop the crawling advance of the German sappers for a day or two, and allow the subaltern's mind to play its appointed part at the appointed time of the grand attack. But, meantime, the subaltern took no chances. First he connected up a short switch, which in the last extreme of haste would allow him, with one touch of his finger, to blow up the mine and himself with it. He buried or concealed the wires connecting the linked charges with the switch outside, so as to have a chance of escape himself. He opened a portable telephone he had carried with him and joined up to the wire he had also carried in, and so was in touch with his corporal and the world of the above ground. All these things he did himself, because there was no need to risk more than one man in case of a quick explosion. Then, his preparations complete, he sat down to wait and to listen to the thudding picks of the Germans. They were very near now, and with his ear to the wall, the subaltern could hear the shovels now as well as the picks. He shut his lamp off after a last look at his switch, his revolver, and the glistening walls and mud ooze floor of his tunnel, and sat still in the darkness. Once he whispered an answer into the telephone to his corporal, and once he flicked his lamp on an instant to glance at the watch on his wrist. Then he crouched still and silent again. The thumping of his heart nearly drowned the thud of the picks. He was shivering with excitement, and his mouth grew dry and leathery. He felt a desire to smoke, and had his case out and a cigarette in his lips when it occurred to him that when the Germans broke through, the smell of the smoke would tell them instantly that they were in an occupied working. He counted on a certain amount of delay and doubt on their part when their picks first pierced his wall and he counted on that pause again to give him time to escape. So he put the cigarette away, and immediately was overwhelmed with a craving for it. He fought it for five minutes, that felt like five hours, and felt his desire grow tenfold with each minute. It nearly drove him to doing what all the risk, all the discomfort of his cramped position, all the danger had not done to creep out and fire the mine without waiting for that last instant when the picks would break through. It could make little difference, he argued to himself, in the movements of those above. What could five minutes more, or ten, or even fifteen matter now? It might even be that he was endangering the success of the explosion by waiting, and it was perhaps wiser to crawl out at once and fire the mine, and he could safely light a cigarette then, as soon as he was around the corner of the tea. So he argued the matter out, fingering his cigarette case and longing for the taste of the tobacco, and yet knowing in his innermost heart that he would not move, despite his arguments, until the first pick came through. He heard the strokes draw nearer and nearer, and now he held his breath and strained his eyes as each one was delivered. The instant he had waited for came in exactly the fashion he had expected. A thud, a thread of yellow light piercing the black dark, a grunt of surprise from the pick-wielder at the lack of resistance to his stroke. All this was just what he had expected, had known would happen. The next stroke would show the digger that he was entering some hole. Then there would be cautious investigation, the sending back word to an officer, the slow and careful enlargement of the opening. And before that moment came, the subaltern would be down his tunnel and outside and pressing the switch. Uh, but his program worked out no further than that first instant and that first gleam of light. He saw the gleam widen suddenly as the pick was withdrawn, heard another quick blow, saw the round spot of light run out in little cracks and one wide rift, 
and suddenly the wall fell in, and he was staring straight into the German gallery with a dark figure silhouetted clear down to the waist against the light of an electric bulb lamp which hung from the gallery roof. For an instant the subaltern's blood froze. The figure of the German was only separated from him by a bare three yards, and to his dark blinded eyes it seemed that he himself was standing in plain view in a brilliant blaze of light. Actually, he was in almost complete darkness. The single light in the German gallery hardly penetrated through the gloom of his own tunnel, and what little did showed nothing to the eyes of the German, used to the lamplight and staring suddenly into the black rift before him. But the German called out to someone behind him, twisted round, moved, stooping, back to the lamp, and reached up a hand to it. The subaltern backed away hastily, his eyes fixed on the glow of light in the opening. The hole had broken through on a curve of his tunnel, so that for fifteen or twenty feet back he could still see the German gallery, could watch the man unhook the lamp and carry it back to the opening, thrust the lamp before him, and lean in over the crumbling heap of earth his pick had brought down. The subaltern stopped, and drew a gasping breath, and held it. Discovery was a matter of seconds now. He had left his firing switch, but he still carried the portable telephone slung from his shoulder, the earth pin dangling from it. He had only to thrust the pin into the mud, and he was connected up with the corporal at the outside switch. Had only to shout one word, fire, and it would all be over. Quickly but noiselessly he put his hand down to catch up the wire with the earth pin. His hand touched the revolver butt in his holster, checked at it, closed round it, and slid it softly out. All this had taken an instant of time, and as he raised his weapon he saw the German, still staring hard under the upheld lamp, into the gloom. He was looking the other way, and the subaltern leveled the heavy revolver and paused. The sights stood out clear and black against the figure standing in the glow of light, a perfect and unmissable target. The man was bareheaded, and wore a mud-stained blue shirt with sleeves cut off above the elbow. The subaltern moved the notched sights from under the armpit of the raised arm that held up the light, and steadied them on the round of the ear that stood out clear against the close-cropped black hair. He heard a guttural exclamation of wonder saw the head come slowly round till the circle of the ear foreshortened, and moved past his sights, and they were centred straight between the staring eyes. His finger contracted on the trigger, but a sudden qualm stayed him. It wasn't fair. It wasn't sporting. It was too like shooting a sitting hare. And the man hadn't seen him yet, even. Man? This was no man, a lad, rather, a youth, a mere boy, with childish, wondering eyes, a smooth oval chin, the mouth of a pretty girl. The subaltern had a schoolboy brother hardly younger than this boy, and a quick vision rose of a German mother and sisters. No, he couldn't shoot. It would be murder. It and then a quick start, an upward movement of the lamp, a sharp question, told him the boy had seen. The subaltern spoke softly in fairly good German. Run away, my boy. In an instant my mind will explode. Who is it? Who is there? gasped the boy. The subaltern chuckled and grinned uh, wickedly. Swiftly he dropped the revolver, fumbled a moment, and pulled a coil of capped fuse from his pocket. It is the English, he said. It is an English mine that I now explode. And on that word lit the fuse and flung it, fizzing and spinning a jet of sparks and smoke toward the boy. The lad flinched back and half turned to run, but the subaltern saw him look round over his shoulder and twist back, saw the eyes glaring at the fiery thing in the mud, the dreadful resolve grow swiftly on the set young face, the teeth clamped on the resolve. He was going to dash for the fuse, to try to wrench it out, and, as he supposed, prevent the mine exploding. The subaltern jerked up the revolver again. This would never do. The precious seconds were flying. At any moment another man might come. He would have saved this youngster if he could, but he could allow nothing to risk the failure of his mind. Get back, he said sharply. Get back or I shall shoot. But now what he had feared happened. A voice called, a scuffling footfall sounded in the German gallery, a dim figure pushed forward into the light beside the boy. 
A subaltern saw that it was an officer, heard his angry oath in answer to the boy's quick words, his shout, The light fool, break it! saw the clenched fists, vicious buffet in the boyish face, and the quick grab at the electric bulb. The subaltern's revolver sights slid off the boy and hung an instant on the snarling face of the officer. In the confined space the roar of his heavy revolver rolled and thundered in reverberating echoes. The swirling powder reek blinded him and stung in his nostrils, and as the smoke cleared he could see the boy scrambling back along his gallery and the officer sprawled face down across the earth heap in the light of the fallen lamp. The subaltern smashed the lamp himself before he too turned, and plunged, floundering and slipping and stumbling for his exit in an agony of haste and apprehension. It was all right, he told himself a dozen times. The officer was done for. The back of that head and a past knowledge of a service revolver's work at close range told him that plain enough. It would take a good many minutes for the boy to tell his tale, and even then, if a party ventured back at once, it would take many more minutes in the dark, and he was glad he thought to smash the lamp before they could find his charges or the wires. It was safe enough, but the tunnel had never seemed so long or the going so slow. He banged against beams and supports, ploughed through sticky mud and churning water, rasped his knuckles and bruised knees and elbows in his mad haste. It was safe enough, but... But... But suppose there was no response to his pressure on the switch. Suppose there had been some silly mistake in making the connections. Suppose the battery wouldn't work. There were a score of things to go wrong. Thank goodness he had overhauled and examined everything himself. Although... That, again, would only make it more appallingly awful if things didn't work. No time now, no chance to go back and put things right. Perhaps he ought to have stayed back there and made the contact. A quick end if it worked right, and a last chance to refix it if it didn't. Yes, he... But there was the light ahead. He shouted, Fire! at the top of his voice, still hurrying on and half-cowering from the expected roar and shock of the explosion. Nothing happened. He shouted again, and again as loud as his sobbing breath and laboring lungs would let him. Still, nothing. And it began to sear his brain as a dreadful certainty that he had failed, that his mind was a ghastly frost, that all the labor gone to its making and the good lives spent on it were wasted. He stumbled weakly out into the shaft, caught a glimpse of the corporal's set face, strong at the tunnel mouth, and tried once more to call out, Fire! But the corporal was waiting for no word. He had already got that, had heard the subaltern's first shouts roll down the tunnel, in fact was waiting with a finger on the exploding switch for the moment the subaltern should appear. The finger moved steadily over as the subaltern stumbled into sight, and the solid earth heaved convulsively, shuddered, and rocked and shook to the roaring blast of the explosion. The shock and the rush of air from the tunnel mouth caught the subaltern staggering to his knees and flung him headlong. And as he picked himself up again, the air darkened with whizzing clods and mud and dust and stones and dirt that rained down from the sky. Before the echoes of the explosion had died away, before the last fragments and debris had fallen, there came the sound of another roar, the bellowing thunder of the British guns, throwing a storm of shell and shrapnel between the German supports and the ruined trench. That, and another sound, told the subaltern that the full fruits of his work were to be fully reaped. The sound of the guns, and the full, deep-chested, roaring cheers of the British infantry, as they swarmed from their trenches and rushed to occupy the crater of the explosion. Later in the day, when the infantry had made good their possession of the place, had sandbagged and fortified it to stand against the expected counter-attacks, the subaltern went to look over the ground, and see at first, and close hand, the results of his explosion. Technically, he found it interesting. Humanly, it was merely sickening. The ground was one weltering chaos and confusion of tossed earth heaps and holes, of broken beams and jagged-ended planks, of flung sandbags and wrecked barricading. Of trench or barricade, as trench and barricade, there remained simply 
No sign. The wreckage was scattered thick with the dreadful debris of dead bodies, of bloody clothing, of helmets and broken rifles, burst packs and haversacks, bayonets, water bottles, and shattered equipments. The ambulance men were busy, but there were still many dead and dying and wounded to be removed, wounded with torn flesh and mangled limbs, dead and dying with scorched and smoldering clothes. The infantry, hastily digging and filling sandbags and throwing up parapets on the far edge of the reeking explosion pit, had found many bodies caught in the descending avalanche of earth or buried in the collapsed trenches and dugouts, and here and there, amid the confusion, a foot or a hand protruding stark from some earth heap marked the death place of other victims. The whole scene was one of death and desolation, of ruin and destruction, and the subaltern turned from it sick at stomach. It was the first result of a big explosion he had seen. This was the sort of thing that he had read so often summed up in a line of the official dispatch or a two-line newspaper paragraph. A mine was successfully exploded under a section of the enemy's trench. A mine. His mine. God, the subaltern said softly under his breath and looked wonderingly about him. He's a bloomin' little butcher, is it, Lieutenant of ours? The corporal said that night, of course it was a good bit of work, and he'd reason to be proud of it, but, well, I thought I had a strongish stomach, and I've seen some dirty blood and bones messes in my time, but that scorching shambles near turned me over, and he comes back after looking at it as cheerful as the corner man of a Christy minstrel troupe, and as pleased as a dog with two tails. Fair pleased he was. But he was a little wrong. What had brought the subaltern back with such a cheerful air was not the sight of his work, not the grim picture of the smashed trenches. It was an encounter he had had with a little group of German prisoners, the recognizing amongst them of a dirty, mud-stained blue shirt with sleeves cut off above the elbows, a close-cropped bare head, a boy's face with a smooth oval chin and girlish eyes. The mine work he had directed, but others had shared it. It was the day's work, it was an incident of war, it was, after all, merely a mine successfully exploded. For that one life saved was also his work, and moreover his own, his individual personal work. It was of that he thought most as he came back smiling to his corporal. End of section three. Section four. Artillery support of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Supported by a close and accurate artillery fire. Extract from Official Dispatch From his position in the observation post, the artillery forward officer watched the fight raging along his front much as a spectator in the grandstand watches a football match. Through his glasses he could see every detail and movement of the fighters, see even their facial expressions, the grip of hands about their weapons. Queerly enough, it was something like looking at the dumb show of a cinema film. He could see a rifle pointed and the spit of fire from the muzzle without hearing any report, could see an officer gesticulating and his mouth opening and closing in obvious stentorian shoutings without hearing the faintest sound of his voice, could even see the quick flash and puffing smoke of a grenade without catching the crash of its explosion. It was not that he was too far off to hear all these sounds, but simply because individually they were drowned in the continuous ear-filling roar of the battle. The struggle was keenly interesting and desperately exciting, even from a spectator's point of view, and the interest and excitement were the greater to the forward officer because he was playing a part, and an important part, in the great game spread before him. 
Beyond the line of a section of the British front, white smoke puffs were constantly bursting. Over his head a succession of shells streamed rushing and shrieking, and the place where each of these puffs burst depended on him. Each shell that roared overhead came in answer to his call. He was observing, for a six-gun battery concealed behind a gentle slope over a mile away, to his right rear, and since the gunners at the battery could see nothing of the fight, nothing of their target, not even the burst of a single one of their shells, they depended solely on their forward officer to correct their aim and direct their fire. All along the front, or rather both the fronts, for the German batteries worked on exactly the same system, the batteries were pouring down their shells, and each battery was dependent for the accuracy of its fire on its own observing officer, crouching somewhere up in front and overlooking his battery's zone. The fighting line surged forward or swayed back, checked and halted, moved again, now rapidly, now slowly and staggeringly, curved forward here and dented in there, striving fiercely to hold its ground in this place, driving forward in that, or breaking, reeling back into the arms of the supports, swirling forward with them again. But no matter whether the lines moved forward or back, fast or slow, raggedly and unevenly, or in one long, close-locked line, ever and always the shells soared over and burst beyond the line, just far enough barely to clear it if the fight were at close quarters, reaching out and on a hundred, two hundred yards when the fighters drew apart for a moment, always clear of their own infantry, and exactly as possible on the fighting line of the enemy, for such is the essence of close and accurate artillery support. The forward observing officer, perched precariously in an angle of the walls of a ruined cottage, stared through his glasses at the confusion of the fight for hour after hour, until his eyes ached and his vision swam. The forward officer had been there since daybreak, and because no shells obviously aimed at his station had bombarded him, plenty of chance ones had come very close, but of course they didn't count, he was satisfied that he was reasonably secure, and told his major, back at the battery, so over his telephone. The succession of attack and counter-attack had ceased for the time being, and the forward officer let his glasses drop and shut his aching eyes for a moment. But almost immediately he had to open them and lift his head carefully to peer out over the top of the broken wall, for the sudden crash of reopening rifle fire warned him that another move was coming. From far out on his left, beyond the range of his vision, the fire began. It beat down, wave after wave, toward his front, crossed it, and went rolling on beyond his right, the initiative came from the British side, and taking it as the prelude of an attack, developing perhaps out of sight on his left, the forward officer called up his battery and quickened the rate of its fire upon the German line. In a few minutes he caught a quick stir in the British line, a glimpse of the row of khaki figures clambering from their trench and the flickering flash of their bayonets, and in an instant the flat ground beyond the trench was covered with running figures. This made a fair target that the German gunners, rifles, and maxims were quick to leap upon. The German trench streamed fire. The German shells, shrapnel, and high explosive blew gaping rents in the running line. The line staggered and flinched, halted, recovered, and went on again, leaving the ground behind it dotted with sprawling figures. The space covered by the forward officer's zone was flat and bare of cover, clear to the German trench two hundred yards away. It was too deadly a stretch for that gallant line to cover, and before it was halfway across it faltered again, hung irresolute, and flung itself prone to the ground. The level edge of the German trench suddenly became serrated with bobbing heads, flickered with moving figures, and the next moment was hidden by the swarm of men that leaped from it and came charging across the open. This line, too, withered and wilted under the fire that smote it, but it gathered itself and hurled on again. The forward officer called down the shortening ranges to the guns, and the answering shrapnel fell fiercely on the German line and tore it to fragments. But the fragments still advanced. The remnant of the British line rose and flung forward to meet it, 
and as the two clashed, the supports from either side poured out to help. As the dense mass of Germans emerged and knitted into close formation, the forward officer reeled off swift orders to the telephone. The shrieking tempest of his shells fell upon the mass, struck and slew wholesale, struck and slew again. The mass shivered and broke, but although part of it vanished back under the cover of the trench, although another part lay piled in a wreckage of dead and wounded, a third part straggled forward and charged into the fight. The British line was overborne and pushing, struggling back until new supports brought it fresh life and turned the tide again. The Germans surviving the charge were killed, wounded or taken prisoners, and the forward officer, lifting his fire and pouring it on the German trench, checked for the moment any further rush of reinforcements. The British line ran forward to a field track running parallel to the trenches and nearly midway between them flung itself down to escape the bullets that stormed across and began, as rapidly as the men's cramped position would allow, to dig themselves in. To their right and left, the field track sank a foot or two below the surface of the field, and this scanty but precious shelter had allowed the rest of the line to stop halfway across and hold on to get its breath and allow a constant spray of supports to dash across the open and reinforce it. Now the centre where the track ran bare and flat across the field, plied frantic shovels to heap up some sort of cover that would allow them also to hang on in conformation of the whole line and gather breath and reinforcements for the next rush. The Germans saw plainly enough what was the plan, and took instant steps to upset it. Their first and best chance was to thrust hard at the weak and ill-protected centre, overwhelm it, and then roll up the lines to right and left of it. A tornado of shell-fire ushered in the new assault. The shells burst in running crashes up and down the forward line and up and down the British trench behind it. Driving squalls of shrapnel swept the ground between the two, and in addition a storm of rifle and machine-gun bullets rained along the scanty parapet, whistling and droned and hissed and across the open and then suddenly the assault was launched from all along the German line. At the same instant, a shell struck the wall of the forward officer's station, burst with a terrific crash, swept three parts of the remaining wall away in a cloud of shrieking splinters and swirling dust of brick and plaster, and threw the forward officer headlong half a dozen yards. By some miracle he was untouched. His first thought was for the telephone, the connecting link with his guns. He scrambled over the debris to the dugout or shelter pit behind his corner and found telephonist and telephone intact. He dropped on hands and knees and crawled over the rubble and out beyond the end of the wall, for the cloud of smoke and plaster and brick dust still hung heavily about the ruin. Here, in the open as he was, the air sang like tense harp strings to the passage of innumerable bullets. The ground about his feet danced to their drumming, flicked and spat little spurts of mud all over him but the forward officer paid little heed to these things. For one moment his gaze was riveted horror-stricken on the scene of the fight. The next he was on his feet, heedless of the singing bullets, heedless of the roar and crash of another shell that hit the ground and flung a cartload of earth and mud whizzing and thumping about him, heedless of everything, except the need to get quickly to the telephone. "'Tell the battery! Germans advancing! Heavy attack on our front!' He panted to the telephonist, jumping across to his corner and heaving himself up into place. The dust had cleared now so that he could see, and what he could see made him catch his breath. An almost solid line of Germans were clear of their trenches and pushing rapidly across the open on the weak centre, and the battery shells were falling behind the German line and still on their trenches. Swiftly the forward officer began to reel off his corrections of angles and range, and as the telephonist passed them on, gun after gun began to pitch its shells on the advancing line. The British rifles were busy, too, and their fire rose in one continuous roar. But the fire was weakest from the thin centre line, the spot where the attack was heaviest. The guns were in full play again, and the shells were blasting quick gaps out of the advancing line. But the line came on. 
the rifles beat upon it, and a machine-gun on the less heavily pressed left turned and mowed the Germans down in swaths. Still the line came on stubbornly. It was broken and ragged now, and advanced slowly, because the front ranks were constantly melting away under the British fire. The forward officer, watched with straining eyes, glued to his glasses. A shell whooped past close over his head and burst just beyond him. He neither turned his head nor moved his glasses. One, two, three, four burst short, and splinters and bullets sang past him. Two more burst overhead, and the shrapnel crashed and rattled amongst the stone and brick of the ruins. Without moving, the forward officer began to call a fresh string of orders. The rush of his shell ceased for a moment while the gunners adjusted the new angles and ranges. Number one fired, two fired, three, four, five, six fired, sir, called the telephonist, and as he spoke there came the shrieks of the shells and the white puffs of the bursts low down and between the prone British line and the advancing Germans. Number three, one oh minutes more left shouted the forward officer. Number five, add twenty-five, repeat. Again came the running bursts and the puffing white smoke, and satisfied this time with their line, position, and distance, the forward officer shouted for gunfire, jumped down and across to the telephonist's shelter pit. I'm putting a belt of fire just ahead of our line, he shouted curving his fingers about his lips and the mouthpiece in an attempt to shut out the uproar around them. If they can come through it, we're done. Infantry can't hold them. G give me every round you can, and as fast as you can, please. He ran back to his place. A cataract of shells poured their shrapnel down along a line of which the nearest edge was a bare twenty yards from the British front. The forward officer fixed his eyes on the string of white smoke puffs with their center of winking flame that burst and burst and burst unceasingly. If one showed out of its proper place, he shouted to the telephonist and named the delinquent gun and asked for the lay and functioning to be checked. The advancing Germans reached at last the strip of ground where his shrapnel hailed and lashed, reached the strip and pushed into it, but not past it. Up to the shrapnel zone, the advance could press. Through it, it could not. Under the shrapnel, nothing could live. It swept the ground in driving gust on gust, swept and besumed it bare of life. Here and there, in ones and twos and little knots and groups, the Germans strove desperately to push on. They came as far as that deadly fire belt, and in ones and twos and little knots and groups, they stayed there and died. Supports hurried up and hurled themselves in, and a spasm of fresh strength and fury lifted the line and heaved it forward. So far the fire of its fury brought it, and there the hosing shrapnel met it, swept down and washed it away, and beat it out to the last spark, and the last man. But from the German trenches another assault was forming. From the German batteries another squall of shell-fire smote the British line, and to his horror... The forward officer saw his own shells coming slower and slower, the smoke bursts growing irregular and slower again. He leaped down and rushed to the telephone. Back in the battery, the telephone wires ran into a dugout that was the brain center of the guns, and from here the forward officer's directions emerged and were translated to the gunners through the battery commander and the battery sergeant major's megaphone. All the morning the gunners followed those orders blindly, slewing the hot gun muzzles a fraction this way or that, making minute adjustments on sights and range drums and shell fuses. They could see no glimpse of the fight, but more or less accurately they could follow its varying fortunes and trace its movements by the orders that came through to them. When they had to send their shells further back, the enemy obviously were being pressed back. When the fire had to be brought closer, the enemy were closer. An urgent call for rapid fire with an increasing range meant our infantry attacking. With a lessening range, their being attacked. Occasionally the battery commander passed to the section commanders items of news from the forward officer, and they in turn told the numbers one in charge of the guns and the gun detachments. 
Such a message was passed along when the forward officer telephoned news of the heavy pressure on the weakened centre. Every man in the battery knew what was expected, and detachment vied with detachment in the speedy correcting of aim and range and the rapid service of their guns. When the order came for a round of battery fire, which calls for the guns to fire in their turn from right to left, one gun was a few seconds late in reporting ready, and every other man in every other gun fretted and chafed impatiently as if each second had been an hour. At another message from the forward officer, the battery commander called for section commanders. The sergeant major clapped megaphone to mouth and shouted, and two young subalterns and a sergeant jumped from their places and raced for the dugout. The major spoke rapidly and tersely. We are putting down a belt of shrapnel in front of our own infantry, very close to them. You know what that means. The most careful and exact laying and fusing, and fire as hot and heavy as you can make it. The infantry can't hold them. They're depending on us. The line depends on us. Tell your men so. Be off now. The three saluted, whirled on their heels, and were off. They told their men, and the men strained every nerve to answer adequately to the call upon them. The rate of fire worked up faster and faster. Between the thunder claps of the gun, the sergeant major's megaphone bellowed, Number six, check your lay. Number six missed the message, but the nearest gun caught the word and passed it along. The section commander heard, saluted to show he had heard, and understood, and ran himself to check the layer's aim. Up to now the battery had worked without coming under any serious fire. There were always plenty of rifle bullets coming over, and an occasional one of the shells that roared constantly past or over fell amongst the guns. A few men had been wounded, and one had been killed, and that was all. Then, quite suddenly, a tempest of high explosive shell rained down on the battery, in front of, behind, over, and amongst the guns. Instinctively the men hesitated in their work, but the next instant the voices of the section commanders brought them to themselves. There were shelter pits and dugouts close by, and without urgent need of their fire, the guns might be left while the gunners took cover till the storm was over. But there could be no thought of that now, while the picture was in everyone's mind of the infantry out there being hard-pressed and overborne by the weight of the assault. So the gunners stayed by their guns and loaded, laid, and fired as fast as they could serve their pieces. The gun shields gave little or no protection from high explosive shells, because these burst overhead and fling their fragments straight down, burst in rear and hurl jagged splinters outwards in every direction. The men were as open and unprotected to them as bare flesh is to bullet and coal steel, but they knelt or sat in their places and pushed their work into a speed that was only limited by the need for absolute accuracy. A shell burst close in rear of number one gun, and the whirlwind of splinters and bullets struck down half the detachment at a blow. The fallen men were lifted clear. The remaining gunners took up their appointed share of the lost men's duties. A shell was slung in, the breach slammed shut, the firing level jerked, and number one gun was in action again, and firing almost as fast as before. The sergeant in charge of another gun was killed instantaneously by a shrapnel bullet in the head. His place was taken by the next senior before the last convulsive tremors had passed through the dead man's muscles, and the gun kept on firing without missing a round. The shell fire grew more and more intense. The air was thick and choking with smoke and chemical fumes, and vibrant with the rush and shriek of the shells, the hum of bullets and the ugly whirl of splinters, the crash of impacting shells, and ear-splitting crack of the gun's discharge, the rip of shrapnel on the wet ground, and metallic clang of bullets and steel fragments on the gun shields and mountings. But through all the inferno the gunners worked on, swiftly but methodically. After each shot the layers glared anxiously into the eyepiece of their sights, and made minute movements of elevating and traversing wheels. The men at the range drums examined them carefully and adjusted them exactly. The fuse setters twisted the rings, marking the fuse's time of burning until they were correct literally to the hair line, every man working as if the gun were shooting for a prize competition cup. Their care, as well as their speed, was needed, 
for more than any cup good men's lives were at stake and hanging on their close and accurate shooting for if the sights were a shade to right or left at their aiming point if the range were shortened by a fractional turn of the drum if a fuse was wrongly set to one of the scores of tiny marks on its ring that shell might fall on the british line take toll of the lives of friend instead of foe go to break down the hard-pressed british resistance instead of upholding it man after man was hit by shell splinter or bullet but no man left his place unless he was too badly injured to carry on the seriously wounded dragged themselves clear as best they could and crawled to any cover from the bursting shells the dead lay where they fell the detachments were reduced to skeleton crews one section commander laid and fired a gun another with a smashed thigh sat and set fuses until he fainted from loss of blood and from pain the battery commander took the telephone himself and sent the telephonist to help the guns and when a bursting shell tore out one side of the sandbags of the dugout the battery commander rescued himself and the instrument from the wreckage mended the broken wire and sat in the open alternatively listening at the receiver and yelling exhortation and advice to the gunners through the sergeant major's megaphone the sergeant major had gone on the run to round up every available man and brought back at the double the battery cooks officers grooms mess orderlies and servants the slackening fire of the battery spurted again and ran up to something like its own rate and the major cheered the men on to a last effort shouting the forward officer's message that the attack was failing was breaking was being wiped out mainly by the battery's fire and then as suddenly as it had begun the tornado of shell fire about them ceased shifted its storm center and fell roaring and crashing and hammering on an empty hedge and ditch a full three hundred yards away and at the same moment the major shouted exultingly they're done he bellowed down the megaphone they're beat the attack and he fell back on the forward officer's own words the attack is blotted out whereat the panting gunners cheered faintly and short-windedly and took contentedly the following string of orders to lengthen the range and slacken the rate of fire and the battery made shift to move its dead from amongst the gun and wagon wheels to bandage and tie up its wounded with first field dressings to shuffle and sort the detachments and redistribute the remaining men in fair proportion amongst the remaining guns to telephone the brigade headquarters to ask for stretcher bearers and ambulance and more shells doing it all as it were with one hand while the other kept the guns going and the shells pounding down their appointed paths for the doing of two or more things at once and doing them rapidly exactly and efficiently and while in addition highly unpleasant things are being done to them is all a part of the gunner's game of close and accurate artillery support end of section four section five nothing to report of between the lines by boyd cable this librivox recording is in the public domain on the western front there is nothing to report all remains quiet official dispatch the seventh territorial king's own asterisks had taken over their allotted portion of the trenches and were settling themselves in for the night when the two facts are taken in conjunction that it was an extremely unpleasant night cold wet and bleak and the seventh were thoroughly happy and would not have exchanged places with any other battalion in flanders it will be very plain to those who know their front that the seventh k o a were exceedingly new to the game they were and actually this was their first spell of duty in the forward firing trenches they had been out for some weeks weary weeks filled with the digging of communication trenches well behind the firing trenches with drills and with various fatigues of what they considered a navvying rather than a military nature but every task piled upon their reluctant shoulders had been performed promptly and efficiently and now at last they were enjoying the rewards of their zeal a turn in the forward trenches 
The men were unfeignedly pleased with themselves, with the British army, and with the whole world. The non-coms were anxious and desperately keen to see everything in apple pie order. The company officers were inclined to be fidgety, and the O.C. was worried and concerned to the verge of nerves. He pored over the trench maps that had been handed to him. He imagined assaults delivered on this point and that, hurried at the point of the pencil his supports along various blue and red lines to the threatened angles of the wiggly line that represented the forward trench, drew lines from his machine-gun emplacements to the red-inked crosses of the German wire entanglements, frowned and cogitated over the pencil crosses placed by the O.C. of the relief battalion where the lurking places of German maxims were suspected. Afterwards he made a long and exhaustive tour of the muddy trenches, concealing his anxiety from the junior officers and speaking lightly and cheerfully to them, following therein truly and instinctively the first principle of all good commanders to show the greater confidence as they feel it the best. He returned to the battalion headquarters, situated in a very grimy cellar of a shell-wrecked house behind the support trenches, and partook of a belated dinner of tinned food flavoured with grit and plaster dust. The signallers were established with their telephones at the foot of the stone stair outside the cellar door, and into this cramped exchange ran the telephone wires from the companies in the trenches and from the brigade headquarters a mile or so back. Every word that the signallers spoke was plainly heard in the cellar, and every time the colonel heard, Hello, yes, this is HQ, he sat motionless waiting to hear what message was coming through. When his meal was finished, he resisted an impulse to phone all the forward trenches, asking how things were, unlaced his boots, paused, and laced them up again, lay down on a very gritty mattress in a corner of the cellar, and tried to sleep. For the first hour, every rattle of rifle fire, every thud of a gun, every call on the telephone brought him up on his pillow, his ears straining to catch any further sound. After about the tenth alarm, he reasoned the matter out with himself something after this fashion. Well, the battalion is occupying a position that has not been attacked for weeks, and it is disposed as other regular battalions have been and no more and no less effectually than they. There isn't an officer or man in the forward trenches who cannot be fully trusted to keep a lookout and to resist an attack to the last breath. There's no need to worry or keep awake, and to do so is practically admitting a distrust of the 7th KOA. I trust them fully, and therefore I ought to go to sleep whereupon the colonel sat up, took off his wet boots, lay down again, resolutely closed his eyes, and remained wide awake for the rest of the night. But if there be any who feel inclined to smile at the nervousness of an elderly, stoutish, and constitutionally easy-going colonel of territorials, I would remind them of a few facts. The colonel had implicit faith in the stout-heartedness, the spirit, the fighting quality of his battalion. He had had the handling and the training of them ever since mobilization, and he knew every single man of them as well as they knew themselves. They had done everything asked of them, and borne light-heartedly rough quarters, bad weather, hard duties. But, and one must admit it a big and serious but, tonight might be their real and their first testing in the flame and fire of war. Even as no man knows how he will feel and behave under fire, until he has been under fire, so no regiment or battalion knows. The men were razor-keen for action, but that very keenness might lead them into a rashness, a foolhardiness, which would precipitate action. The colonel believed uh, they would stand and fight to the last gasp and die to the last man, rather than yield a yard of their trench. He believed that of them, even as he believed it of himself but he did not know it of them any more than he knew it of himself. Men, apparently every bit as good as him, had before now developed some white streak, some folly, some stupidity, 
in the stress and strain of action. Other regiments, apparently as sound as his, had in the records of history failed or broken in a crisis. He and his were new and untried, and military commanders for innumerable ages had doubted and mistrusted new and untried troops. Well, he had done his best, and at least the next twenty-four hours would show him how good or how bad that best had been. But meantime, let no one blame him for his anxiety or nervousness. And meantime, the seventh asterisks, serenely unaware of their commanding officer's worry and doubt, and to be fair to them and to him it must be stated that they would have flouted scornfully any suggestion that he had held them, joyfully set about the impossible task of making themselves comfortable, and the congenial one of making the enemy extremely uncomfortable. The sentries were duly posted and spent an entirely unnecessary proportion of their time peering over the parapet. There were more very pistol lights burnt during the night than would have sufficed a trench-hardened battalion for a month, and the Germans opposite, having in hand a little job of adding to their barbed wire defences, were puzzled and rather annoyed by the unwanted uh, display of fireworks. They foolishly vented their annoyance by letting off a few rounds of rapid fire at the opposition, and the seventh asterisks eagerly accepted the challenge, manned their parapets, and proceeded to pour a perfect hurricane of fire back to the challengers. The Germans, with the exception of about a dozen picked sharpshooting snipers, ceased to fire and took careful cover. The snipers, daring the asterisks three minutes of activity, succeeded in scoring seven hits, and the asterisks found themselves in possession of a casualty list of one killed and six wounded before the company and platoon commanders had managed to stop the shooting and get the men down under cover. When the shooting had ceased and the casualties had been cleared out on their way to the dressing station, the asterisks recharged their rifle magazines and spent a good hour discussing the incident. Those men who had been beside the casualties finding themselves and their narratives of how it happened in great demand. And one of the casualties, having insisted when his slight wound was dressed on returning to the trench, had to deliver a series of lecturettes on what it felt like, what the medical said, how the other fellows were, how the dressing station was worked, and similar subjects with pantomimic illustrations of how he was holding his rifle when the bullet came through the loophole, and how he was still fully capable of continuing to hold it. A heavy shower dispersed the audience. Those of the men who were free to do so returning to muddy and leaky dugouts, and the remainder taking up their positions at the parapet. There was as much chance of these latter standing on their heads as there was of their going to sleep, but the officers made so many visiting rounds to be certain of their sentry's wakefulness, and spent so long on each round, and on the fascinating peeps over into the neutral ground, that the end of one round was hardly completed before it was time to begin the next. Occasionally the Germans sent up a flare, and every man and officer of the KOA who was awake stared out through the loopholes in expectation of they knew not what. They also fired off a good many pistol lights, and it was nearly 4 a.m. before the Germans ventured to send out their working party over the parapet. Once over, they followed the usual routine, throwing themselves flat in the mud and rank grass when a light flared up and remaining motionless until it died out. Springing to silent and nervous activity, the instant darkness fell, working mostly by sense of touch and keeping one eye always on the British parapet for the first hint of a soaring light. The neutral ground between the trenches was fairly thickly scattered over with dead, the majority of them German, and it was easy enough for an extra score or so of men, lying prone and motionless as the dead themselves, to be overlooked in the shifting light. The work was proceeding satisfactorily, and was almost completed when a mischance led to the exposure of the party. One of the workers was in the very act of crawling over the parapet when a British light flared. Halfway over, he hesitated one moment whether to leap back or forward, then hurriedly leapt down in front of the parapet and flung himself flat on his face. He was just too late. 
The lights revealed him exactly as he leapt, and a wildly excited King's Own Asterisk pulled back the cut-off of his magazine and opened rapid fire, yelling frenziedly at the same time that they were coming, were coming, were attacking, were charging, look out! Every KOA on his feet lost no time in joining in the mad minute, and every KOA who had been asleep or lying down was up in a twinkling and blazing over the parapet before his eyes were properly opened. The machine-gun detachment were more circumspect, if no less eager. The screen before the wide loophole was jerked away, and the fat barrel of the Maxim peered out and swung smoothly from side to side, looking for a fair mark. It had not long to wait. The German working party stuck it out for a couple of minutes, but with light after light flaming into the sky and exposing them piteously, with the British trench crackling and spitting fire from end to end, with the bullets hissing and whistling over them, and hailing thick amongst them, their nerves gave and broke. In a frantic desire for life and safety, they flung away the last chance of life and safety their prone and motionless position gave them. They scrambled to their feet, a score of long-cloaked, crouching figures, glaringly plain and distinct in the vivid light, and turned to run for their trench. The sheeting bullets caught half a dozen and dropped them before they had well stood up, stumbled another two or three over before they could stir a couple of paces, went on cutting down the remainder swiftly and mercilessly. The remainder ran, stumbling and tripping and staggering, their legs hampered by their long coats, their feet clogged and slipping in the wet, greasy mud. The eye glaring behind the swinging sights of the Maxim caught that clear target of running figures. The muzzle began to jet forth a stream of fire, and hissing bullets, the cartridge belt to click, racing through the breach. The bullets cut a path of flying mud splashes across the bare ground to the runners, played a moment about their feet, then lifted and swept across and across once, twice, thrice, on the first sweep, the thudding bullets found their targets. On the second, they still caught some of them. On the third, they sang clear across and into the parapet, for no figures were left to check their flight. The working party was wiped out. It took the excited rifleman another minute or two to realize that there was nothing left to shoot at except an empty parapet and some heaps of huddled forms. But the pause to refill the empty magazines steadied them, and then the fire died away. The whole thing was over so quickly that the rifle fire had practically ceased before the artillery behind had time to get to work, and by the time they had flung a few shells to burst in thunder and lightning roar and flash over the German parapet, the storm of rifle fire had slackened and passed. Hearing it die away, the gunners also stopped, reloaded, and laid their pieces, waited the reports of their forward officers, and on receiving them, turned into their dugouts and their blankets again. But the batteries covering the front held by the asterisks remained by their guns and continued to throw occasional rounds into the German trenches. Their forward officers had passed on the word, received from the asterisks, of a sharp attack quickly beaten back, that being the natural conclusion drawn from that leaping figure on the parapet and the presence of Germans in the open, and the guns kept up a slow rate of fire more with the idea of showing the enemy that the defence was awake and waiting for them than of breaking up another possible attack. The battalions of regulars to either side of the asterisks had more correctly diagnosed the situation as a false alarm, or ten rounds rapid on working parties, and their supporting artillery did no more than carry on their usual night firing. The result of all this was that the asterisks throughout the night enjoyed the spectacle of some very pretty artillery fire in the dark, on and over the trenches facing them, and also the much less pleasing one of German shells bursting in the British trenches, and especially in those of the K.O.A., they had the heaviest scare on the simple and usual principle of retaliation, whereby if our section A of trenches is shelled, we shell the German section facing it, and vice versa. The fire was by no means heavy, as artillery fire goes these days, and at first the asterisks were not greatly disturbed by it, 
but even a rate of three or four shells every ten or fifteen minutes is galling and necessitates the keeping of close cover or the loss of a fair number of men it took half a dozen casualties to impress firmly on the asterisks the need of keeping cover shell casualties have an extremely ugly look and some of the asterisks felt decidedly squeamish at sight of theirs especially of one where the casualty had to be collected piece by piece and removed in a sack for an hour before dawn the battalion stood too lining the trench with loaded rifles ready after the usual and accepted fashion shivering despite their warm clothing and mufflers and woolen caps and thick great coats in the raw-edged cold of the breaking day for an hour they stood there listening to the whine of overhead bullets and the sharp slap of well-aimed ones in the parapet the swish and crash of shells the distant patter of rifle fire and the boom of guns that hour is perhaps always the worst of the twenty-four the rousing from sleep the turning out from warm or even from wet blankets the standing still in a waterlogged trench with everything fingers and clothes and rifle and trench sides cold and wet and clammy to the touch and smeared with sticky mud and clay all combined to make the morning stand to arms an experience that no amount of repetition ever accustoms one to or makes more bearable even the asterisks fresh and keen and enthusiastic as they were with all the interest that novelty gave to the proceedings found the hour long drawn and trying and it was with intense relief that they saw the frequently consulted watches mark the finish of the time and received the word to break off from their vigil they set about lighting fires and boiling water for tea and frying a meagre bacon ration in their mess tin lids preparing and eating their breakfast the meal over they began on their ordinary routine work of daily trench life picked men were tilled off as snipers to worry and harass the enemy they were posted at loopholes and in various positions commanded a good lookout and they fired carefully and deliberately at loopholes in the enemy parapet at doors and windows of more or less wrecked buildings in rear of the german lines at any and every head or hand that showed above the german parapet in the intervals of firing they searched through their glasses every foot of parapet every yard of ground every tree or bush hayrick or broken building that looked a likely spot to make cover for a sniper on the other side if their eye caught the flash of a rifle the instantly vanishing spurt of haze or hot air too thin and filmy to be called smoke that spot was marked down long and careful search made for the hidden sniper and a sort of busily disappearing target shoot commenced until the opponent was either hit or driven to abandon his position the enemy's snipers were of course playing exactly the same game and either because they were more adept at it or because the asterisk snipers were more reluctant to give up a position after it was spotted and hung on gamely determined to fight it out a slow but steady tally was added to the asterisk's casualty list along the firing and communication trenches parties set to work of various sorts bailing out water from the trench bottom putting in brushwood or brick foundations building up and strengthening dugouts and parapets filling sandbags in readiness for a night work and repairs on any portion damaged by shell fire by now they were learning to keep well below the parapet not to linger in positions of the communication trench that were enfiladed by shrapnel to stoop low and pass quickly at exposed spots where the snipers waited a chance to catch an unwary head they had learned to press close and flat against the face of the trench or to get well down at the first hint of the warning rush of an approaching shell they were picking up neatly and quickly all the worst danger spots and angles and corners to be avoided except in time of urgent need one thing more was needed to complete their education in the routine of trench warfare and the one thing came about noon just as the asterisks were beginning to feel pleasant anticipations of the dinner hour 
a faint and rather insignificant bang sounded out in front. The asterisks never even noticed it, but next moment when something fell with a thudding splosh on the wet ground behind the trench, the men nearest the spot lifted their heads and stared curiously. Another instant, and with a thunderous roar and a leaping cloud of thick smoke, the bomb burst. The men ducked hastily, but one or two were not quick enough or lucky enough to escape, although at that short distance they were certainly lucky, in escaping with nothing worse than flesh wounds from the fragments of old iron and nails and metal splinters that whirled outwards in a circle from the bursting bomb. Everyone heard the second shot, and many saw the bomb come over in a high curve. As it dropped, it appeared to be coming straight down into the trench, and every man had an uncomfortable feeling that the thing was going to fall directly on him. Actually, it fell short, and well out in front of the trench, and only a few splinters and a shower of earth whizzed over harmlessly high. The third was another over, and the fourth another short, and the asterisks, unaware of the significance of the closing in bracket began to feel relief and a trifle of contempt for this clumsy, slow-moving, and visible missile. Their relief and contempt vanished forever when the fifth bomb fell exactly in the trench, burst with a nerve-shattering roar, and filled the air with whistling fragments and dense, choking, blinding smoke and stench. Having got their range and angle accurately, the Germans proceeded to hurl bomb after bomb with the most horrible exactness and persistency. For two hundred yards up and down the trench there was no escape from the blast of the bursts. It was no good crouching low or flattening up against the parapet, for the bombs dropped straight down and struck out backwards and sideways and in every direction. Even the roofed-in dugouts gave no security. A bomb that fell just outside the entrance of one dugout riddled one man lying inside and blew another who was crouching in the entrance outwards bodily across the trench, studding him with the shock and injuring him in a score of places. Plenty of the bombs fell short of the trench, but too many fell fairly in it. When one did so, there was only one thing to do, to throw oneself violently down in the mud of the trench bottom and wait heart in mouth for the crash of the explosion. The artillery, on being appealed to, pounded the front German trench for an hour, but made no impression on the trench mortar. The O.C. of the asterisks telephoned the brigade, asking what he was to do to stop the torment and destruction, and in reply was told he ought to bomb back at the bomb-throwers. But the asterisks had already tried that without any success. The distance was too great for hand-bombs to reach, and the men appeared to make poor shooting with their rifle grenades. "'Why not try the trench mortar?' asked the brigade, to which the harassed colonel replied conclusively that he didn't possess one, hadn't a bomb for one, and hadn't a man or officer who knew how to use one. The brigade apparently learnt this with surprise, and replied vaguely that uh, steps would be taken, and that an officer and detachment of his battalion must receive a course of instruction. The colonel replied with spirit that he was glad to hear all this, but in the meantime, what was he to do to prevent his battalion being blown in piecemeal out of their trenches? It all ended eventually in the arrival of a trench mortar and a pile of bombs from somewhere, and a very youthful and very much annoyed artillery subaltern from somewhere else. The colonel was most enormously relieved by these arrivals, but his high hopes were a good deal dashed by the artilleryman. That youth explained that he was in effect totally ignorant of trench mortars and their ways, that he had been shown the thing a week ago, had it explained to him, so far as such a rotten toy could be explained, and had fired two shots from it. However, he said briskly, if off-handedly, he was ready to have a go with it and see what he could do. The trench mortar was carried down to the forward trench, and on the way down behind it, the youngster discoursed to the O.C. of the asterisks on the awful rot of a gunner officer being chased off on a job like this, any knowledge of gunnery being entirely superfluous and indeed wasted on such a kid's toy. And the O.C., looking at the trench mortar being prepared, made a mental remark about the mouths of babes and the wise words thereof. The weapon is easily described. 
It was a mere cylinder of cast iron, closed at one end, open at the other, and with a roomy touch-hole at the closed end. The carriage consisted of two uprights on a base, with mortar between them and pointing up at an angle of about forty-five degrees. The charge was little packets of gunpowder tied up in paper in measured doses. The bomb was a tin can, an empty jam tin mostly, filled with a bursting charge and fragments of metal, and with an inch or so of the fuse protruding. The piece was loaded by throwing a few packets of powder into the muzzle, poking them with a piece of stick to burst the paper, and carefully sliding the bomb down on top of the charge. A length of fuse was poked into the touch-hole, and the end of it lit, a sufficient length being given to allow the lighter to get round the nearest corner before the mortar fired. The whole thing was too rubbishy and cheaply and roughly made to have been fit for use as a kid's toy, as the subaltern called it, to imagine it being used as a weapon of precision in a war distinguished above all others as one of scientifically perfect weapons and implements was ridiculous beyond words. The colonel watched the business of loading and laying with amazement and consternation. Is it uh, possible to uh, hit anything with that? he asked. Well, more or less, said the youthful subaltern doubtfully. There's a certain amount of luck about it, I believe. But why on earth? said the colonel, beginning to wax indignant. Do they send such a museum relic here to fight a reasonably accurate and decidedly destructive mortar? The subaltern chuckled. Oh, that's not any museum antique, he said. That's a mortar trench, mark something or other, the latest, the most modern weapon of its kind in the British Army. It was made, I believe, in the Royal Arsenal, and it is still being made and issued for use in the field. The engineers collecting the empty jam pots and converting them to bombs. Uh, they've only had four or five months, you see, to uh, evoke a... Look out, sir, here's one of theirs. The resulting explosion flung a good deal of mud over the parapet onto the colonel and the subaltern and raised the youth to wrath. Beasts, he cried angrily and poked a length of fuse in the touch-hole. "'Get away round the traverse,' he ordered the mob near him. "'And you'd better go too, sir, as I will when I've touched her off. You see, it's just as liable to explode, is not? And if she does, she'd make more of a mess in this trench than I can ever hope she will in a German one.' The colonel retired round the nearest traverse, and the next moment the lieutenant plunged round after him just as the mortar went off with a resounding bang. Every man in the trench watched the bomb rise, twirling and twisting, and fall again, turning end over end toward the German trench. At about the moment he judged it should burst, the lieutenant poked his head up over the parapet, but bobbed down hurriedly as a couple of bullets sang past his ear. "'Pretty nippy lot across there,' he said. "'I must find a loophole to observe from. And perhaps you'll tell some of your people to keep up a brisk fire on that parapet and stop them aiming too easy at me. We'll try another. At the next bang from the opposite trench, he risked another quick peep over and this time ducked down with an exclamation of delight. I've spotted him, he said, just caught the haze of his smoke. Down the trench about fifty yards. So we'll try a trail left a piece or would if this old drain pipe had a trail. He relayed his mortar carefully and fired again. Having no sights or arrangement whatever for laying beyond a general look over the line of its barrel and a pinch more or less of powder in the charge, it can only be called a piece of astounding good luck that the jam-pot bomb fell almost fairly on the top of the German mortar. There was a most satisfying uproar, an eddying volume of smoke and eruption of earth, and the lieutenant stared through a loophole dumbfounded with delight. "'I'll swear,' he said, "'that our old plum and apple pot never made a burst that big. I do believe it must have flopped down on the other fellow and blown up one or two of his bombs same time. I say, isn't that the most gorgeous good luck? <laughs> well, good enough to go on with.' <laughs> We'll have a chance for some peaceful practice now. 
Apparently, since the other mortar ceased to fire, it must have been put out of action, and the lieutenant spent a useful hour pot-shotting at the other trench. The shooting was, to say the least, erratic. With apparently the same charge and the same tilt on the mortar, one bomb would drop yards short and another yards over. If one in three went within three yards of the trench, if one in six fell in the trench, it was, according to the lieutenant, a high average, and as many as any man had a right to expect. But at the end of the hour, the asterisks, who had been hugely enjoying the performance, and particularly the cessation of German bombs, were horrified to hear a double report from the German trench and to see two dark blobs fall twinkling from the sky. The following hour was a nightmare. Their trench mortar was completely outshot. Those fiendish bombs rained down one after the other along the trench, burst in devastating circles of flame and smoke, and whirling metal here, there, and everywhere. The lieutenant replied gallantly, a dozen times he had to shift position because he was obviously located and was being deliberately bombarded. But at last the gunner officer had to retire from the contest. His mortar showed distinct signs of going to pieces, the muzzle end having begun to split and crack and the breech end swelling in a dangerous-looking bulge. Look at her, said the lieutenant disgustedly. Look at her opening out and unfolding herself like a split-lipped ox-eyed daisy. Anyhow, this is my last bomb, so the performance must close down till we get some more jam-pots loaded up. The enemy mortars were evidently of better make, for they continued to bombard the suffering asterisks for another full hour. They did a fair amount of damage to the trench and parapet, and the Germans seized the opportunity of the asterisks' attempted repairs to put in some maxim practice and a few rounds of shrapnel. Altogether, the seventh king's own asterisks had a lively twenty-four hours of it, and their casualties were heavy, far beyond the average of an ordinary day's trench work. Forty-seven, they totaled in all, nine killed and thirty-six wounded. They were relieved that night, this short spell being designed sort of introduction or breaking in or blooding to the game. Taking it all round, the asterisks were fully pleased with themselves. Their colonel had complimented them on their behaviour, and they spent the next few days back in the reserve speculating on what the papers would say about them. The optimists were positive they would have a full column at least. We be on attack, they said. There's sure to be a bit in about that, and look at the way we were shelled, and our artillery shelled back. There was a pretty fair imitation of a first-class battle for a bit, and most likely there would have been one if we hadn't scuppered that attack. And don't forget the bombing we stuck out, and the casualties. Doesn't everyone tell us that they were extra heavy, and I believe we are about the first terrier lot to be in a heavy do in the forward trenches. You'll see. It'll be a column at least, and maybe two. The pessimists declared that two or three paragraphs were all they could expect, on account of the silly fashion of not publishing details of engagements. And whatever mention we do get, they said, won't say a word about the KOA. It'll just be a, a battalion, or maybe a territorial battalion, and no more. Anyway said the optimist. We'll be able to write home to our people and our pals and tell them it was us, though the dispatchers don't mention us by name. But optimists and pessimists alike grabbed the papers that came to hand each day and searched eagerly for the eyewitness reports or the official dispatch or communique. At last there reached them the paper with the communique dated the day after their day in the trenches. They stared at it and then hurried over the other pages, turned back and examined them carefully one by one. There were columns and columns about a strike and other purely domestic matters at home, but not a word about the seventh king's own asterisks, territorial. Not a word about their nine dead and thirty-six wounded. Not a word. And more than that, barely a word about the army or the front or the war. "'They might be no bloomin' war at all, the look of this paper,' said one in disgust. 
there's plenty about speeding up the factories and it's about time they speeded it up someone to make something better in that drain pipe or jam pot bomb we saw plenty about those loafing swine at home not a blooming word about us here ah, it makes me fair sick oh perhaps there wasn't time to get it in suggested one of the most persistent optimists perhaps they'll have it in tomorrow perhaps said the disgusted one contemptuously and perhaps not look at the date of that dispatch isn't that the day we was in the thick of it and look at what it says don't I make her sick and in truth it did make them sick for their night and day of fighting their defeat of an attack their suffering from shell bullet and bomb their nine killed and their thirty-six wounded were all ignored and passed by the dispatch for that day said simply on the western front there is nothing to report all remains quiet end of section five section six the promise of spring of between the lines by boyd cable this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Only when the fields and roads are sufficiently dry will the favorable moment have come for an advance. Extract from Official Dispatch It is Sunday, and the regiment marching out toward the firing line and its turn of duty in the trenches meets on the road every now and then a peasant woman on her way to church some of the women are young and pretty some old and wrinkled and worn they walk alone or in couples or threes but all alike are dressed in black and all alike tramp slowly dully without spring to their step over them the sun shines in a blue sky round them the birds sing and the trees and fields spread green and fresh the flush of healthy spring is on the countryside the promise of warm full-blooded summer pulses in the air but there is no hint of spring or summer in the sad-eyed faces or the listless slow movements of the women it is a full dozen miles to the firing line and to eye or ear unless one knows where and how to look and listen there is no sign of anything but peace and pleasant life in the surroundings but these black-clad women do know know that the cool green clump of trees over on the hillside hides a roofless ruin with fire-blackened walls, that the church spire that for all their lives they had seen out there over the skyline is no longer visible, because it lies shell-smitten to a tumbled heap of brick and stone and mortar, that the glint of white wood and spot of scarlet yonder in the field is the rough wooden cross with a kepi on top marking the grave of a soldier of France, that down in the hollow just out of sight are over a score of those cap-crowned crosses, that a broad belt of those graves runs unbroken across the sunlit face of France. They know, too, that those dull booms that travel faintly to the ear are telling plain of more graves and of more women that will wear black. It is little wonder that there are few smiles to be seen on the faces of these women by the wayside. They have seen and heard the red wrath of war, not in the pictures of the illustrated papers, not in the cinema shows, not even by the word-of-mouth tales of chance men who have been in it, but at first hand, with their own eyes and ears, in the leaping flames of burning homes, in the puffing white clouds of the shrapnel, the black spouting smoke of the high explosive, in the deafening thunder of the guns, the yelling shells, the crash of falling walls, the groans of wounded men, the screams of frightened children, some of them may have seen the shattered hulks of men borne past on the sagging stretchers. All of them have seen the laden ambulance wagons and motors crawling slowly back to the hospitals. And of these women you do not say, as you would of our women at home, that they may perhaps have friend or relation, a son, a brother, a husband, a lover, at the front. You say with certainty they have one or other of these, and may have all that every man they know, of an age between, say, eighteen and forty, is serving his country in the field or in the workshops, and mostly in the field, 
if so be they are still alive to serve. The men in the marching khaki regiment know all these things, and there are respect and sympathy in the glances and the greetings that pass from them to the women. They're good plucked ones, they tell each other, and wonder how our women at home would shape at this game, and whether they would go on living in a house that was next door to one blown to pieces by a shell yesterday, and keep on working in fields where hardly a day passed without a shell screaming overhead, whether they'd still go about their work as best they could for six days a week, and then to church on Sunday. Two women, one young and lissom, the other bent and frail, and clinging with her old arm to the erect figure beside her, stand aside close to the ditch and watch the regiment tramp by. "'Cheer up, mother,' one man calls. "'We're going to shift the Boshies out for you.' And bong jour says another, waving his hand. Another pulls a sprig of lilac from his cap and thrusts it out as he passes. "'Souvenir,' he says, lightly, and the young woman catches the blossom and draws herself up with her eyes sparkling and calls, "'Bon chance, monsieur. Good luck.' She repeats the words over and over while the regiment passes, and the men answer, "Bon chance, and good luck, and such scraps of French as they know, or think they know. The women stand in the sunshine and watch them long after they have passed, and then turn slowly and move on to their church and their prayers. The regiment tramps on. It moves with the assured stamp and swing of men who know themselves and know their game, and have confidence in their strength and fitness. Their clothes are faded and weather-stained, their belts and straps and equipments chafed and worn, the woodwork of their rifles smooth of butt and shiny of hand-grip from much using and cleaning, their faces bronzed and weather-beaten, and with a dew of perspiration just damping their foreheads, where men less fit would be streaming sweat, are full-cheeked and glowing with health, and cheek and chin razored clean and smooth as a guardsman's going on church parade. The whole regiment looks fresh and well set up and clean-cut, satisfied with the day and not bothering about the morrow, magnificently strong and healthy, carelessly content and happy, not anxious to go out of its way to find a fight, but impossible to move aside from its way by the fight that does find it. All of which is to say it looks exactly what it is, a British regiment of the regular line, war-hardened by eight or nine months fighting, moving up from a four days' rest back into the firing line. It is fairly early in the day, and the sun, although it is bright enough to bring out the full colour of the green grass and trees, the yellow laburnum and the purple lilac, is not hot enough to make marching uncomfortable. The road, a main route between two towns, is paved with flat cobbles about the size of large bricks, and bordered mile after mile with tall poplars. There are farms and hamlets and villages strung close along the road, and round and about all these houses are women and children, and many men in khaki, a few dogs, some pigs perhaps, and near the farms plenty of poultry. By most of the farms, too, are orchards and fruit trees in blossom and in some of these lines of horses are ranked or wagons are parked, sheltered by the trees from aerial observation. For all this, it must be remembered, is far enough back from the firing line to be beyond the reach of any but the longest range guns, guns so big that they are not likely to waste some tons of shells on the off chance of hitting an encampment and disabling few or many horses or wagons. Toward noon, the regiment swings off the road and halts in a large orchard, Rifles are stood aside, equipments and packs are thrown off, tunics unbuttoned and flung open or off, and the men drop with puffing sighs of satisfaction on the springy turf under the shade of the fruit trees. The travelling cookers rumble up, and huge cauldrons of stew and potatoes are slung off, carried to the different companies, and served steaming hot to the hungry men. A boon among boons, these same self-cookers, Less so, perhaps, now that the warmer weather is here, but a blessing beyond price in the bitter cold and constant wet of the past winter, when a hot meal served without waiting kept heart in many men, and even life itself in some. Their fires were lit before the regiment broke camp this morning, 
and the dinners have been jolting over the long miles ever since sun-up, cooking as comfortably and well as they would in the best-appointed camp or barrack cookhouse. The men eat mightily, then light their pipes and cigarettes and loll at their ease. The trees are masses of clustering pink and white blossom. The grass is carpeted thick with the white of fallen petals and splashed with sunlight and shade. A few slow-moving clouds drift hastily across the blue sky. The big fat bees drone their sleepy song amongst the blossoms. The birds rustle and twitter among the leaves and flit from bough to bough. It would be hard to find a more peaceful picture in any country steeped in the most profound peace. There is not one jarring note, until the honk-honk of a motor is followed by the breathless panting whirr of the engine, and a big car flashes down the road and past, travelling at the topmost of its top speed. There is just time to glimpse the khaki hood and the thick scarlet cross blazing on a white circle, and the car is gone. Empty as it is, it is moving fast, and with luck and a clear road it will be well inside the danger zone at the back door of the trenches in less than twenty minutes. In half an hour, perhaps, it will have picked up its full load, and be sliding back smoothly and gently down the cobbled road, swinging carefully now to this side to avoid some scattered bricks, now to that to dodge a shell-hole patched with gravel, driven down as tenderly and gently as it was driven up fiercely and recklessly. Presently there are a few quiet orders, a few minutes stir and movement, a shifting to and fro of khaki against the green, pink, and white, and the companies have fallen in and stand in straight rulered ranks. A pause, a sharp order or two, and the quick staccato of numbering off ripples swiftly down the lines. Another pause, another order, the long ranks blur and melt, harden and halt instantly in a new shape and evenly and steadily the ranked fours swing off, turn out into the road, and go tramping down between the poplars. There has been no flurry, no hustle, no confusion. The whole thing has moved with the smoothness and precision and effortless ease of a properly adjusted well-oiled machine, which, after all, is just what the regiment is. The pace is apparently leisurely, or even lazy, but it eats up the miles amazingly, and it can be kept up with the shortest of halts from dawn to dusk. As the miles unwind behind the regiment, the character of the country begins to change. There are fewer women and children to be seen now. There are more roofless buildings, more house fronts gaping doorless and windowless, more walls with ragged rents and tumbled heaps of brick lying under the yawning black holes. But the grass is still green, and the trees thick with foliage, the fields neatly ploughed and tilled and cultivated, with here and there a staring notice planted on the edge of a field where the long straight drills are sprinkled with budding green. Crops so do not walk here. Altogether there is little sign of the heavy hand of war upon the country and such signs as there are remain unobtrusive and wrapped up in springing verdure and bloom and blossom. Even the trapping of war, the fighting machine itself, wears a holiday or, at most, an Easter peace maneuver appearance. A heavy battery has its guns so carefully concealed, so bowered in green, that it is only the presence of the lounging gunners, and close searching looks that reveal a few inches of muzzle peering out toward the hill crest in front. Scattered about behind the guns, covered with beautiful green turf, shadowed by growing trees, are the dwelling places of the gunners, deep dugouts with no visible sign of their existence except the square black hole of the doorway. Out in the open, a man sits with a pair of field glasses, sweeping the sky. He is the aeroplane lookout, and at the first sign of a distant speck in the sky or the drone of an engine, he blows shrilly on his whistle, Every man dives to earth or under cover, and remains motionless until the whistle signals all clear again. An enemy aeroplane might drop to within pistol shot and search for an hour, without finding a sign of the battery. When the regiment swerves off the main road and moves down a winding side track over open fields, past tree-encircled farms, and along by thick-leaved hedges, 
it passes more of these jack-in-the-green concealed batteries all wear the same look of happy and indolent ease near one is a stream and the gunners are bathing in an artificially made pool plunging and splashing in showers of glistening drops they are like schoolboys at a picnic it seems utterly ridiculous to think that they are grim fighting men whose business in life for months past and for months to come is to kill and kill and to be killed themselves if such is the fortune of war another battery of field artillery passes on the road but even here shorn of their concealing greenery in all the bare working and ready for business apparel of marching order there is little to suggest real war drivers and gunners are spruce and neat and clean the horses are slick and well fed and groomed till their skins shine like satin in the sun the harness is polished and speckless bits and stirrup irons and chains and all the scraps of steel and brass twinkle and wink in bright and shining splendor the ropes of the traces the last touch of pride in perfection this surely are scrubbed and whitened the whole battery is as spick and span as complete and immaculate as if it were waiting to walk into the arena at the naval and military tournament such scrupulous perfection on active service sounds perhaps unnecessary or even extravagant but the teams remember have been for weeks past luxuriating in comfortable ease miles back in their wagon line billets where the horses have done nothing for days on end but feed and grow fat and the drivers nothing but clean up and look after the teams and harness if the guns up in the firing line had to shift position it has meant no more to the teams than a break of the monotony for a day or two a night or two's marching and a return to the rear it is afternoon now and the regiment is drawing near to the trenches the slanting sun begins to throw long shadows from the poplars the open fields are covered with tall grass and hay that moves in long slow undulating waves under the gentle breeze that is rising the sloping light falling on them gives the waves an extraordinary resemblance to the lazy swell on a summer sea here and there the fields are splashed with broad bands of vivid colour the blazing scarlet of poppies the glowing cloth of gold of yellow mustard the rich deep splendid blue of cornflowers for one or two miles past the track has been plainly marked by signposts bearing directions to the various trenches and their entrances now at a parting of the main track a group of guides men from the regiment being relieved from the trenches wait the incoming regiment company by company platoon by platoon the regiment moves off to the appointed places and by company and platoon the outcoming regiment gathers up its belongings and moves out in most parts of the firing line these changes would only be made after dark but this section bears the reputation of being a peaceful one the germans opposite of being tame so the reliefs are made in daytime more or less in safety there has been no serious fighting here for months constant sniping and bickering between the forward firing trenches has of course always gone on but there has been no attack one way or the other little shell fire and few aeroplanes over the companies that take over the support trenches get varied instructions and advice about tending the plants and flowers round the dugouts and watering the mustard and cress box they absorb the advice strip their accoutrements and tunics roll up their shirt sleeves and open the throats fish out soap and towels from their packs and proceed to the pump to lather and wash copiously the companies for the forward trench march down interminable communication trenches distribute themselves along the parapet and also absorb advice from the outgoing tenants advice of the positions of enemy snipers the hours when activity and when peace may be expected the especially unhealthy spots where a sniper's bullet or a bomb must be watched for the angles and loopholes that give the best lookout the trenches are deep and well made the parapets solidly constructed for four days or six or as many as the regiment remains in the range of the men's vision will be the walls of the trench 
in the piled sandbags, the inside of their dugouts, and a view, taken in peeps through a loophole or reflected in a periscope mirror, of about fifty to a hundred yards of neutral ground and the German parapet beyond. The neutral ground is covered with a jungle of coarse grass, edged on both sides with a tangle of barbed wire. Close to the German parapet are a few black huddled heaps, dead Germans, shot down while out in a working party on the wire at night, and left there to rot, and some killed in their own trench, and tumbled out over the parapet by their own comrades. The drowsy silence is broken at long intervals by a rifle shot. A lark pours out a stream of joyful, thrilling song. A mile or two back from the firing line, a couple of big motor cars swing over the crest of a gentle rise, swoop down into the dip, and halt suddenly. A little group of men with scarlet staff bands on their caps and tabs on their collars climb out of the cars and move off the track into the grass of the hollow. They prod sticks at the ground, stamp on it, dig a heel in to test its hardness and dryness. The general looks round. This is about as low-lying a spot as we have on this part of the front, he says to his chief of staff. If it is dry enough here, it must be dry enough everywhere else. The chief assents, and for a space the group stands looking round the sunlit fields and up at the clear sky. But their thoughts are not of the beauties of the peaceful landscape. The words of the general are the key to all their thoughts. For them the promise of spring is a grim and a sinister thing. To them the springy green turf carpet on the fields means ground fit to bear the weight of teams and guns, dry enough to give firm foothold to the ranks of infantry charging across the death trap of the neutral ground, where clogging wet slippery mud adds to the minutes under the hail of fire, and every minute there in the open means hundreds of lives lost. The hard dry road underfoot means merely that roads are passable for heavy guns and transport. The thick green foliage of the trees is so much cover for guns, and the moving of troops and transport under concealment from air observation. The clear blue sky promises a continuance of fine weather, the final release from the inactivity of the trenches. To these men the promise of spring is the promise of the crescendo of battle and slaughter. The general and his staff are standing in the middle of a wide patch of poppies, spread out in a bright scarlet that matches exactly the red splashes on the brows and throats of the group. They move slowly back toward the cars, and as they walk the red ripples and swirls against their boots and about their knees. One might imagine them wading knee-deep in a river of blood. End of section 6、section、seven, the advance of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The attack has resulted in our line being advanced from one to two hundred yards along a front of over one thousand yards. Official dispatch. Down to the rawest hand in the latest joint drafts, every one knew for a week before the attack commenced that something was on, and for twenty four hours before that the something was a move of some importance, no mere affair of a battalion or two or even of brigades, but of divisions and corps and armies. There had been vague stirrings in the regiments far behind the firing line in rest, refittings, and completings of kits, reissuing of worn equipments and a most ominous anxiety that each man was duly equipped with an identity disc the tell-tale little badge that hangs always round the neck of a man on active service and that bears the word of who he is when he is brought in wounded who he was when brought in dead the old hands judged all the signs correctly and summed them up in a sentence being fattened for the slaughter and were in no degree surprised when the sudden order came to move. Those farthest back moved up the first stages by daylight, 
but when they came within reach of the rumbling guns they were halted and bivouacked to wait for night to cloak their movements from the prying eyes of the enemy planes. The enemy might have, probably had, an inkling of the coming attack, but they might not know exactly the portion of front selected for the heaviest pressure, and this must be kept secret till the last possible moment. So the final filing up into the forward and support trenches was done by night, and was so complete by daylight that no sign of unwanted movement could be discerned from the enemy trenches and observing stations when day broke. It was a beautiful morning, soft and mildly warm and sunny, with just a slight haze hanging low to tone the growing light, and incidentally to delay the opening of fire from the guns. Anyone standing midway between the forward-firing trenches might have looked in vain for living side of the massed hordes waiting the word to bid each other's throats. Looking forward from behind the British lines, it could be seen that the trenches and parapets were packed with men, but no man showed head over parapet, and, seen from the enemy's side, the parapets presented blank, lifeless walls. The trenches gave no glimpse of life." All the bustle and movement of the night before was finished. At midnight every road and track leading to the forward trenches had been brimming with men, with regiments tramping slowly or squatting stolidly by the roadside, smoking much and talking little, had been crawling with transport, with ammunition carts and ambulances and stretcher parties, and sappers heavily laden with sandbags and rolls of barbed wire. The trenches, support, communication, and firing, had trickled with the creeping rivulets of khaki caps and been a bristle with bobbing rifle barrels. Further back, amongst the lines of guns, the last loads of ammunition were rumbling up to the batteries, the last shells required to complete establishment, and over-complete it, were being stowed in safe proximity to the guns. At midnight there were scores of thousands of men and animals busily at work with preparations for the slaughter-pen of the morrow. Before midnight came again the bustle would be renewed, and the circling ripples of activity would be spreading and widening from the central splash of the battle-front till the last waves washed back to Berlin and London, brimming the hospitals and swirling through the munition factories. But now at daybreak the battlefield was steeped in brooding calm. Across the open space of the neutral ground a few trench periscopes peered anxiously for any sign of movement, and saw none. The battery's forward observing officers, tucked away in carefully chosen and hidden lookouts, fidgeted with wrist-watches and field-glasses, and passed back by telephone continual messages about the strength of the growing light and the lifting haze. An aeroplane droned high overhead, and an Archibald, an anti-aircraft gun, or two, began to pattern the sky about it with a trail of fleecy white smoke puffs. The plane sailed on and out of sight, the smoke puffs and the wheezy barks of Archibald receding after it. Another period of silence followed. It was broken by a faint report like the sound of a far-off door being slammed, and almost at the same instant there came to the ear the faint, thin whistle of an approaching shell. The whistle rose to a rush and a roar that cut off abruptly in a thunderous bang. The shell pitched harmlessly on the open ground between the forward and support trenches. Again came the faint slam, this time repeated by four, and the bouquet of four shells crumped down almost on top of the support line. The four crashes might have been a signal to the British guns, about a dozen reports thudded out quickly and separately, and then in one terrific blast of sound the whole line broke out in heavy fire. The infantry in the trenches could distinguish the quick following bangs of the gun directly in line behind them, could separate the vicious swish and rush of the shells passing immediately over their heads. Apart from these, the reports blent in one long, throbbing pulse of noise, an indescribable medley of moanings, shrieks, and whistling in the air rent by the passing shells. So ear-filling and confused was the clamour that the first sharp sudden bursts of the enemy shells over our trenches were taken by the infantry for their own artillery shells falling short, but a very few moments proved plainly enough that the enemy were replying vigorously to our fire, 
They had the ranges well marked, too, and huge rents began to show in our parapets. Strings of casualties began to trickle back to the dressing stations in a stream that was to flow steady and unbroken for many days and nights. But the enemy defences showed more and quicker signs of damage, especially at the main points, where the massed guns were busy breaching the selected spots. Here the lighter guns were pouring a hurricane of shrapnel on the dense thickets of barbed wire entanglements piled in loose loops and coils, strung in a criss-cross network between pegs and stakes along the edge of the neutral ground. The howitzers and heavies were pounding and hammering at the parapets and the communication trenches beyond. For half an hour the appalling uproar continued. The solid earth shook to the roar of the guns and the crashing of the shells. By the end of that time both fronts, to a depth of hundreds of yards, were shrouded in a slow-drifting haze of smoke and dust, through which the flashes of the bursting shell blazed in quick glares of vivid light, and the spots of their falling were marked by gushes of smoke and upflung billowing clouds of thick dust. So far the noise was only and all of guns and shell fire, but now from far out on one of the flanks a new note began to weave itself into the uproar, the sharper crackle and clatter of rifle and machine-gun fire. Along the line of front marks for the main assault, the guns suddenly lifted their fire, and commenced to pour it down further back, although a number of the lighter guns continued to sweep the front parapet with gusts of shrapnel. And then suddenly it could be seen that the front British trench was alive and astir. The infantry, who had been crouched and prone in the shelter of the trenches, rose suddenly and began to clamber over the parapets into the open, and make their way out through the maze of their own entanglements. Instantly the parapet opposite began to crackle with rifle fire and to beat out a steady tattoo from the hammering machine guns. The bullets hissed and spat across the open and hailed upon the opposite parapet. Scores, hundreds of men fell before they could clear the entanglements to form up in the open, dropped as they climbed the parapet or even as they stood up and raised a head above it. But the mass poured out, shook itself roughly into line and began to run across the open. They ran for the most part with shoulders hunched and heads stooped, as men would run through a heavy rainstorm to a near shelter. And as they ran, they stumbled and fell and picked themselves up and ran again, or crumpled up and lay still or squirming feebly. As the line swept on doggedly, it thinned and shredded into broken groups. The men dropped under the rifle bullets singly or in twos and threes. The bursting shells tore great gaps in the line, snatching a dozen men at a mouthful. Here and there, where it ran into the effective sweep of a maxim, the line simply withered and dropped and stayed still in a string of huddled heaps amongst and on which the bullets continued to drum and thud. The open ground was a full hundred yards across at the widest point where the main attack was delivering. Fifty yards across, the battalion assaulting was no longer a line, but a scattered series of groups like beads on a broken string. Sixty yards across, and the groups had dwindled to single men, and couples with desperately long intervals between. Seventy yards, and there were no more than odd occasional men, with one little bunch near the centre that had by some extraordinary chance escaped the sleet of bullets. At eighty yards, a sudden swirl of lead caught this last group, and the line at last was gone, wiped out. The open was swept clear of those dogged runners. The open ground was dotted thick with men, men lying prone and still, men crawling on hands and knees, men dragging themselves slowly and painfully with trailing, useless legs, men limping, hobbling, staggering in a desperate endeavour to get back to their parapet and escape the bullets and shrapnel that still stormed down upon them. The British gunners dropped their ranges again, and a deluge of shells and shrapnel burst crashing and whistling upon the enemy's front parapet. The rifle fire slackened and almost died, and the last survivors of the charge had such chance as was left by the enemy's shells to reach the shelter of their trench. Groups of stretcher-bearers leaped out over the parapet and ran to pick up the wounded, and hard on their heels another line of infantry swarmed out and formed up for another attack. As they went forward at a run, the roar of rifles and machine-guns swelled again, and the hail of bullets began to sweep across to meet them. 
Into the forward trench they had vacated, the stream of another battalion poured, and had commenced to climb out in their turn, before the advancing line was much more than halfway across. This time the casualties, although appallingly heavy, were not so hopelessly severe as in the first charge, probably because a salient of the enemy trench to a flank had been reached by a battalion further along, and the devastating enfilading fire of rifles and machine guns cut off. This time the broken remnants of the line reached the barbed wires, gathered in little knots as the individual men ran up and down along the face of the entanglements, looking for the lanes cut clearest by the sweeping shrapnel, streamed through with men still falling at every step, reached the parapet and leaped over and down. The guns had held their fire on the trench till the last possible moment, and now they lifted again and sought to drop across the further lines and the communication trenches a shrapnel curtain through which no reinforcements could pass and live. The following battalion came surging across, losing heavily, but still bearing weight enough to tell when at last they poured in over the parapet. The neutral ground, the deadly open and exposed space, was won. It had been crossed at other points, and now it only remained to see if the hold could be maintained, and strengthened and extended. The fighting fell to a new phase, the work of the short-arm bayonet thrust and the bomb-throwers. In the gaps between the points where the trench was taken, the enemy fought with the desperation of trapped rats. The trench had to be taken traverse by traverse. The bombers lobbed their missiles over into the traverse ahead of them in showers, and immediately the explosions crashed out, swung round the corner with a rush to be met in turn with bullets or bursting bombs. Sometimes a space of two or three traverses was blasted bare of life and rendered untenable for long minutes on end by a constant succession of grenades and bombs. In places the men of one side or the other leaped up out of the trench, risking the bullets that sleeted across the level ground and emptied a clip of cartridges or hurled half a dozen grenades down into the trench further along. But for the most part the fight raged below ground level, at times even below the level of the trench floor, where a handful of men held out in a deep dugout. If the entrance could be reached, a few bombs speedily settled the affair, but where the defenders had hastily blocked themselves in with a barricade of sandbags or planks, so that grenades could not be pitched in, there was nothing left to do but crowd in against the rifle muzzles that poked out and spurted bullets from the openings, tear down the defences, and so come at the defenders. And all the time the captured trench was pelted by shells, high explosive and shrapnel. At the entrances of the communication trenches that led back to the support trenches, the fiercest fighting raged continually, with men struggling to block the path with sandbags, and others striving to tear them down, while on both sides their fellows fought over them with bayonet and butt. In more than one such place the barricade was at last built by the heap of the dead who had fought for possession. In others crude barriers of earth and sandbags were piled up and fought across and pulled down and built up again a dozen times. In the middle of the ferocious individual hand-to-hand -hand fighting a counter-attack was launched against the captured trench. A swarm of the enemy leaped from the next trench and rushed across the twenty or thirty yards of open to the captured front line. But the counter-attack had been expected. The guns caught the attackers as they left their trench and beat them down in scores. A line of riflemen had been installed under cover of what had been the parapet of the enemy front trench, and this line broke out in the mad minute of rifle fire. The shrapnel and the rifles between them smashed the counter-attack before it had well formed. It was cut down in swaths, and had totally collapsed before it reached halfway to the captured trench. But another was hurled forward instantly, was up out of the trench and streaming across the open before the infantry had finished recharging their magazines. Then the rifle spoke again in rolling crashes. The screaming shrapnel pounced again on the trench that still erupted hurrying men, while from the captured trench itself came hurtling bombs and grenades. Smoke and dust leaped and swirled in dense clouds above the trenches and the open between them, but through the haze the ragged front fringe of the attack loomed suddenly and pressed on to the very lip of the trench. Beyond that point it appeared it could not pass. The British infantry, 
cramming full cartridge clips into their magazines, poured a fresh cataract of lead across the broken parapet into the charging ranks, and the ranks shivered and stopped and melted away beneath the fire, while the remnants broke and fled back to cover. With a yell, the defenders of a moment before became the attackers. They leaped the trench and fell with the bayonet on the flying survivors of the counter-attack. For the most part, these were killed as they fled, but here and there groups of them turned at bay, and in a dozen places as many fights raged bitterly for a few minutes while the fresh attack pushed on to the next trench. A withering fire poured from it, but could not stop the rush that fought its way on and into the second-line trench. From now the front lost connection or cohesion. Here and there the attackers broke in on the second line, exterminated that portion of the defense in its path, or was itself exterminated there. Where it won footing, it spread raging to either side along the trench, shooting, stabbing, flinging hand grenades, and bearing down the defenders by the sheer fury of the attack. The movement spread along the line, and with a sudden leap and rush the second line was gained along a front of nearly a mile. In parts this attack overshot its mark, broke through and over the second line, and tearing and hacking through a network of wire into the third trench. In part the second line still held out, and even after it was all completely taken, the communication trenches between the first and second line were filled with combatants who fought on furiously, heedless of whether friend or foe held trench in front or rear, intent only on the business at their own bayonet points to kill the enemy facing them and push in and kill the ones behind. Fresh supports pressed into the captured positions, and back by their weight the attack surged on again in a fresh spasm of fury. It secured foothold in great sections of the third line, and even without waiting to see the whole of it made good, attempted to rush the fourth line. At one or two points the gallant attempt succeeded, and a handful of men hung on desperately for some hours, their further advance impossible, their retreat had they attempted it almost equally so, cut off from reinforcements, short of ammunition, and entirely without bombs or grenades. When their ammunition was expended, they used rifles and cartridges taken from the enemy dead in the trench. Having no grenades, they snatched and hurled back on the instant any that fell with fuses still burning. They waged their unequal fight to the last minute, and were killed out to the last man. The third line was not completely held, or even taken. One or two loopholed and machine-gunned dugout redoubts, or keeps, held out strenuously, and before they could be reduced, entrance being gained at last literally by tearing the place down, sandbag by sandbag, till a hole was made and grenade after grenade flung in. Other parts of the trench had been recaptured. The weak point that so often hampers attack was making itself felt. The bombers and grenadiers had exhausted the stock they carried. Fresh supplies were scanty, were brought up with difficulty, and distributed to the most urgently required places with still greater difficulty. The ammunition carriers had to cross the open of the old neutral ground, the battered first trench, pass along communication trenches choked with dead and wounded, or again cross the open to the second and third line. All the time they were under the fire of heavy explosive shells and had to pass through a zone or barrage of shrapnel built across their path for just this special purpose of destroying supports and supplies. Our own artillery were playing exactly the same game behind the enemy lines, but in these lines were ample stores of cartridges and grenades, bombs and trench mortars. The third and fourth lines were within easy bomb and grenade throwing distance, and were connected by numerous passageways. On this front the contest became a bombing duel, and because the British were woefully short of bombs and the enemy could throw five to their one, they were again bombed out and forced to retire. But by now the second trench had been put in some state of defence towards its new front, and here the British line stayed fast and set its teeth and doggedly endured the torment of the bombs and the destruction of the pounding shells. Without rest or respite, 
they endured till night and on through the night under the glare of flares and the long-drawn punishment of the shell-fire until the following day brought with the dawn fresh supports for a renewal of the struggle the battered fragments of the first attacking battalions were withdrawn, often with corporals for company leaders and lieutenants or captains commanding battalions whose full remaining strength would hardly make a company. The battle might only have been well begun, but at least, thanks to them and to those scattered heaps lying among the grass, spread in clumps and circles about the yawning shell-holes, buried beneath the broken parapets and in the smashed trenches, to them and those and these others passing out with haggard pain-lined faces shattered limbs and torn bodies on the red wet stretchers to the dressing stations at least the battle was well begun the sappers were hard at work in the darkness consolidating the captured positions and these would surely now be held firm whatever was to follow these first regiments had done their share Two lines of trenches were taken. The line was advanced. Advanced, it is true, a bare one or two hundred yards, but with lives poured out like water over every foot of the advance, with every inch of the ground gained marking a well-spring and fountainhead of a river of pain, and of a suffering beyond all words, of a glory above and beyond all suffering. End of section 7"'Section 8. A Convert to Conscription of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Have maintained and consolidated our position in the captured trench.' Extract from Official Dispatch. "'Number 9 to Walt 36, Sapper Duffy, J.' A section, Southland Company, Royal Engineers, had been before the war plain Jim Duffy, labourer, and as such had been an ardent anti-militarist, anti-conscriptionist, and anti-everything else his labour leaders and agitators told him. His anti-militarist beliefs were sunk soon after the beginning of the war, and there is almost a complete story in itself in the tale of their sinking waited first by a girl who looked ahead no further than the pleasure of walking out with a khaki uniform and finally plunged into the deeps of the army by the jibe of a stauncher anti-militarist during a heated argument that if he believed now in fighting why didn't he go and fight himself but even after his enlistment he remained true to his beliefs in voluntary service and the account of his conversion to the principles of conscription, no half-and-half -half measures of military training or rifle clubs or hybrid arrangements of that sort, but out-and-out -out conscription, may be more interesting, as it certainly is more typical, of the conversion of more thousands of members of the serving forces than will ever be known, until those same thousands return to their civilian lives and the holding of their civilian votes. By nightfall, the captured trench, well, it was only a courtesy title to call it a trench, previous to the assault, the British guns had knocked it about a good deal. Bombs and grenades had helped further to disrupt it in the attacks and counter-attacks during the day, and finally, after it was captured and held, the enemy had shelled and high explosive it uh, out of any likeness to a real trench but the infantry had clung throughout the day to the ruins, had beaten off several strong counter-attacks, and in the intervals had done what they could to dig themselves more securely in and repile some heaps of sandbags from the shattered parapet on the trench's new front. The casualties had been heavy, and since there was no passage from the front British trench to the captured portion of the German except across the open of the neutral ground, most of the wounded and all the killed had had to remain under such cover as could be found in the wrecked trench. The position of the unwounded was bad enough and unpleasant enough, but it was a great deal worse for the wounded. A bad wound damages mentally as well as physically. The casualty is out of the fight, 
has had a first field dressing placed on his wound, has been set on one side to be removed at the first opportunity to the dressing station and the rear. He can do nothing more to protect himself or take such cover as offers. He is in the hands of the stretcher-bearers, and must submit to be moved when and where they think fit. And in this case the casualties did not even have the satisfaction of knowing that every minute that passed meant a minute further from the danger zone, a minute nearer to safety and to the doctors, and the hospital's hope of healing. Here they had to be throughout the long day, hearing the shriek of each approaching shell, waiting for the crash of its fall, wondering each time if this one, the, the rush of its approach rising louder and louder to an appalling screech, was going to be the finish, a direct hit. Many of the wounded were wounded again, or killed as they lay, and from others the strength and the life had drained slowly out before nightfall. But now that darkness had come, the casualties moved out and the supports moved in. From what had been the German second trench, and on this portion of front was now their forward one, lights were continually going up and bursts of rifle and machine-gun fire were coming, and an occasional shell still whooped up and burst over or behind the captured trench. This meant that the men, the supports, and food and water carriers and stretcher-bearers, were under a dangerous fire even at night in crossing the old neutral ground, and it meant that one of the first jobs absolutely necessary to the holding of the captured trench was the making of a connecting path more or less safe for moving men, ammunition, and food by night or day. This, then, was the position of affairs when A section of the Southland Company of Engineers came up to take a hand and this communication trench was the task that Sapper Duffy, J., found himself set to work on. Personally, Sapper Duffy knew nothing of, and cared less for, the tactical situation. All he knew or cared about was that he had done a longish march up from the rear the night before, that he had put in a hard day's work carrying up bales of sandbags and rolls of barbed wire from the carts to the trenches, and that here before him was another night's hard labour, to say nothing of the prospect of being drilled by a rifle bullet or mangled by a shell. All the information given him and his section by their section officer was that they were to dig a communication trench, that it must be completed before morning, that as long as they were above ground they would probably be under a nasty fire, and that therefore the sooner they dug themselves down under cover, the better it would be for the job and for all concerned. A section removed its equipment and tunics and moved out on to the neutral ground in its shirt sleeves, shivering at first in the raw cold and at the touch of the drizzling rain, but knowing that the work would very soon warm them beyond need of hampering clothes. In the ordinary sense, digging a trench under fire is done more or less under cover by sapping, digging the first part in a covered spot, standing in the deep hole, cutting down the face, and gradually burrowing away across the danger zone. The advantage of this method is that the workers keep digging their way forward, while all the time they are below ground and in the safety of the sap they dig. The disadvantage is that the narrow trench only allows one or two men to get at its end or face to dig, and the work consequently takes time. Here it was urgent that the work be completed that night, because it was very certain that as soon as its whereabouts were disclosed by daylight, it would be subjected to a fire too severe to allow any party to work, even if the necessary passage of men to and fro would uh, leave any room for a working party. The digging, therefore, had to be done down from the surface, and the diggers, until they had sunk themselves into safety, had to stand and work fully exposed to the bullets that whined and hissed across from the enemy trenches. A zigzag line had been laid down to mark the track of the trench, and Sapper Duffy was placed by his sergeant on this line and told briefly to get on with it. Sapper Duffy spat on his hands, placed his spade on the exact spot indicated, drove it down, and began to dig at a rate that was apparently leisurely, but actually was methodical and nicely calculated to a speed that could be long and unbrokenly sustained. 
During the first minute, many bullets whistled and sang past, and Sapper Duffy took no notice. A couple went, What? past his ear, and he swore and slightly increased his working speed. When a bullet whistles or sings past, it is a comfortable distance clear. When it goes, Hiss, or Hiss, it is too close for safety. And when it says, What? very sharply and viciously, it is merely a matter of being a few inches out either way. Sapper Duffy had learned all this by full experience, and now the number of whats he heard gave him a very clear understanding of the dangers of this particular job. He was the farthest out man of the line. On his left hand he could just distinguish the dim figure of another digger, stooping and straightening, stooping and straightening, with the rhythm and regularity of a machine. On his right hand was empty darkness, lit up every now and then by the glow of a flare light showing indistinctly through the drizzling rain. Out of the darkness, or looming big against the misty light, figures came and went, stumbling and slipping in the mud, stretcher-bearers carrying or supporting the wounded, a ration supply party staggering under boxes balanced on shoulders, a strung-out line of supports, stooped and trying to move quietly, men in double files linked together by swinging ammunition boxes. All these things Sapper Duffy saw out of the tail of his eye, and without stopping or slacking the pace of his digging. He fell unconsciously to timing his movements to those of the other man, and for a time the machine became a twin engine working beat for beat. Thrust, stoop, straighten, heave. Thrust, stoop, straighten, heave. Then a bullet said the indescribable word that means hit, and Duffy found that the other half of the machine had stopped suddenly and collapsed in a little heap. Somewhere along the line a voice called softly, Stretcher bearers? And almost on the word two men and a stretcher materialized out of the darkness, and a third was stooping over the broken machine. He's gone, said the third man after a pause. Lift him clear. The two men dropped the stretcher, stooped and fumbled, lifted the limp figure, laid it down a few yards away from the line, and vanished in the direction of another call. Sapper Duffy was alone with his spade and a foot-deep square hole and the hissing bullets. The thoughts of the dead man so close beside him disturbed him vaguely, although he had never given a thought to the scores of dead he had seen behind the trench, and that he knew were scattered thick over the neutral ground where they had fallen in the first charge. But this man had been one of his own company in his own section. It was different about him, somehow. Yet, of course, Sapper Duffy knew that the dead must at times lie where they fall, because the living must always come before the dead, especially when there are many more wounded than there are stretchers or stretcher-bearers. But all the same, he didn't like poor old Jigger Adams being left there. Didn't see how he could go home and face old Jigger's missus and tell her he'd come away and left Jigger lying in the mud of a mangle wurzel field. Blessed if he wouldn't have a try when they were going to give Jigger a lift back. A line of men, shirt sleeved like himself and carrying spades in their hands, moved out past him. An officer led them, and another, with Sapper Duffy's section officer, brought up the rear and passed along the word to halt when he reached Duffy. "'Here's the outside man of my lot,' he said. "'So you'll join on beyond them. You've just come in, I hear, so I suppose your men are fresh.' "'Fresh,' said the other disgustedly. "'Not much.' They've been digging trenches all day about four miles back. It's too sickening. Pity we don't do like the Boches. Conscript all the able-bodied civilians and make them do this trench digging in rear. Then we might be fresh for the firing line. Don't, don't must talk about conscripting them, said Duffy's officer reprovingly. One volunteer, you know, worth ten pressed men. Yes, said the other. But when there isn't enough of the one volunteer, it's about time to call the ten pressed. Two or three flares went up almost simultaneously from the enemy's line. The cackle of fire rose to a brisk fusillade, and through it ran the sharp rat-a-tat-tat of a machine-gun. The rising sound of the reports told plainly of the swinging muzzle, and officers and men dropped flat in the mud and waited till the sweeping bullets had passed over their heads. Men may work on and chance it against rifle fire alone, 
but the sweep of a machine-gun is beyond chance, and very near to the certainty of sudden death to all in the circle of its swing. The officers passed on, and the new men began to dig. Sapper Duffy also resumed work, and as he did so he noticed that there was something familiar about the bulky shape of the new digger next to him. "'What are you?' asked the new man, heaving out the first spadeful rapidly and dexterously. "'We're A section, Southland Company,' said Duffy. "'And I, I say, ain't you beefy, Wilson?' "'That's me,' said the other without checking his spade. "'And blow me, you must be Duffy, Jim Duffy.' "'That's right,' said Duffy. "'But I didn't know you'd join, Beefy.' "'Oh, just a week or two after you.' said Beefy. "'Did you know Boss's two sons had got commissions? <laughs> Joined the sappers and tried to raise a company out of the works to join. <laughs> Couldn't, though. <laughs> I was the only one.' "'Look out! Is that blanky Maxim again?' said Duffy, and they dropped flat very hurriedly. There was no more conversation at the moment. There were too many bullets about to encourage any lingering there, and both men wanted all their breath for their work. It was hard work, too. Duffy's back and shoulder and arm muscles began to ache dully, but he stuck doggedly to it. He even made an attempt to speed up Beefy's rate of shoveling, though he knew by old experience alongside Beefy that he could never keep up with him, the unchallenged champion of the old gang. Whether it was that the lifting rain had made them more visible or that the sound of their digging had been heard, they never knew. But the rifle fire, for some reason, became faster and closer, and again and again the call passed for stretcher-bearers, and a constant stream of wounded began to trickle back from the trench-diggers. Duffy's section was not so badly off now, because they had sunk themselves hip-deep, and the earth they threw out in a parapet gave extra protection. But it was harder work for them now, because they stood in soft mud and water well above the ankles. The new company, being the more exposed, suffered more from the fire, but each man of them had a smaller portion of trench to dig, so they were catching up to the first workers. But all spaded furiously, and in haste to be done with the job, while the officers and sergeants moved up and down the line and watched the progress made. More cold-bloodedly unpleasant work it would be hard to imagine. The men had none of the thrill and heat of combat to help them, they had not the hope that a man has in a charge across the opening, that a minute or two gets the worst of it over. They had not even the chance the fighting man has, where at last his hand may save his head. Their business was to stand in the one spot, open and unprotected, and without hope of cover or protection for a good hour or more on end. They must pay no heed to the singing bullets, to the crash of a bursting shell, to the rising and falling glow of the flares. Simply they must give body and mind to the job in hand, and dig and dig and keep on digging. There had been many brave deeds done by the fighting men on that day. There had been bold leading and bold following in the first rush across the open against a tornado of fire. There had been forlorn hope dashes for ammunition or to pick up wounded. There had been dogged and desperate courage in clinging all day to the battered trench under an earth-shaking tempest of high-explosive shells, bombs, and bullets. But it is doubtful if the day or the night had seen more nerve-trying, courage-testing work, more deliberate and long-drawn bravery than was shown, as a matter of course and as a part of the job, in the digging of that communication trench. It was done at last, and although it might not be a Class One exhibition bit of work, it was, as Beefy Wilson remarked, a deal better than none. And although the trench was already a foot deep in water, Beefy stated no more than the bold truth in saying, Come tomorrow, there's plenty will put up glad with their knees being below high water mark for the sake of having their heads below low bullet mark. But if the trench was finished, the night's work for the engineers was not. They were moved up into the captured trench and told that they had to repair it and wire out in front of it before they were done. They had half an hour's rest before recommencing work, and Beefy Wilson and Jim Duffy hugged the shelter of some tumbled sandbags, lit their pipes, and turned the bulls down, 
and exchanged reminiscences. "'Let's see,' said Beefy. "'In Jigger had him, senor lot?' "'Was,' corrected Jim. "'Tell an hour ago. "'He's out yon with a bullet in him. "'Stiff by now.' Beefy breathed blasphemous regrets. "'Rough on his missus and the kids. Six of them, weren't it?' "'Ah,' assented Jim. "'But she'll get something for the society funds.' "'Not a ape worth said Beefy. you remember no, it was just after you left. The trades unions decided no benefits would be paid out to them as listed. It was Ben Shrillett engineered that. He was secretary and treasurer and things of other societies as well as ours. He fought the war right along, and he's still fighting it. He's a anti-militant, he says. Uh, anti-militarist, Jim corrected. He had taken some pains himself in the old days to get the word itself and some of its meaning right. Anti-militaryist, then, said Beefy. Anyhow, he stuck out again all sorts of soldiering. This stopping the society benefits was a trump card, too. I blocked a, a whole crowd from Liston that I knew myself would have joined. Queered the boss's sons raising that company, too. <laughs> They had frickers and the BSL company had the works to draw from. Could have raised a couple hundred easy if Ben Shrillett hadn't got at em. Oh, you know how he talks the fellers round. I know, agreed Jim, sucking hard on his pipe. The sergeant broke in on their talk. Now then, he said briskly, sooner we start, sooner we're done, and off home to our downy couch. Here, Duffy. And he pointed out the work Duffy was to start. For a good two hours the engineers labored like slaves again. The trench was so badly wrecked that it practically had to be reconstructed. It was dangerous work because it meant moving freely up and down, both where cover was and was not. It was physically heavy work because spade work in wet ground must always be that, and when the spade constantly encounters a debris of broken beams, sandbags, rifles, and other impediments, and the work has to be performed in eye-confusing alternations of black darkness and dazzling flares, that makes the whole thing doubly hard. When you add in the constant whisk of passing bullets and the smack of their striking, the shriek and shattering burst of high-explosive shells and the drone and whir of flying splinters, you get labor conditions removed to the utmost uh, limit from ideal and to any but the men of the sappers, well over the edge of the impossible. The work at any other time would have been gruesome and unnerving, because the gasping and groaning of the wounded hardly ceased from end to end of the captured trench, and in digging out the collapsed sections many dead Germans and some British were found blocking the vigorous thrust of the spades. Duffy was getting fair fed up, although he still worked on mechanically. He wondered vaguely what uh, Ben Shrillett uh, would have said to any member of the trade union that had worked a night, a day, and a night on end. He wondered, too, how Ben Shrillett would have shaped in the Royal Engineers, and for all his cracking muscles and the back-breaking weight and unwieldiness of the wet sandbags, he had to grin at the thought of Ben, with his podgy fat fingers and his visible rotundity of waistcoat, sweating and straining there in the wetness and darkness with death whistling past his ear and crashing in shrapnel bursts about him. The joke was too good to keep to himself, and he passed it to Beefy next time he came near. Beefy saw the jest clearly and guffawed aloud, to the amazement of a clay-daubed infantryman, who had had nothing in his mind but thoughts of death and loading and firing his rifle for hours past. No wonder Ben's again conscription, said Beefy. They might conscription him, and passed on grinning. Duffy had never looked at it in that light. He'd been anti-conscription himself, though now, maybe, he didn't know. He wasn't so sure. And after the trench was more or less repaired came the last and the most desperate business of all, the wiring out there in the open under the eye of the soaring lights. In ones and twos, during the intervals of darkness, the men tumbled over the parapet, dragging stakes and coils of wire behind them. They managed to drive short stakes and run trip wires between them without the enemy suspecting them. 
when a light flamed every man dropped flat in the mud and lay still as the dead beside them till the light died in the brief intervals of darkness they drove the stakes with muffled hammers and ran the lengths of barbed wire between them heart in mouth they worked one eye on the dimly seen hammer and stake head the other on the german trench watching for the first upward trailing sparks of the flare plenty of men were hit of course because light or dark the bullets were kept flying but there was no pause in the work not even to help the wounded in if they were able to crawl they crawled dropping flat and still while the lights burned hitching themselves painfully toward the parapet under cover of the darkness if they could not crawl they lay still dragging themselves perhaps behind the cover of a dead body or lying quiet in the open till the time would come when helpers would seek them their turn came when the low wires were complete the wounded were brought in cautiously to the trench then and hoisted over the parapet the working party was carefully detailed and each man's duty marked out before they crawled again into the open with long stakes and strands of barbed wire the party lay there a minute after minute through periods of light and darkness until the officer in charge thought a favorable chance had come and gave the arranged signal every man leaped to his feet the stakes were planted and quick blow after blow drove them home another light soared up and flared out and every man dropped and held his breath waiting for the crash of fire that would tell they were discovered but the flare died out without a sign and the working party hurriedly renewed their task this time the darkness held for an unusual length of time and the stakes were planted the wires fastened and cross pieces of wood with interlacings of barbed wire already were rolled out and pegged down without another light showing the word passed down and the men scrambled back into safety better shoot a light up quick said the engineer officer to the infantry commander they have a working party out now i heard them hammering that's why they went so long without a light a pistol light was fired and the two stared out into the open ground on it thought so said the engineer pointing new stakes see and those fellows lying beside them get your tools together sergeant he said as several more lights flamed and a burst of rapid fire rose from the british rifles and collect your party our job's done and i'm not sorry for it it was just breaking daylight when the remains of the engineers party emerged from the communication trench and already the guns on both sides were beginning to talk beefy wilson and jim duffy between them found jigger's body and brought it in as far as the dressing station Behind the trenches, Beefy's company and Jem's section took different roads, and the two old friends parted with a casual salong and see you again sometime. Duffy had two hours' sleep in a sopping wet roofless house about three miles behind the firing line. Then the section was roused and marched back to their billets in a shell-wrecked village a good ten miles farther back. They found what was left of the other three sections of the Southland Company there heard the tale of how the company had been cut up in advancing with the charging infantry, ate a meal, scraped some of the mud off themselves, and sought their blankets and wet straw beds. Jim Duffy could not get the thought of Ben Shrillett, labor leader and agitator, out of his mind, and mixed with his thoughts as he went to sleep were that officer's remarks about pressed men that perhaps accounts for his waking thoughts running on the same groove when his sergeant roused him at black midnight and informed him the section was being turned out to dig trenches trenches sputtered sapper duffy us how is it our turn again because my son said the sergeant there's nobody else about here to take a turn come on roll out shower leg it was then that Sapper Duffy was finally converted and renounced for ever and ever his anti-conscription principles. Nobody else, he said slowly, and England fair stiff with men. The sooner we get conscription, the better I like it. Conscription solid for every blooming able-bodied man and boy. And I hope Ben Shrillett and his likes is the first to be took conscription he said with the emphasis of finality as he fumbled in wet straw for a wetter boot 
out and out, lock, stock, and barrel conscription. That same night, Ben Shrillett was presiding at a meeting of the strike committee. He had read on the way to the meeting the communique that told briefly of Sapper Duffy and his fellow engineer's work of the night before, and the descriptive phrase struck him as sounding neat and defective. He worked it now into his speech to the committee, explaining how and where they and he benefited by this strike, unpopular as it had proved. "'We've vindicated the rights of the workers,' he said. We've shown that war or no war, labor means to be more than mere wage slaves. War can't last forever, and we here, this committee, proved ourselves by this strike the true leaders and the champions of labor, the guardians of the rights of trade unionism. We, gentlemen, have always been that, and by the strike, and he concluded with the phrase from the dispatch, we have maintained and consolidated our position. The committee said, hear, hear. It is a pity they could not have heard what Sapper Duffy was saying as he sat up in his dirty wet straw, listening to the rustle and patter of rain on the barn's leaky roof and tugging on an icy cold board stiff boot. End of section eight. Section nine Business as Usual of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The remains of the regiment were slowly working their way back out of action. They had been in it for three days, three strenuous nights and days of marching, of fighting, of suffering under heavy shell-fire, of insufficient and broken sleep, of irregular and unpalatable rations, of short commons of water, of nerve-stretching excitement and suspense, all the inevitable discomforts and hardships that in the best organized of armies must be the part of any hard-fought action. The regiment had suffered cruelly and their casualties had totaled some sixty per cent of the strength. And now they were coming back, jaded and worn, filthily grimed and dirty, unshaven, unwashed, footsore and limping, but still in good heart and able to see a subject for jests and laughter in the sprawling fall of one of their number plunging hastily to shelter from the unexpected rush and crash of a shell, in the sultry stream of remarks from an exasperated private when he discovered a bullet-pierced water-bottle and the loss of his last precious drops of water. The men were trickling out in slow, thin streams along communication and support trenches, behind broken buildings and walls and barricades under any cover that screened them from the watchful eyes of the enemy observers perched high in trees and buildings, and everywhere they could obtain a good lookout over our lines. In the minds of the men, the thoughts of almost all ran in the same grooves, first and most strongly, because perhaps the oftenest framed in speech that it was hot. This hot, and that hot, hot is so-and-so, or such-and-such, such, according to the annoyance or wit of the speaker, second, and much less clearly defined, a dull satisfaction that they had done their share, and done it well, and that now they were on their way out to all the luxury of plenty of food and sleep, water to drink, water and soap to wash with, third, and increasing in proportion as they got farther from the forward line and the chance of being hit, a great anxiety to reach the rear in safety. The fear of being hit by shell or bullet was a hundredfold greater than it had been during their part in the action, when the risk was easily a hundred times greater, and more sympathy was expended over one man casualtied coming out than over a score of those killed in the actual fight. It seemed such hard lines, after going through all they had gone through and escaping it scot-free, that a man should be caught just when it was all over, and he was on the verge of a more or less prolonged spell outside the urgent danger zone. The engagement was not over yet. 
It had been raging with varying intensity for almost a week, had resulted in a considerable advance of the British line, and had now resolved itself into a spasmodic series of struggles on the one side to make good the captured ground and steal a few more yards, if possible, on the other to strengthen the defence against further attacks and to make the captured trenches untenable. But the struggle now was to the regiment coming out a matter of almost outside interest, an interest reduced nearly to the level of the newspaper readers at home, something to read or hear and talk about in the intervals of eating and drinking, of work and amusement and sleep and the ordinary incidents of daily life. Except, of course, that the regiment always had at the back of this casual interest, the more personal one, that if affairs went badly, their routine existence in reserve might be rudely interrupted, and they might be hurried back and flung into the fight. But that was unlikely, and meantime there were still stray shells and bullets to be dodged. The rifles and kits were blasphemously heavy, and it was most blasphemously hot. The men were occupied enough in picking their steps in the broken ground, in their plodding, laborious progress, above all in paying heed to the order constantly passing back to keep low, but they were still able to note with a sort of professional interest the damage done to the countryside. A small holding cottage between the trenches had been shelled and set on fire, and was gutted to the four bare blackened walls. The ground about it still showed in the little squares and oblongs that had divided the different cultivations, but the difference now was merely of various weeds and rank growths, and the ground was thickly pitted with shell holes. A length of road was gridironed with deep and laboriously dug trenches, and of the poplars that ran along its edge some were broken off in jagged stumps, some stood with stems as straight and bare as telegraph poles, or half cut through and collapsed like a half-shut knife or an inverted V with their heads in the dust. Others were left with heads snapped off and dangling in grey withered leaves, or with branches glinting white splinters and stripped of naked, as in the dead of winter. In an orchard the fruit trees were smashed, uprooted, heaped pell-mell in a tangle of broken branches, bare twisted trunks, fragments of stump a foot or a yard high. Here a tree slashed off short, lifted and flung a dozen yards, and left head down and trunk in air. There a row of currant bushes with a yawning shell crater in the middle, a ragged remnant of bush at one end, and the rest vanished utterly, leaving only a line of torn stems from an inch to a foot long to mark their place. A farm of some size had been at one time a point in the advanced trenches, and had been converted into a keep. Its late owner would never have recognized it in its new part. Such walls as were left had been buttressed out of sight by sandbags, trenches twisted about among the outbuildings, burrowed under and into them, and wriggled out again through holes in the walls. A market cart turned upside down and earthed over to form a bomb store, occupied a corner of the farmyard. Cover for snipers' loopholes had been constructed from plowshares. A remaining fragment of a grain loft had become an observing station. The farm kitchen, a doctor's dressing station, the cow house, a machine gun place, the cellar, with the stove transplanted from the kitchen, a cooking, eating, and sleeping room. All the roofs had been shelled out of existence. All the walls were notched by shells and peppered thick with bullet marks. A support trench, about shoulder deep with a low parapet along its front, was so damaged by shell fire that the men, for the most part, had to move along it bent almost double to keep out of sight and bullet reach. Every here and there where a shell had lobbed firmly in, there was a huge crater, its sides sealing up the trench with a mass of tumbled earth over which the men scrambled crouching. Behind the trench a stretch of open field was pitted and pockmarked with shell holes of all sizes, from the shallow scoop a yard across to the yawning crater, big and deep enough to bury the whole field gun that had made the smaller hole. The field looked exactly like those pictures one sees in the magazines of a lunar landscape or the extinct volcanoes of the moon. 
The line of men turned in at last into a long, deep-cut communication trench leading out into a village. The air in the trench was heavy and close and stagnant, and the men toiled wearily up it, sweating and breathing hard. At a branching fork one path was labelled with a neatly printed board, to battalion headquarters and the mole heap, and the other path to the duck pond. This last the name of a trench being a reminder of the winter and the wet. The officer leading the party turned into the trench for the mole heap, walked up it, and emerged into the sunlight of the grass-grown village street, skirted a house, crossed the street by a trench, and passed through a hole chipped out of the brick wall into a house, the men tramping at his heels. The whole village was seamed with a maze of trenches, but these were only for use when the shelling had been particularly heavy. At other times, people moved about the place by paths sufficiently well protected by houses and walls against the rifle bullets that had practically never ceased to smack into the village for many months past. These paths wandered behind buildings, across gardens, into and out of houses, either by doors or by holes in the wall, over or round piles of rubble or tumbled brickwork, burrowed at times below ground level on patches exposed to fire, ran frequently through a dozen cottages on end, passage having been effected simply by hacking holes through the connecting brick walls in one place dived underground down some short stairs and took its way through several cellars by the same simple method of walking through the walls from one cellar to another. The houses were littered with empty and rusty tins, torn and dirty clothing, ash-choked stoves, trampled straw, and broken furniture. The backyards and gardens were piled with heaps of bricks and tiles, biscuit and jam tins. Broken fences and rotted rags were overrun with a rank growth of grass and weeds and flowers, pitted with shell holes and strewn with graves. The whole village was wrecked from end to end. It was no more than a charnel house, a smashed and battered sepulchre. There was not one building that was whole, not one roof that had more than a few tiles clinging to shattered rafters, hardly a wall that was not cracked and bulged and broken. In the houses they passed through, the men could still find sufficient traces of the former occupants to indicate their class and station. One might have been a laborer's cottage, with a rough deal table, a red rusted stove fireplace, an oleograph in flaming crude colors of the virgin and child hanging on the plaster wall, the fragments of a rough cradle overturned in a corner, a few coarse china crocks and ornaments and figures chipped and broken and scattered about the mantel and the bare board floor. Another house had plainly been a home of some refinement. The rooms were large, with lofty ceilings. There were carpets on the floors. Although so covered with dirt and dried mud and the dust of fallen plaster that they were hardly discernible as carpets. In one room a large polished table had a broken leg replaced by an upended barrel. One big armchair had its springs and padding showing through the burst of upholstering. Another was minus all its legs, and had the back wrenched off and laid flat with the seat on the floor, evidently to make a bed. There were several good engravings hanging askew on the walls or lying about the floor, all soiled with rain and cut and torn by their splintered glass. The large open grate fireplace had an artistically carved overmantel, sadly chipped and smoke-blackened, a tiled hearth in fragments, the wallpaper in a tasteful design of dark green and gold was blotched and discolored, and hung in peeling strips and gigantic dog's ears. From the poles and rings over the windows, the tattered fragments of a lace curtain dangled. There was plenty of evidence that the room had been occupied by others since its lawful tenants had fled. It was strewn with broken or cast-off military equipments, worn-out boots, frayed and mud-caked putties, a burst haversack and pack valise, a hold water bottle, broken webbing straps and belts, a bayonet with a snapped blade, a torn grey shirt, and a goatskin coat. The windows had the shutters closed, and were sandbagged up three parts their height. 
the need for this being evident from the clean round bullet holes in the shutters above the sandbags, and the ragged tears and holes in the upper part of the opposite wall. In an upper corner a gaping shell hole had linen tablecloths five or six fold thick hung over to screen the light from showing through at night. In a corner lay a heap of mouldy straw and a bed mattress. The table and fireplace were littered with dirty pots and dishes, the floor with empty jam and biscuit tins, opened and unopened bully beef tins, more being full than empty because the British soldier must be very near starving point before he is driven to eat bully. Over everything lay like a white winding sheet, the cover of thick plaster dust shaken down from the ceiling by the hammer blows of the shells. The room door opened into a passage. At its end, a wide staircase uh, curved up into empty space, the top banisters standing out against the open blue sky. The whole upper story had been blown off by shell fire and lay in the garden behind the house, a jumble of brickwork, window frames, tiles, beams, beds and bedroom furniture, linen and clothes. These houses were inexpressibly sad and forlorn-looking with all their privacy and inner homeliness naked and exposed to the passer-by and the staring sunlight. Some were no more than heaps of brick and stone and mortar, but these gave not nearly such a sense of desolation and desertion as those less damaged, as one, for instance, with its front blown completely out, so that one could look into all its rooms, upper and lower, and the stairs between, exactly as one looks into those dolls' houses where the front is hinged to swing open. The village had been on the edge of the fighting zone for months, had been casually shelled every day in normal times, bombarded furiously during every attack or counter-attack. The church, with its spire or tower, had probably been suspected as an artillery observing station by the Germans, and so had drawn a full share of the fire. All that was left of the church itself was one corner of shell hole walls, and a few roof beams torn and splintered and stripped of cover. The tower was a broken, jagged stump, an empty shell, with one side blown almost completely out, the others, or what remained of them, cracked and tottering. The churchyard was a wild chaos of tumbled masonry, broken slates, uprooted and overturned tombstones, jumbled wooden crosses, crucifixes, black wooden cases with fronts of splintered glass, torn wreaths, and crosses of imitation flowers. Amongst the graves yawned huge shell craters, tossed hither and thither amongst the graves and broken monuments and bricks and rubbish were bones and fragments of coffins. But all the graves were not in the churchyard. The whole village was dotted from end to end with them, some alone in secluded corners, others in rows in the backyards and vegetable gardens. Most of them were marked with crosses, each made of two pieces of packing case or biscuit box, with a number, rank, name, and regiment printed in indelible pencil. On some of the graves were beadwork flowers, on others a jam pot or crock holding a handful of withered sun-dried flower stalks. Nearly all were huddled in close to house or garden walls, one even in the narrow passage between two houses. There were, in many cases, other and less ugly open spaces and gardens, offering a score of paces from these forlorn last resting places, apparently so oddly selected and sadly misplaced. But a second look showed that in each case the grave was dug where some wall or house afforded cover to the burying party from bullets. In the bright sunlight, half hidden under or behind heaps of debris, with crosses leaning drunkenly aslant, these graves looked woefully dreary and depressing. But the files of men moving around and between them, or stepping carefully over them, hardly gave them a glance, except where one in passing caught at a leaning cross and thrust it deeper and straighter into the earth. But the men's indifference meant no lack of feeling or respect for the dead. The respect was there, subtle but unmistakable, instanced slightly by the care every man took not to set foot on a grave, by the straightening of that cross, by those withered flowers and dirty wreaths, 
even as it has been shown scores of times by the men who crawl at risk of their lives into the open between the forward trenches at night to bring in their dead for decent burial. Outside the shattered village stood the remains of a large factory, and on this the outcoming files of the regiment converged, and the first arrivals halted to await the rest. What industry the factory had been connected with it was impossible to tell. It was full of machinery, smashed, bent, twisted, and overturned, all red with rust, mixed up with and in parts covered by stone and brickwork, beams and iron girders, the whole sprinkled over with gleaming fragments of window glass. The outside walls were almost completely knocked flat, tossed helter-skelter outwards or on top of the machinery. The tall chimney, another suspected observing post, probably, lay in a heap of broken brickwork with the last yard or two of the base standing up out of the heap, and even in its remaining stump were often ragged shell holes. A couple of huge boilers had been torn off their brick furnaces by the force of some monster shell and tossed clear yards away. One was poised across the broken outer wall with one end in the road. The thick rounded plates were bent and dented in like a kicked biscuit tin, were riddled and pierced through and through as if they had been paper. The whole factory and its machinery must once have represented a value of many thousands of francs. Now it was worth just the value of its site, lest the cost of clearing it of debris, and the price of some tons of old iron. Some of the men wandered about amongst the ruins, examining them curiously, tracing the work of individual shells, speculating on the number of hands the place had once employed, and where those hands were now. My mum said a Scottish private. Sir, an awful waste. Think of the cellar it must have cost. How would you like to be a shareholder in the company, Jock? said his companion. Ain't many divvy ends due to him this Christmas. The Scot shook his head sadly. This place and the whole town laid waste, he said. That's awful to think of it. And this is one blooming pebble in the whole blooming beach, said the other. Do you remember wipers and all them other towns? And that old chap we saw sitting on the roadside weeping his eyes out cause the farm and the fruit trees he'd spent his life fixing up was blowed to glory by Jack Johnson's? <laughs> we have seen some rummy shows here, haven't we? <laughs> Not but what this ain't a pretty fair sample of wreck, he continued critically. There's plenty of think they got their two pennyworth to see this on the screen of a picture show at home, Jock. <laughs> Pictures, sniffed Jock. Pictures and theatres and racing and fit bar. I want our folks out in better use for their time and money. And it's a time as this. Ah, said the other. But you forget, Jock, out here they have their houses blown up and their businesses blown in. A thousand a day of the lot of you and me may be getting killed off for six months on end. But at home, Jock, ah. He stooped and picked up a lump of white chalky earth from the roadside, scrawled with it on the huge boiler end that rested on the broken wall, and left the written words to finish the spoken sentence. Jock read, and later the remains of the regiment read as they moved off past the aching desolation of the silent factory, down the shell-torn road, across the war-swept ruins of a whole countryside. A few scowled at the thoughts the words raised. The most grinned and passed rough jests. But to all those men in the thinned ranks, their dead behind them, the scenes of ruin before them, the words bit and bit deep. They ran, but it's business as usual at home. End of section 9《Section 10. A Hymn of Hate of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The troops continue in excellent spirits. Extract from Official Dispatch. 
To appreciate properly, from the army's point of view, the humour of this story, it must always be remembered that the regiment concerned is an English one, entirely and emphatically English, and indeed almost entirely East End Cockney. It is true that the British Army on active service has a sense of humour peculiarly its own, and respectable citizens have been known, when jests were retailed with the greatest gusto by soldier raconteurs, to shudder and fail utterly to understand that there could be any humour in a tale so mixed up with the grim and ghastly business of killing and being killed. A biggish battle had died out about a week before in the series of spasmodic struggles of diminishing fury that have characterized most of the battles on the Western Front, when the Tower Bridge Foot found themselves in occupation of a portion of the forward line, which was only separated from the German trench by a distance varying from forty to one hundred yards. Such close proximity usually results in an interchange of compliments between the two sides, either by speech or by medium of a board with messages written on it, the board being reserved usually for the strokes of wit most likely to sting, and therefore best worth conveying to the greatest possible number of the enemy. The towers were hardly installed in their new position when a voice came from the German parapet. Hello! Tower Bridge Foot, pleased to meet you again. The Englishmen were too accustomed to it to be surprised by this uncannily prompt recognition by the enemy of a newly relieving regiment of which they had not seen so much as a cap top. Hello, Boshy, retorted one of the towers. You're making a mistake this time. We ain't the Tower Bridges. We're the Kamchatka Islanders. Uh, you're a liar if you says you're pleased to meet us again, put in another. If you've met us afore, I uh, lay you was too dash sorry for it to want to meet us again. Oh, we know who you are, all right, replied the voice. And we know you've just relieved the fifth Blankshires. And what's more, we know who's going to relieve you, and when. He knows a blooming heap, said a Tower Bridge private disgustedly. And what's worse, I believe he does know it. Then, raising his voice, he asked, Do you know when we're coming to take some more of them trenches of yours? Oh, this was felt by the listening towers to be a master stroke, remembering that the British had taken and held several trenches a week before. But the reply rather took the wind out of their sails. You can't take any more, said the voice. You haven't shells enough for another attack. And uh, you had to stop the last one because your guns were running short. Anyhow, replied an English corporal who had been handing round half a dozen grenades, we ain't any way short of bombs. Have a few to be going on with. And he and his party let fly. They listened with satisfaction to the bursts, and through their trench periscopes watched the smoke and dust clouds billowing from the trench opposite. On this remarked a tower private, is about our cue to exit, the stage being required for a scene shift by some Bosch bombs. And he disappeared, crawling into a dugout. During the next ten minutes, a couple of dozen bombs came over and burst in and about the British trench, and scored three casualties slightly wounded. Hi there! Where's that so old barber's assistant that thinks he can talk English? demanded the tower's spokesman cheerfully. That annoyed the English-speaking German, as, of course, incidentally, it was meant to do. I'm here, Private Petticoat Lane, retorted the voice, and if I couldn't speak better English than you, I'd be shaming Soho. <laughs> You're doing that anyway, you blooming renegade dog-stealer, called back the private. Why don't you pay your landlady in London for the lodgings you owed when you run away? Schweinhund! said the voice angrily, and a bullet slapped into the parapet in front of the taunting private. Corporal, said that artist in invective softly, if you'll go down the trench a bit or up top of that old barn behind, I'll get this blooming Soho waiter mad enough to keep on shooting at me, and you'll perhaps get a chance to snipe him. 
The corporal sought an officer's permission and later a precarious perch on the broken roof of the barn, while Private Robinson extended himself in the manufacture of annoying remarks. That last one was a fair draw, Smithy, he exuded to a fellow private. I'll bet he shot the moon, did a bolt for it when he mobilized. Like enough, agreed Smithy. Go on, old man, give him some more jaw. I suppose you left without paying your washing bill either, didn't you, sauerkraut? demanded Private Robinson. There was no reply from the opposition. I expect uh, you left a lot of little unpaid bills, didn't you? If you was able to find anyone to give you a tick. I'll pay them, then we take London, said the voice. <laughs> that don't give your poor old landlady much hope, said Robinson. Take London. <laughs> Blimey, you are more like to take root in them retrenches of yours unless we comes over again and chases you out. Again there was no reply. Private Robinson shook his head. He's as hard to draw as the pie that's owed to me, he said. You have a go, Smithy. Smithy, a believer in the retort direct and no trafficker in the finer shades of sarcasm, cleared his throat and lifted up his voice. Yeah. Why don't you speak when you spoke to your lop-eared log of beer barrel, you? Take your face out of that horse flesh cat's meat sausage and speak up, you baby butcher and hen roost robber. Now that ain't no good, Smithy, Private Robinson pointed out. You see, calling him hard names only makes him think he's got you angry like that he's drawed you. Another voice called something in German. Just tell them other monkeys to stop their chatter, so oh, he called out, and get back in their cage. If they want to talk to gentlemen, they must talk English. They like your damned impertinence, said the voice scornfully. We'll make you learn German, though, when we've taken England. Oh, it's England you're taking now, said Private Robinson. But all you'll have a take of England will be the same as you took before. A tuppenny tip if you serves the soup up nice, and a penny tip if you gives an Englishman a proper clean shave. The rifle opposite banged again, and the bullet slapped into the top of the parapet. <laughs> that drawed him again, chuckled Private Robinson. But I wonder why the corporal didn't get a whack at him. He pulled away a small sandbag that blocked a loophole, and holding his rifle by the butt at arm length, poked the muzzle out slowly. A moment later, two reports rang out, one in front and one behind. I got him, said the corporal three minutes later. One blunt was looking with a periscope, and I saw a little cap and one eye come over the parapet. By the way, his hands jerked up and his head jerked back when I fired. I fancy he's copped it right enough. Private Robinson got to work with a piece of chalk on a board and hoisted over the parapet a notice. R.I.P. One bush, late lamented Soho Garçon. Pity I don't know the German for the light lamented, but they've always plenty that knows English enough to understand, he commented. He spent the next ten minutes ragging the Germans, directing his most brilliant efforts of sarcasm against made-in-Germany English speakers generally, and Soho waiters in particular, and he took the fact there was no reply from the voice as highly satisfactory evidence that it had been the Soho waiter who had copped it. Exit the waiter, curtain and soft music, remarked a private known as Henry Irving throughout the battalion, and whistled a stave of We shall meet, but we shall miss him. Come on, Henry, give us his dying speech, someone urged, and Henry proceeded to recite an impromptu dying speech of the Dush Hound Stealer, as he called it, in the most approved fashion of the East End drama, with all the accompaniment of rolling eyes, breast clutchings, and gasping pauses. Now then, where's the orchestra? he demanded when the applause had subsided, and the orchestra, one mouth organ strong, promptly struck up a lilting music hall ditty. From that he slid into My Little Grey Home with a very liberal measure of time to the long-drawn notes especially. The song was caught up and ran down the trench in full chorus. 
When it finished, the orchestra was just on the point of starting another tune, when Ennery held up his hand. "'He goes on Sunday to the church and sits among the choir,' he quoted solemnly, and added, "'Voices heard off.' Two or three men were singing in the German trench, and as they sang, the rest joined in, and Deutschland über alles rolled forth in full strength and harmony. Bravo, and not our part, neither, said Private Robinson approvingly, though I don't know what it's all about. Now suppose we give them another. They did, and the Germans responded with the watch on the Rhine. This time Private Robinson and the rest of the towers recognized the song, and capped it in great glee with winding up the watch on the Rhine, a parody which does not go out of its way to spare German feelings. "'And how do you like that, old sausage scoffers?' demanded Private Robinson loudly. "'You wait,' bellowed a guttural voice. Uh, "'Us wind you up, quick!' <laughs> "'Wind up, squeak and squeakin', retorted Private Robinson. The German reply was drowned in a burst of new song, which ran like wildfire the length of the German trench. A note of fierce passion rang in the voices, and the towers sat listening in silence. "'I know what it is,' said one. "'But it sounds like they were saying something nasty, and meaning it all.' But one word, shouted fiercely and lustily, caught Private Robinson's ear. "Ark," he said in eager anticipation. I do believe it's sh 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 there. Triumphantly, as again the word rang out, the one word at the end of the verse, England. Hitch, hitch, hitch the hymn of eight. The word flew down the British trench. It's the hymn. They're singing the hymn of eight. And every man sat drinking the air in eagerly. Now, this was luck, pure gorgeous luck. Hadn't the towers, like many another regiment, heard about the famous hymn of hate and read it in the papers? and had it declaimed with a fine frenzy for Private Henry Irving. Hadn't they, like plenty other regiments, longed to hear the tune, but longed in vain, never having found one who knew it? And here it was being sung to them in full chorus by the Germans themselves. Oh, this was luck! The mouth organist was sitting with his mouth open and his head turned to listen, as if afraid to miss a single note. Have you caught it, Snapper? whispered Private Robinson anxiously at the end. Will you be able to remember it? Snapper, with his eyes fixed on vacancy, began to play the air over softly, when from further down the trench came a murmur of applause that rose to a storm of hand-clappings and shouts of bravo and encore, core, core. The mouth organist played on unheedingly, and Private Robinson sat following him with attentive ear. "'I'm not uh, sure of that bit just there,' said the player, and tried it over with slight variations. "'Perhaps I'll remember it better after a day or two. I'm up that with some tunes.' "'We might get him to sing it again,' said Robinson hopefully, as another loud cry of encore rang from the trench. "'Was you know what we have sing?' asked a German voice in tones of some wonderment. "'It's a great song, Dutchie,' replied Private Robinson. "'Fine song, good, bang. Sing it again to us.' Oh, "'You have not understand,' said the German angrily, and then suddenly from a little further along the German trench a clear tenor voice singing the hymn in English. The towers subsided into rapt silence, hugging themselves over the stupendous luck. When the singer came to the end of the verse, he paused an instant, and a roar lipped from the German trench, England. It died away, and the singer took up the solo. Quicker and quicker he sang, the song swirling upward in a rising note of passion. It checked and hung an instant on the last line, as a curling wave hangs poised. And even as the falling wave breaks thundering and rushing, so the song broke in a crash of sweeping sound along the line of the German trench with that one word, England. Before the last sound of it had passed, the singer had plunged into the next verse, his voice soaring and shaking with an intensity of feeling. The whole effect was inspiring, wonderful, dramatic. One felt that it was emblematic, the heart and soul 
of the German people poured out in music and words, and the scorn, the bitter anger, hatred, and malice that vibrated again in that chorus last word might well have brought fear and trembling to the heart of an enemy. But the enemy immediately concerned, to wit his majesty's regiment of Tower Bridge Foot, were most obviously not impressed with fear and trembling. Impressed, they certainly were. Their applause rose in a gale of clappings and cries and shouts. They were impressed, and Private Henry Irving, clapping his hands sore and stamping his feet in the trench bottom, voiced the impression exactly. It beats Saturday night in the gallery of the old Brit, he said enthusiastically. That bloke blimey, he ought to be doing the star part of Drury Lane and he wiped his hot hands on his trousers and fell again to beating them together, palms and fingers curved cunningly to obtain a maximum of noise from the effect. An officer passed hurriedly along the trench. If there's any firing, every man to fire over the parapet and only straight to his own front, he said, and almost at the moment there came a loud bang from out in front, followed quickly by bang, 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 in a running series of reports. The shouting had cut off instantly on the first bang. Some rifles squibbed off at intervals for a few seconds and increased suddenly to a sputtering roar. With the exception of one platoon near their center, the towers replied rapidly to the fire. The Maxims joined in, and a minute later, with a whoop and a crash, the shells from a British battery passed over the trench and burst along the line of the German parapet. After that, the fire died away gradually, and about ten minutes later... A figure scrambled hastily over the parapet and dropped into safety, his boots squirting water, his wet shirt-tails flapping about his bare, wet, and muddy legs. He was a bomb officer, who had taken advantage of the hymn of hate diversion to go crawling up a little ditch that crossed the neutral ground until he was near enough to fling into the German trench the bombs he carried. And, as he put it later in reporting to the O.C., give him something to hate about. And each evening after that, for as long as they were in the trenches, the men of the Tower Bridge Foot made a particular point of singing the Hymn of Hate, and the wild yell of England that came at the end of each verse might almost have pleased an enemy of England's instead of aggravating them intensely, as it invariably did the Germans opposite to the extent of many wasted rounds. It's been a great do, Schnapper said Private Henry Irving some days after, as the battalion tramped along the road towards reserve billets. And I haven't enjoyed myself so much for months. Didn't it, Rag'em, beautiful? And won't we fair stagger the house at the next sing-sing or the brigade? Snapper chuckled and breathed contentedly into his beloved mouth-organ, and first Henry and then the marching men took up the words. Eight of the art and eight of the hand, eight by water and eight by land. Who do we eight to beat the band? Uh, deficient memories, it will be noticed, uh, being compensated by effective inventions in odd lines. The answering roar of England startled almost to shagging point the horse of a brigadier trotting up to the trail of the column. What on earth are those fellows singing? He asked one of his officers while soothing his mount. I'm not sure, sir, said the officer, but I believe by the words of it, yes, it's the German's hymn of hate. A French staff officer riding with the brigadier stared in astonishment, first at the marching men and then at the brigadier, who was rocking with laughter in his saddle. <laughs> Where on earth did they get the tune? I've never heard it before, said the brigadier, and tried to hum it. The staff officer told him something of the tale as he had heard it, and the Frenchman's amazement and the brigadier's laughter grew as the tale was told. We have one foe and one alone. England! bellowed the towers, and out of the pause that came so effectively before the last word of the verse rose a triumphant squeal from the mouth organ, and the appealing voice of Private Henry Irving, Now then, put a bit of eight into it. But even that artist of the emotions had to admit his critical sense of the dramatic fully satisfied by the tone of vociferous wrath and hatred flung into the tower's answering roar of England! What an extraordinary people, 
said the French staff officer, eyeing the brigadier shaking with laughter on his prancing charger, and he could only heave his shoulders up in an ear-embracing shrug of mon comprehension when the laughing brigadier tried to explain to him, as I explained to you in the beginning. At the best bit of the whole joke is that this particular regiment is English to the backbone. End of section 10section 11 the cost of between the lines by boyd cable this librivox recording is in the public domain the cost in casualties could not be considered heavy in view of the success gained extract from official dispatch In the outside there were blazing sunshine and heat a haze of smoke and dust, a nostril-stinging reek of cordite and explosive, and a never-ceasing tumult of noises. Inside was gloom, but a closer, heavier heat, a drug-shop smell, and all the noises of outside little subdued and mingled with other lesser but closer sounds. Outside, a bitterly fought trench battle was raging. Here, inside, the wreckage of battle was being swiftly but skillfully sorted out, classified, bound up, and dispatched again into the outer world. For this was one of the field dressing stations, scattered behind the fringe of the fighting line, and through one or other of these were passing the casualties as quickly as they could be collected and brought back. The station had been a field laborer's cottage, and had been roughly adapted to its present use. The interior was in semi-darkness, because the windows were completely blocked up with sandbags. The door, which faced toward the enemy's lines, was also sandbagged up, and a new door had been made by knocking out an opening through the mud-brick wall. There were two rooms connected by a door, enlarged again by the tearing down of the lath and plaster partition. The only light in the inner room filtered through the broken and displaced tiles of the roof. On the floor, laid out in rows so close-packed that there was barely room for an orderly to move, were queer, shapeless bundles that at first glance could hardly be recognized as men. They lay huddled on blankets or on the bare floor in dim shadowy lines that were splashed along their length with irregularly placed gleaming white patches. They were puzzling, these patches, shining like snow left in the hollows of a mountain seen far off and in the dark. A closer look revealed them as the bandages of the first field dressing that every man carries stitched in his uniform, against the day he or the stretcher-bearers may rip open the packet to use it. A few of the men moved restlessly, but most lay very still. A few talked, and one or two even laughed and another moaned slowly and at even unbroken intervals. Two or three lighted cigarettes pinpricked the gloom in specks of orange light that rose and fell, glowing and sparkling and lighting a faint outline of nose and lip and cheeks, sinking again to dull red. A voice called feebly at first, and then as no one answered more strongly and insistently for water. When at last it was brought, every other man there demanded or pleaded for a drink. In the outer room, a clean-edged circle of light blazed in the center from an acetylene lamp, leaving the walls and corners in a shadow deep by contrast to blackness. Half the length of a rough deal table jutted out of the darkness into the circle of light, and beneath it its black shadow lay solid halfway across the light ring on the floor and into this light passed a constant procession of wounded, some halting for no more than the brief seconds necessary for a glance at the placing of a bandage and an injection of an anti-tetanus serum, some waiting for long pain-laden minutes while a bandage was stripped off, an examination made, in certain cases a rapid play made with cruel-looking scissors and knives. Sometimes a man would walk to the table, and stoop a bandaged head or thrust a bandaged hand or arm into the light. Or a stretcher would appear from the darkness and be laid under the light, while the doctor's hands busied themselves about the khaki form that lay there. Some of the wounds were slight, 
some were awful and unpleasant beyond telling the doctors worked in a high pressure of haste but the procession never halted for an instant one patient was hardly clear of the light circle before another appeared in it there were two doctors there one a young man with a lieutenant's stars on his sleeve the other apparently a man of about uh, thirty in bare arms with rolled up shirt sleeves his jacket hooked on the back of a broken chair bore the badges of a captain's rank the faces of both as they caught the light were pale and glistening with sweat the hands of both as they flitted and darted about bandages or torn flesh were swift moving but steady and unshaking as steel pieces of machinery words that passed between the two were brief to curtness technical to the last syllable about them the dust motes danced in the light the air hung heavy and stagnant smelling of chemicals the thick sickly scent of blood the sharper reek of sweat and everything about them the roof over their heads the walls around the table under their hands the floor beneath their feet shook and trembled and quivered without cessation and also without pause the uproar of battle bellowed and shrieked and pounded in their ears shells were streaming overhead the closer ones with a rush and a whoop the higher and heavier ones with long whistling sighs and screams shells exploding near them crashed thunderously and set the whole building rocking more violently than ever the rifle and machine-gun fire never ceased but rose and fell sinking at times to a rapid spluttering crackle rising again to a booming drum-like roll the banging reports of bombs and grenades punctuated sharply the running roar of gun and rifle fire through all the whirlwind of noise the doctors worked steadily unheeding the noise the dust the heat the trembling of the crazy building they worked from dawn to noon and from noon on again to dusk only pausing for a few minutes at midday to swallow beef tea and a biscuit and in the afternoon to drink tepid tea early in the afternoon a light shell struck a corner of the roof making a clean hole on entry and blowing out the other side in a clattering gust of flame and smoke broken tiles and splintering wood the room filled with choking smoke and dust and bitter blinding fumes and a shower of dirt and fragments rained down on the floor and table on the doctors and on the men lying round the walls at the first crash and clatter some of the wounded cried out sharply but one amongst them chided the others asking had they never heard a fizz-bang before and what would the doctor be thinking of them squealing there like a lot of schoolgirls at a mouse in the room but later in the day there was a worse outcry and a worse reason for it the second room was being emptied the wounded being carried out to the ambulances that awaited them close by outside there came suddenly out of the surrounding din of battle four quick ear-filling rushes of sound Shh! Sh shush ba -ba 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 bang the shells had passed over no more than clear of the cottage and burst in the air just beyond and for an instant the stretcher bearers halted hesitatingly and the wounded shrank on their stretchers but next instant the work was resumed and was in full swing when a minute later there came again the four wind rushes followed this time by four shattering crashes an appalling clatter of whirling tiles and brickwork the cottage disappeared in swirling clouds of smoke and brick dust and out of the turmoil came shrieks and cries and groans when the dust had cleared it showed one end of the cottage completely wrecked the roof gone the walls gaping in ragged rents the end wall collapsed in jumbled ruins inside the room was no more than a shambles there were twenty odd men in it when the shells struck seven were carried out alive and four of these died in the moving in the other room where the two doctors worked no damage was done beyond the breakdown of a portion of the partition wall and there was only one further casualty a man who was actually having a slight hand wound examined at the moment he was killed instantly by a shell fragment which whizzed through the doorway the two doctors 
after a first hasty examination of the new casualties, held a hurried consultation. The obvious thing to do was to move, but the question was, where to? One place after another was suggested, only for the suggestion to be dismissed for some good and adequate reason. In the middle of the discussion, a fresh torrent of casualties began to pour in. Some plainly required immediate attention, and the doctors fell to work again. By the time the rush was cleared, the question of changing position had been forgotten, or at any rate was dropped. The wounded continued to arrive, and the doctors continued to work. By now, late afternoon, the fortunes of the fight were plainly turning in favour of the British. It was extraordinary the difference it made in the whole atmosphere. To the doctors, the orderlies, the stretcher-bearers, and even, oh, rather most of all, to the wounded who were coming in. In the morning the British attack had been stubbornly withstood, and thousands of men had fallen in the first rushes to gain a footing in the trenches opposite. The wounded who were first brought in were the men who had fallen in these rushes, in the forward trench, in the communication trenches on their way up from the support trench, and from the shell-fire on the support trenches, because they themselves had made no advance or had seen no advance made, they believed the attack was a failure, that thousands of men had fallen and no ground had been gained. The stretcher-bearers who brought them in had a similar tale to tell, and everyone looked glum and pulled a long face. About noon, although the advance on that particular portion was still hung up, a report ran that success had been attained elsewhere along the line. In the early afternoon, the guns behind burst out in a fresh paroxysm of fury, and the shells poured streaming overhead and drenched the enemy trenches ahead with a new and greater deluge of fire. The rifle fire and the bursting reports of bombs swelled suddenly to the fullest note yet attained. All these things were hardly noted, or at most were heeded with a half-attention back in the dressing station, but it was not long before the fruits of the renewed activity began to filter and then to flood back to the doctor's hands. But now a new and more encouraging tale came with them. We were winning. We were advancing. We were into their trenches all along the line. The casualties bore their wounds to the station with absolute cheerfulness. This one had got it in the second line of trenches. This one had seen the attack launched on the third trench. Another had heard we had taken the third in our stride and were pushing on hard. The regiment had had a hammering, but they were going good. The battalion had lost the O.C. and a heap of officers, but they were in with a bayonet at last. So the story ran for two full hours. It was borne back by men with limbs and bodies hacked and broken and battered, but with lips smiling and babbling words of triumph. There were some who would never walk, would never stand upright again, who had nothing before them but the grim life of a helpless cripple. There were others who could hardly hope to see the morrow's sun rise, and others again, grey-faced with pain and with white-knuckled hands clenched to the stretcher edges but all slightly wounded or serious or dangerous seemed to have forgotten their own bitter lot, to have no thought but to bear back the good word that we're winning. Late in the afternoon the weary doctors sensed a slackening in the flowing tide of casualties. They were still coming in, being attended to and passed out in a steady stream, but somehow there seemed less rush, less urgency, less haste on the part of the bearers to be back for a fresh load. And, ominous sign, there were many more of the bearers themselves coming back as casualties. The reason for these things took little finding. The fighting line was now well advanced, and every yard of advance meant additional time and risk in the bearing back of the wounded. One of the regimental stretcher-bearers put the facts bluntly, and briefly to the doctors. The open ground in a communication trenches is fair I mean, with shells and bullets. We're just about losing two bearers for every one casualty we bring out. Now we're leaving them lie there snug as we can till dark. A chaplain came in and asked permission to stay there. One of my regiments has gone up, he said, and they'll bring the casualties in here. 
I won't get in your way. I may be able to help a little. Here is one of my men now. A stretcher was carried in and laid with its burden under the doctor's hands. The man was covered with wounds from head to foot. He lay still while the doctors cut the clothing off him and adjusted bandages, but just before they gave him morphia he spoke. Don't let me die, doctor, he said. For Christ's sake, don't let me die. Don't say I'm going to die. His eye met the chaplain's, and the grey head stooped near to the young one. I'm the only one left, Padre, he said. Me old mother. Don't let me die, Padre. You know how it is back home. Don't let me die, too. But the lad was past saving. He died there on the table, under their hands. God help his mother, said the chaplain softly. It was her the boy was thinking of, not himself. His father was killed yesterday. Old Jim Doherty, twenty-three years service. Batman to the O.C. Would come out again with young Jim and Walt. Been with the regiment all his life. And the regiment is taken him and his two boys, and left the mother to her old age without husband or chick or child. The two doctors were lighting cigarettes and inhaling the smoke deeply with the enjoyment that comes after hours without tobacco. Another man was born in. He was grimed with dust and dirt, smeared with blood. The sweats of agony beaded his forehead, but he grinned a twisted grin at the doctors and chaplain, and here we are again, as the song goes, he said as the stretcher was laid down. This makes the third time wounded in this war, twice home and out again. <laughs> but this is like to be the last trip, I'm thinking. What about it, sir? Will I be losing them both? And he looked down at his smashed legs. Ah, I thought so, he went on. I'm a market gardener, but I... Don't know how I'm going to market garden without legs. Four kids, too. The eldest six years and an ailing wife. But she'll have me. Oh, what's left of me. And that's more than uh, many will have. That'll be all right, lad, said the chaplain. You'll have a pension. The country will look after you. Ha, <laughs> ha, padre, I, I didn't see you, sir. The country? <laughs> Ask my brother Joe about the country. Wounded in South Africa, he was, and never done a day's work since. And the pension has been barely enough to starve on decently. It'll be the same again after all this is over, I don't doubt. Anyway, that's how we all feels about it. No, sir, I don't feel no great pain to speak of. Sort of numb-like below there, just. He went on talking quite rationally and composedly until he was taken away. After that there was another pause, and the ambulances, for the first time that day, were able to get the station cleared before a fresh lot came in. The dusk was closing in, but there was still no abatement of the sounds of battle. There must be crowds of men lying out in front there wanting attention said the captain, reaching for his coat and putting it on quietly. You might stay here, Dewar, and I'll have a look out and see if there's a chance of getting forward to give a hand. The other doctor offered to go if the other would wait, but his offer was quickly put aside. I'll be back in an hour or two, the captain said and went off. Dewar and the chaplain stood in the door and watched him go. A couple of heavy shells crashed down on the parapet of the communication trench he was moving toward, and for a minute his figure was hidden by the swirling black smoke and yellow dust. But they saw him a moment later, as he reached the trench, turned and waved a hand to them, and disappeared. "'His name's McGillivray,' said the doctor in answer to a question from the chaplain. "'One of the finest fellows I've ever met, and one of the cleverest surgeons in Great Britain.' He is recognized as one of the best already, and he's only beginning. Did you notice him at work? The most perfect hands, and an eye as quick and keen as an eagle's. He misses nothing, sees little things in a flash, where twenty men might pass them. He's a wonder. 
and MacGillivray was moving slowly along the communication trench that led to the forward fire trench. It was a dangerous passage because the enemy's guns had the position and range exactly and were keeping a constant fire on the trench, knowing the probability of the supports using it. In fact, the supports moving up had actually abandoned the use of the approach trenches and were hurrying across the open for the most part. MacGillivray, reluctant at first to abandon the cover of the trench, was driven at last to doing so by a fact forced upon him at every step that the place was a regular shell trap. Sections of it were blown to shapeless ruins. Pits and mounds of earth and the deep shell craters gaped in it and to either side for all its length. Even where the high explosive shells had not fallen, the shrapnel had swept, and the clouds of flies that swarmed at every step told of the blood-soaked ground, even where the torn fragments of limbs and bodies had not been left, as they were in many places. So MacGillivray left the trench and scurried across the open with bullets hissing and buzzing about his ears and shells roaring overhead. He reached the forward fire trench at last and halted there to recover his breath. The battered trench was filled with the men who had been moved up in support, and there were many wounded amongst them. He busied himself for half an hour amongst them, and then prepared to move on across the open to what had been the enemy's front-line trench. It was dusk now, and shadowy figures could be seen coming back toward the British lines. At one point a dip in the ground in an old ditch gave some cover from the flying bullets. Toward this point along, which had been the face and was now the back of the enemy front trench, and then in along the line of the hollow, a constant procession of wounded moved slowly. It was easy to distinguish them, and even to pick out in most cases where they were wounded, because in the dusk the bandages of the first field dressing showed up startlingly white and clear on the shadowy forms against the shadowy background. Some with the white patches on heads, arms, hands, and upper bodies, were walking. Others, with the white on feet and legs, limped and hobbled painfully, leaning on the parapet or using their rifles crutch-wise. And others lay on the stretchers that moved with desperate slowness toward safety. The line appeared unending. The dim figures could be seen trickling along the parapets as far as the eye could distinguish them. The white dots of the bandage were visibly moving as far along the parapet as the sight could reach. MacGillivray moved out from the broken trench and hurried across the open. There were not more than fifty yards to cross, but in that narrow space the bodies lay huddled singly and heaped in little clumps. They reminded one exactly of the loafers who sprawl asleep and sunning themselves in the park on a Sunday afternoon. Only the dead lay in that narrow strip. The living had been moved, or had moved themselves long since. MacGillivray pushed on into the trench, along it to a communication trench, and up and down one alley after another, until he reached the most advanced trench where the British held. Here a pandemonium of fighting was still in progress, but to this MacGillivray, after the first couple of minutes, paid no heed. A private, with a bullet through his throat, staggered back from his loophole and collapsed in the doctor's arms, and after that MacGillivray had his hands too full with casualties to concern himself with the fighting. Several dugouts had been filled with wounded, and the doctor crawled about amongst these and along the trench, applying dressings and bandages as fast as he could work, seeing the men placed on stretchers or sent back as quickly as possible toward the rear. He stayed there until a message reached him by one of the stretcher-bearers who had been back to the dressing station that he was badly needed there and that Mr. Dewar hoped he would get back soon to help them. Certainly the dressing station was having a busy time. The darkness had made it possible to get back hundreds of casualties from places whence they dare not be moved by day. They were pouring into the station through the doctor's hands. Three of them were hard at work there by this time, and out again to the ambulances as rapidly as they could be handled. Despite the open, shell-wrecked end and the broken roof, the cottage was stiflingly close and sultry. The heavy scent of blood hung sickeningly in the stagnant air, and the whole place swarmed with pestering flies. There was no time to do much for the patients. All had been more or less efficiently bandaged by the regimental stretcher-bearers who picked them up. 
The doctors did little more than examine the bandagings, loosening these and tightening those, making injections to ward off tetanus, performing an operation or an amputation now and again in urgent cases, sorting out occasionally a hopeless casualty where a wound was plainly mortal, and setting him aside to leave room in the ambulances for those the hospitals below might yet save. One of these mortal cases was a young lieutenant. He knew himself that there was little or no hope for him, but he smoked a cigarette and spoke with composure, or simulated composure, to the doctor and the chaplain. "'Hello, Padre,' he said. "'Looks like a washout for me this time. You'll have to break it to the pater, you know. I'm afraid he'll take it in rather hard, too. Rough luck, isn't it, Doc? But then—' His face twitched with pain, and he covered the break in his voice by blowing a long cloud of smoke. After all, it's all in the game, you know. All in the game, the chaplain said when he had gone. A cruel game, gallantly played out. And he's the fourth son to go in this war, and the last male of his line except his father, the old earl. A family that has made its mark on a good few history pages. And this is the end of it. You think it's quite hopeless for him, doctor? The doctor looked up in surprise from the fresh, slightly wounded case he was overhauling. Hopeless? Why, it's not even... Oh, oh, him. Y yes, I'm afraid so. I, I wish McGillivray would come back, he went on irritably. He's worth the three of us here put together. When we have to fiddle and probe and peer, he would just look. He'd just half shut those hawk eyes of his and look, and he'd know exactly what to do and what not to do. Though that'll do, Sergeant, take him off. Where's that bottle of mine? What's this? Hand? Bandage not hurting you? All right. Uh, pass him over there for the anti-tetanus. Now then. A burly private, with the flesh of his thigh showing clear white where the grimy khaki had been cut clear and hung flapping, limped in and pushed forward a neatly bandaged limb for inspection. I thought they did that up in the trenches, he remarked. Said to tell you he did it. And he was all right, and I only needed the anti-tempus and a ticket for Rome. Oh, that's McGillivray, I'll bet, said young Dewar. Where was this? Uh, fourth, the German trench, sir, the man said cheerfully. You know, we got four, four trenches took. We're winning this time, all right. Fairly got I'm going, I believe. It'll be glorious victory in the headlines tomorrow. Things like this, you know, must be, quoted the chaplain softly as another badly wounded man was brought in. I wonder what the victory is costing us. Never mind. It's uh, cost another side more, sir, said the casualty grimly, and then shut lips and teeth tight on the agony that followed. I wish McGillivray would come, said Duar, when that was finished. He could have done it so much better. It's just the sort of case he's at his best on. And his best is something that medical journals write columns about. I wish he'd come. And then soon after he did come. Came on a stretcher with a bandage about his head and over his eyes. McGillivray, cried the young doctor, and stood a moment staring with his jaw dropped. Yes, said McGillivray with lips tight drawn. It's me. Uh, that's Dwar, isn't it? No need to undo the bandage, Dwar. It's my eyes. Both gone. A bullet through them both. And I'll never hold a scalpel again. <laughs> you can give me some morphia, Dwar, and send me on to the ambulance out of the way. I'm no good here now, nor anywhere else. Now, or ever. I won't die, I know. But... They gave him the morphia, and before he slid off into unconsciousness, he spoke a last word to the chaplain. You were right, Padre. You remember. It's the women pay the hardest. I'm thinking of my wife. The chaplain's thoughts went back to the wife and mother of the Doherty's, to the legless market gardener and his ailing wife, 
to the boy lieutenant who was the last of his line, and a score more he knew, and his eyes followed as the stretcher bore out the hope that had been a man who had done much to relieve pain, and might have done so much more. The voice of another new arriving casualty broke his thoughts. "'We're winning, doctor!' it was saying exultantly. "'All along the line we're winning this time. The jocks has got right away forward, and the grookies is in with their killing knives on our left, and the Irish is in front of all. Glory be! <laughs> Tis a big fight this time, and it's winning we are. May good arms go, and I know, but I'd rather be here with one arm than anywhere else with two. And what's an arm or a man more or less in the world? We're winning, I tell you. We're winning! End of section 11section twelve a smoker's companion of between the lines by boyd cable this librivox recording is in the public domain except for the address number one park lane marked with a muddy forefinger on the hanging waterproof sheet which served as a door there was nothing pretentious about the erection it could not be called a building which was for the time being the residence of three drivers of the royal field artillery but the shelter, ingeniously constructed of hop poles and straw thatch, was more or less rainproof and had the advantage of being so close to the horse lines that half a dozen strides brought the drivers alongside their long-nosed chums. It was early evening, but the horses having been watered and fed, the labours of their day were over, and the wheel and lead drivers were luxuriating in bootless feet while they entertained the gunner, who had called in from his own billet in the farm's barn. The gunner was holding forth on tobacco gifts. "'It's like this, see,' he said, "'and I knows it so, cause I read it myself in the paper. First you cuts a coupon out of the paper with your name and address on it.' "'But here, hold on,' put in the wheel-driver. "'How does my name get on it?' "'You write it there, fathead.' Did you think it growed there? You write your name, same as the paper tells, see, and you cuts out the coupon and send sixpence for one pack of the back it. Well, what sort of yarn you giving us now? said the wheel driver. I didn't send no sixpence or cut out a cow pan. I gets this back here for nothing. The quarter told me so. Course you gets it, said the gunner impatiently, but somebody must have paid the sixpence. Y you said I paid it, and I never did, retorted the wheel driver. He means, explained the lead driver, if you was sending a pack of baccy, you'd send sixpence. Where's the sense in that, said the wheel driver. Why should I send sixpence when I can get the baccy for nothing? I got this for nothing. It's not a issue, either. Eh, it's a gift. Quartermaster told me so. We know that said the gunner. But if you wanted to, you could send sixpence. Could not, said the wheel driver emphatically. I haven't seen a sixpence since we left home. They even pays us in blooming French banknotes. And how am I going to tell, after this war's over, whether me pays in credit or... Oh, shut it, interrupted the lead driver. Let's hear how this get things worked. Go on, chum. Oh, yeah, it's, it's this way, see. The gunner took up his tale anew. Suppose you wants to send a gift, or maybe he'll understand this way better. Suppose your best girl wants to send you a gift. I ain't got no best girl, objected the wheel driver. I'm a married man, and you know it, too. The gunner took a deep breath and looked hard at the objector. Well, he said, with studied calm. Well, uh, suppose your missus at home there wants to send you out some smokes. And suppose she does want to, said the wheel driver truculently. What's it got to do with you, anyway? With lips pursed tight and in stony silence, the gunner glared at him, and then, turning his shoulder, addressed himself deliberately to the lead driver. Suppose your missus, he began, but got no further. "'He ain't got no missus, leastways he ain't supposed to have,' the wheel-driver interjected triumphantly. 
That fact was well known to the gunner, but had been forgotten by him in the stress of the moment. He ignored the interruption and proceeded smoothly. "'Spose your missus, if you had one which you haven't, as I well knows, seeing me and you walked out two sisters at Woolwich up to the last night we was there.' The wheel-driver chuckled. "'Thought you was on guard the last night we was in Woolwich,' he said. "'Will you shut your head and speak when you're spoken to?' said the gunner angrily. "'Never mind him, chum. What, what's, what about this gift business?' "'Well,' said the gunner, picking his words carefully, "'if a man's wife or girl or sister or friend "'wants to send him some smokes, "'they cuts this coupon, same's I've said, "'and sends it up to the paper with sixpence "'and the regimental number and name of the man "'the gift's to go to, "'and the paper buys the back of getting it cheap "'because of buying tons and tons "'and sends a packet out with the chap's number and name and regiment wrote on it, and so he gets it, and that's all. The wheel-driver could contain himself no longer. And how do you reckon I got this packet, with no name or number on it, except a postcard where a name and address wrote on as I never heard before? Because some good-hearted bloke in Blighty that doesn't have no pal particular out here asked the paper to send his packet of backing to the O.C. to pass on to some poor hard up orphan Tommy that ain't got no backy nor no friends to send him like, and he issues it to you. It isn't an issue, persisted the wheel-driver. It's a gift. Quarter said so himself. Splashing and squelching footsteps were heard outside. The door curtain swung aside, and the center driver ducked in, took off a soaking cap, and jerked a glistening spray off into the darkness. "'Another fair sore of a night,' he remarked cheerfully, slipping out of his Macintosh and hanging the streaming garment in the door. "'Bust me if I know where all the rhyme comes from. Any luck?' asked the lead driver, leaning over to rearrange the strip of cloth, which, stuck in a jam tin of fat, provided what, uh, with some imagination, might be called a light. Five packets, twenty-five fags, said the center driver. There was two or three waiting to swap the backy in their packets for the fags and the other chaps, so I done pretty well to get five packets for mine. Twould have paid you better to have kept your backy and made fags out of it with cigarette papers, said the wheel driver. Maybe agreed the center driver. And perhaps you'll tell me, not being a masculine and cook conjurer myself, how am I to produce the fag papers? The gunner chuckled softly. Oh, <laughs> you should have done like old pint of bass did time we was on the eyne, he said. Bass is one of them fag fiends that can't live without his cigarette and wouldn't die happy if he wasn't smoking one. He breathes more smoke than he does air, and he ought to have a permanent chimney sweep detailed to clear the soot out of his lungs and breathing tubes. But if Pint of Bass does smoke more than is good for him or any other respectable factory chimney, I'll admit the smoke hasn't suited up his intellect none, and he can wriggle his way out of a hole where a double-jointed snake could stick. And during the retreat, when, as you know, cigarettes and the expeditionary force was scarcer and snowballs in hell, old Pint of Bass managed to carry on, and wasn't ever seen without his fag, except at meal times and sleep times, and they being so infrequent and skatey like uh, them days but hardly worth counting. It was like this, you see, that he managed it. You remember that when we mobilized some lost dogs home or uh, Society for Preventing Christian Knowledge or something, rushes up a issue of pocket testaments and dishes out one to everybody in the battery. Bound in a khaki cover they was, and coming in remarkable handy as a nice sentimental sort of keepsake. Most of them stayed behind with sweethearts and wives. Them as didn't must have gone into base kit, cause anyhow there wasn't any one to be raked out of the battery later on, except the one that Pont of Bass was carrying. Being pocket testaments, they was made of the thinnest kind of paper, and Bass told me the size worked out exactly right at two fags through the page. He started on the creation just about the time of Mons, 
and by the time we got back to the iron, he was near through Genesis. All the time we was working up through France again, Bass's smokes were working down through Exodus, and he began to worry about whether the Testament would carry him through the campaign. The other fellers that had their tongues hanging out for a fag used to go and borrow a leaf off a of Bass whenever they could raise a bit of backy. But at last, Bass shut down on those loans. Where's your own testament, he'd say. You was served out one, same as me, wasn't you? Or uh -uh, irreligious wasters. Get a Bible, give you, and can't take the trouble to carry it. You'd have sold them testaments at sixpence a sack in Woolwich if there'd been buyers at that price, which there weren't. And now here comes begging a page of mine. I ain't going to give you no more. Encouraging thriftlessness, as the adjutant would call it. And besides, how do I know how long this war's going to last or when I'll see a fag or a fag paper again? I'll be smoking Deuteronomy and Kings long before we're over the Rhine. And maybe, he says, turning over the pages with his thumb and tearing out the children of Israel, careful by the roots, maybe... I'll be reduced to smoking the inscription to our dear soldier friend on the fly-leaf before I get a chance to loot some backy shop in Berlin. No, he says, no. You're going to smoke a corner of the Pettit Journal. And good enough for you, unprovident sacrilegious blighters, you. Giving away your own good testaments. Young Soapy, of the center section, him that was struck off the strength at wipers later through stopping a coal box, tried to come the artful and add the front to alt the division padre one day and ask him if he'd any spares of pocket testaments in store, making out he'd lost his through lending it to his number one who had gone missing. Soapy made out he couldn't sleep in his bed at night which wasn't saying much, seeing we mostly slept in our seats or saddles them nights, uh, because he hadn't read a chapter of the Testament first. And the old sky pilot was a little bit surprised. He'd have been more surprised if he knew Soapy as well as I did. And he pleased, and most of all bowed down with grief, because he hadn't no Testament that was supernumerary to war establishment, and so couldn't issue one to Soapy. But two days later, he comes hunting for Soapy, as pleased as a dog with two tiles, and smiling as glad as if he just converted the Kaiser, and he lugs out a big Bible he'd bought in a village we'd just passed through, and writes Soapy's name on the fly leaf, and presents it to him, and tells him he'll come and have a chat any time he's near the battery. The Bible was none of your fiddling pocket things, but a good substantial one. We pictures of Moses in the bulrushes and Abraham sacrificing his son and such like. And the leaves was that thick that Soapy might as well have smoked brown paper or the Petit Journal. But that wasn't the worst of it. Soapy chucked it over the first edge soon as the Padre had gone. But next day the Padre rolls up and tells Soapy a sapper had picked it up and brought it to him him having signed his name and rank after presented by on the fly-leaf. And he warns Soapy to be more careful, and helps him stow it in his haversack, where it took up most of the room, and weighed a ton, and left Soapy to distribute his bully beef and biscuits and cheese and spare socks, and cetera, in all the pockets he had. And even then poor Soapy wasn't finished. For every time the Padre got a chance, he'd hop round and have a chat, as he called it, with Soapy. The chat being a cross-examination was in a court-martial on what chapter Soapy had been reading and full explanations of same. Soapy was drove and asked to read in a chapter so he could make out he savage something of it. The gunner tapped out his pipe on the heel of his boot and began to refill it. If you'll believe me, he said, that Padre got poor Soapy pinned down so he was reading near a chapter a day, which shows the horrible results that can come of a little bit of simple deception. And how is Pint of Basco and all with his testament? asked the lead driver. 
"'He don't need to smoke it now. "'We're in these fixed positions and getting liberal supplies "'from these people what sends up to the papers tobacco funds. "'But he's saving up the rest of it. "'Reckons that when we get the Germans on the run again, "'the moving will be at the trot, counter, and gallop, same's before, "'and the cigarette supplies won't be able to keep up the pace. "'And besides,' he says, he reckons it's only a fair thing to smoke a cigarette made with the last chapter down the high street of Berlin the day peace is declared. End of section 12section 13 The Job of the Amcal of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The wide door of the barn creaked open and emitted a swirl of sleety snow, a gust of bitter cold wind, and the bombardier. A little group of men round a guttering candle lamp looked up. "'Hello, Father Christmas,' said the centre driver. "'You're a bit late for your proper day, but we'll let you off if you fill our stockings up proper.' "'Wipe your feet careful on the mat,' said the lead driver, "'and put your umbrella in the old stand.' "'Here, yeah, don't go shaking that snow all over the straw,' said the wheel-driver indignantly. "'I'm going to sleep there presently, and the straw is damp enough as it is.' "'Glad you're so sure about sleeping there,' the bombardier said, divesting himself of his bandolier and struggling out of his snow-covered coat. "'By the look of things, it's quite on the cards you get turned out presently and have to take up some pills to the guns.' "'Pretty busy tonight, ain't they?' said the centre-driver. "'We heard em bumping away, good o "'You don't hear the alphabet back here,' said the bombardier. "'Wind's blowing most of the row away. "'They're going it hot and strong. "'Now where's my mess tin got to? "'Haven't had no tea yet, and it's near eight o'clock. "'I'm just about froze through, too.' "'Here you are,' said the centre driver, throwing a mess tin over. "'And the cook kept tea hot for you and the rest that was out. "'Pull that door shut behind you.' said the wheel-driver. His barn's cold as an ice-house already, and the roof leaks like a broke sieve. Billy, strew it ain't half a billy. The bombardier returned presently with a mess tin of raw, milkless and sugarless tea, and proceeded to make a meal off that, some stone-hard biscuits, and the scrapings of a pot of jam. What sort of trip did you have? asked the centre-driver. "'Anyways peaceful, or was you dodging the coal boxes this time?' "'Not a coal box or any other box,' said the bombardier, hammering a biscuit to fragments with a rifle butt. "'And I haven't had a shell drop near me for a week.' "'If we keep on like this,' said the centre-driver, "'we'll get fancy and we're back on Long Valley manoeuvres.' "'Who are you grousing about, anyway?' remarked the wheel-driver. This is a ammunition column, ain't it? Or do you suppose it's an amcal's business to go chasing after bombardments and shell fire? <laughs> if you ain't satisfied, you'd better try and get transferred to the trenches. Or if that's too peaceful for you, put in the lead driver, you might apply to be sent to England where the war's raging and the Zeppelins is killing women and window panes. Talking of transferring to the trenches, said the bombardier, putting down his empty mess tin and producing his pipe. Reminds me of a lieutenant we had join us a month or two back. There was a time you chaps was away attached to that other division, so you didn't know him. He'd been with a battery right through, but he got a leave, and when he come back from England he was sent to us. His batman told me he was a bit upset at first about being cut adrift from his pals in the battery, but he perked up and reckoned he was going to have things nice and cushy for a bit. And he as much as says so himself to me. The first time he was taking ammunition up and I was along with him. I'd been doing orderly at the battery and brought down the requisition for so many rounds. And it being the lieutenant's first turp up and not knowing the road, uh, he has me up in front with him to show the way. It was an unusual fine morning, I remember, having stopped raining for almost an hour. And just as we started something that might have been a sun tried to its hardest to shine. 
Soon as we was on the road, the lieutenant gives the word to march at ease and lights up a cigarette himself. Great morning, ain't it, Bombardier, he says. Not more than a foot or two of mud on the roads and the temperature almost above freezing point. <laughs> I'm just about beginning to like this job on the Amcal. Have you been with a battery out here? <laughs> I told him yes, and came to the column after being slightly wounded. Well, he says, you knows how much better off you are here. You don't have no standing to the gun half the night in the rain and live all the rest of the nights and all the days in a dirty, muddy, stuffy, funk hole. <laughs> That's the one thing I'm most glad of to be out of, he says, living under the ground like a rabbit in a burrow with every chance of having its head blowed off if he looks up over the edge. I've had enough of dugouts and observing from the trenches and coal box dodging to last me a bit, and it's a pleasant change to be riding a decent horse on a most indecent apology for a road and not a Jack Johnson in sight, even if they are in hearing. He made several more remarks like that during the morning, and of course I agreed with him. I mostly does agree with an officer and most especially a young un. If you don't, he always thinks he's right, and you're just that much big a fool not to know it. And the younger he is, the more right he is, and the bigger fool you or anyone else is. Well, the lieutenant's enthusiasm cools off a bit when it begins to rain again, like as if someone had turned on the tap of a waterfall. But he tried to cheer himself, remarking that most likely his battery was being flooded out of their dugouts but I could see he was beginning to doubt whether the Amcal's job was as cushy as he'd reckoned when the off-lead a number one wagon tries a cross-channel swim act in one of them four-foot deep ditches. The wagons had to pull aside to let some transport motor lorries pass, and one's off-lead that was a new horse just come to the column from Vice Remounts and had some objections to motor lorries hooting in his ear and scraping past an eighth of an inch from his nose, he a side slipped into the ditch. He stood there with the water up to his shoulder and the lead driver looking down on him and repeating rapid-fire prayers over him. I may say it took the best bit of half an hour to get that blighter onto the road again, and the lieutenant prancing around and saying things a parrot would blush to repeat. But he did more than say things, and I'm willing to admit it. He got down off his horse and did his best to coax the off-lead out with kind words and a riding cane. And when they missed fire and we got a drag rope around the silly brute, the lieutenant laid old and muddied himself up with the rest. We had to dig down the bank a bit at last and hook a team on the drag rope and we pulled that horse out of the mud like pulling a cork from a bottle. It was raining in tons all this time, and I fancy the lieutenant's opinion of the Amcal's job had rained back another pace or two, especially as he'd slipped and come down a full length in the mud when hauling on the drag rope, and had also slid one leg in the ditch well over the boot top in reaching out for a good swipe with the cane. We plods off again at last, and presently we begins to get abreast of some position where one of our big siege guns was belting away. A bit further on, the road took a turn and the siege gun shells were roaring along over our heads like an express train going through a tunnel, and the lieutenant kept cocking a worried eye round every time she banged, and presently he says sharp-like to the drivers to walk out their teams and get clear of the line of fire. If a German battery starts trying to out that fella, he says to me, we just about stand a healthy chance a meeting an odd shell or two that's trying for the range. We had to pass through a bit of a town called uh, Palu, and uh, just before we comes to it, we met some teams from one of the columns, other sections, coming back. Their officer was in front as we passed. He called to the lieutenant that Palu had been shelled that morning, and the headquarters staff near blotted out. Oh, I could just see the lieutenant chewing this over as we went on, and presently he asked me if it's any ways a frequent thing for us to come under fire taking ammunition up. I told him about a few of the times I'd seen it happen myself, and uh, uh, also about how we had the airmen 
and the German guns making a dead set at the column during the retreat, and shelling us out of one place after the other. Before I finished it, we hears the whoop of a big shell and a crash in the town, and the drivers begin to look round at each other. Bang, bang, another couple of shells drops in poor old Palu, and the drivers begins to look at the lieutenant and uh, to finger their reins. He kept on, of course, and I follows him, and the teams follow us. I see there's a church tower in the town, Bombardier, he says. Does our road run near it? I told him we had to go through the square where the church stood. Then we come pretty near walking through the bull's eye of their target, he says. For I'll bet they're reckoning on an observation post being in the tower, and they're trying to out it. We got into Palu, and it was like going through it at midnight, only with daylight instead of lamplight. There wasn't an inhabitant to be seen, except one man peeping up from a cellar grating, and, and one woman running after a toddling kid that had strayed out. She was shrieking quick-fire French at it, and when she grabbed it up and started back, the kid opened his lungs and near yelled the roof off. A woman ran into a house, and the door slammed and shut off the shrieking, like lifting the needle off a gramophone disc. And it left the mine street most awful empty, and still, with the jingle of the team's harness and clatter of the wagon wheels, the only sounds. Another few shells came in, and one hit a house down the street in front of us. We saw the slates and the chimney pots fair jump in the air, and uh, the old house sort of collapsed in a heap in a billowing cloud of white smoke and dust. There were some of our troops hooking a few wounded civilians out as we passed, and the road was cluttered up with bricks and half a door and broken bits of chairs and tables and crockery. Fair blew the inside out of the house, that shell did. When we come clear of the town, there was a long stretch of clear road to cover, and we was plodding down this when we hears the hum of an airyplane. The lieutenant squints up and it's a torb, he says. Begging your pardon, sir, I told him, but it's a German. No mistaking them bird-shaped wings and tail. He's a German, sure enough. That's why I just said Bombardier, he says, which it wasn't, but I knew it was no use saying so. The aeroplane swoops round and comes flying straight at us and passed about our heads and circles round to have a good look at us. A lieutenant was fair riled. Dash his impudence, he says. If he'd only come a bit lower, we might fetch him a smack. And he tells the gunners to get their rifles out. But the German knew too much to come close down, though he flew right over us once or twice. Why in thunder don't some of our guns have a wail at him, the lieutenant says, angry-like. Or our airmen get up and shoot some holes in him. He'll be dropping a clothes basket full of bombs on my wagons presently, like as not. And I can't even loose off a rifle at the bounder. Good Lord, that ever I should live to walk along a road like a time sheep and let a mouldy German chuck parcels of bombs at me without me being able to do more and shake my fist at him. And he swore most vicious. The airyplane flew off at last, but even then the lieutenant wasn't satisfied. He'll be back home to report this ammunition column on this particular spot on the road, he says if he's not taking off the glad tidings on a wireless to his batteries now. And presently, I suppose, they'll start starring this road with high explosive shell. Did ever you know a wagon full to the brim with light eyed being hit by a high explosive bombardier or air out would affect the column's health? I knew of a German column that one of our airyplanes dropped a bomb on at the end, sir, I says. I passed the place on the road myself soon after. And what happened, he asks. And I told him, it seemed the bomb exploded the wagon it hit, and the wagons exploded each other. That ammunition column, I says, went off like a packet of crackers, one wagon after the other. And when we came up, all that was left of that column was a reek of sulfur and a hole in the road. That's cheerful, says the lieutenant with us loaded down to the gunnel with lidite and the prospect of being a target for every German gun within range of this road. He fidgeted in his saddle a bit, and then, I suppose, he says, they'll calculate our pace and the distance we've moved since this airman saw us, and they'll shell the section of the road just ahead of us, 
now to glory i'd alt for a bit just to cheat em for they'll shoot by the map without seeing us but that requisition for lydite was uh, urgent wasn't it i told him it was so and the battery captain had told me to get it in quick to the column then we'll just have to push on and chance it says the lieutenant though i must own i do hate being made a helpless running deer target to every german gunner that likes to coconut shy at me like a packet of crackers good lord we plodded on the lieutenant spurring his horse on and reining him back and cocking his ear for the first shell bumping on the road <laughs> nothing happened for quite a bit after that and i was just about beginning to feel satisfied that the germ bird had run into a streak of air that our anti-aircraft guns kept strictly preserved and that they'd served a trespassers will be spiflicated notice on him and had punctured him in his wings but just as we rounded a curve and came into a long striped piece of the road i hears a high rising swoosh and before it finished and before the bang of the burst reached us spout goes a cloud of black smoke way far down the road this says the lieutenant is going to be highly interesting not to say exciting presently i figure that's either a four point two or a five point nine inch high explosive hun and there's another of the dose from the same bottle and about a hundred yards this way along the road i don't know how their high explosive will mix with ours but if they get one direct hit on a wagon we'll know all about it pretty quick a brock's crystal palace fireworks show won't be in it with the ensuing performance and that remark of yours bombardier about a packet of crackers recurs to my mind with most disquieting persistency and still they come as the poet remarks they was coming too and no fatal error no worry about em but a most alarming regularity i was all pitching plumb on that road and each one about fifty to a hundred yards nearer our procession and us walking straight into the shower too the swoosh bang of each one kept getting louder and louder and not a single one was missing the road i tell you i could feel the flesh creeping on my bones and a feeling in the pit of my stomach like i'd swallowed a tuppenny ice cream whole there was no way of dodging remember we'd a ditch lippin full of water along both sides of the road and we knew without looking though the lieutenant did have one squint that they was the usual brand of ditch hereabouts anything down to six foot deep and sides cut down as straight as a cellar wall it was no use trotting cause we might just be hurrying up to be in time to arrive on the right spot to meet one and it was no use halting for exactly the same reason the lieutenant reins back beside the leading team and believe me there wasn't one pair of eyes in all that outfit that wasn't glued on him or a pair of ears that wasn't waiting anxious for some order to come and i'm including my own eyes and ears in the catalogue there was nothing to be done and nothing to be said and we all knew it but at the same time we was ready to jump to any order the lieutenant passed out the shells was dropping at about ten to fifteen seconds interval and we could see it was going to be a matter of blind luck whether one pitched short or over or fair on top of us they were closer spice too as they come nearer and i reckon there wasn't more than fifty or sixty yards between the last two or three bursts and we were still walking on every man with his reins short and feeling his horse's mouth and his knees gripping the saddle hard bang one hits the road about one fifty to two hundred yards short and we heard chips of it whizzing on past us the lieutenant looks round well i say trot ye'll trot he shouts and no man is to stop or slow up to pick up any one hit next second crash comes another about a hundred yards off and before the lumps of it sung past ter rat yells the lieutenant now some people might call the ensuing movement a trot and some might call it a warm canter and first cousin to a gallop we seized the game in a wink to get past the spot the next crump was due to arrive on afore it did arrive we did too handsome and with some to spare though when i heard the roaring swoosh of it coming down i thought we was for it and a direct hit was due but it went well over and none of the splinters touched 
Steady there, steady, shouts the lieutenant, but keep going. They'll repeat the series if they got any sense. We could hear the blighters crumping away back down the road behind us, and believe me, we kept going all right. But the Bosch didn't repeat the series. He went on a new game, and just before we came to the end of the straight stretch, four crumps pitched down astride the road ahead of us about two hundred yards. One hit the edge of the road and the others in the fields on both sides, and one of these was a dud and didn't burst. But we knew that the fellers that did go off would make a highly unhealthy circle around, and the prospect of being there or thereabouts when the next bouquet landed wasn't none too alluring. The lieutenant yells to come on, and we came. Oh, take it from me, we came a humping. There was some fancy driving past them crump holes in the road, but we might have been at Olympia the way them drivers shaved past at the canter. We was just past the last spot the four landed when I heard the whistle of another bunch coming, and the air near lifted me cap off. Them wagons of ours isn't built for any speed records, but I fancy they covered more ground in the next few seconds than ever they'd done before. But going our best, there was no hope of clearing the blast of the explosions, if they explosioned in the same target, and we all made ourselves as small as we could on our horses' backs, and felt as we was as big as a barn all the time, and the rush was getting louder and louder. Then, thud, 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 and crash, three of them dropped blind, and only the one exploded and it being in the ditch didn't do any harm beyond sending up a spout of water about a mile high. Three duds out of four. If that wasn't a miracle, I want to know. But we wasn't counting too much on it being miracle die, and we kept the wheels going round with the whistle overhead and the crashes behind to discourage any loitering to gather flowers by the way. And when we was well past and slowed down again, I heard the lieutenant draw a deep breath and say soft-like, a packet of Chinese crackers. But he said something stronger that same night. He'd just crawled back to the column with his empty wagons, leaving me as orderly at the battery, and me having a pressing message to take back for more shells, I trotted out and got back soon after he did. I took my message to the old farm where the officers was billeted, and the messman takes my note in. I got a glimpse of the lieutenant weigh his jacket and boots off and his breeches following suit. I'd a rotten die, he was saying, but one good point about this am call job, and the only one I can see, is that you get the night in bed with your breeches off. But if you'd only heard him when he found out he was for the road again at once and would spend his night in the rain and dark instead of in bed, well, I couldn't repeat his language not having the talent to his extent. He was transferred to a battery soon after, and I heard that when he got the orders all he had to say was, Thank heaven! I'll maybe get shelled oftener in a battery, but at least I'll have the satisfaction of shelling back, and I may have a funk hole handy to duck in when it's extra hot, instead of riding on the road and expecting it to go off like a packet of crackers. Maybe he was right, concluded the bombardier reflectively. But I suppose it's entirely a matter of taste, and our man likes being killed off. End of section 13、section、14. The Signaller's Day of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The gun detachment were curled up and dozing on the damp straw of their dugout behind the gun when the mail arrived. The men had had an early turnout that morning, had been busy serving or standing by the gun all day, and had been under a heavy shell fire off and on for a dozen hours past. As a result, they were fairly tired. The strain and excitement of being under fire are even more physically exhausting somehow than hard bodily labor, and might have been hard to rouse. But the magic words, the mail, woke them quicker than a round of gunfire, and they sat up and rubbed the sleep from their eyes and clustered eagerly round the number one, uh, the sergeant in charge of the detachment, who was dishing out the letters. 
Thereafter, a deep silence fell on the dugout, the recipients of the letters crowding with bent heads round the guttering candle, the disappointed ones watching them with envious eyes. An exclamation of deep disgust from the signaller brought no comment until the last letter was read, but then the limber gunner remembered and remarked on it. "'What was that you was rearing up and snorting over signals?' he asked, carefully retrieving a cigarette stump from behind his ear and lighting up. The signaller snorted again. "'Just arc at this,' he said, unfolding his letter again. "'I'll just read this bit, and then I'll tell you the sort of merry dance I've had today. This is from an uncle of mine in London. He grouses a bit about the inconvenience of the dark streets, and then he goes on. Everyone at home is wondering why you fellows don't get a move on and do something. The official dispatches keeps on saying no movement or nothing to report. Or all quiet, till it looks as if you was all asleep. Why don't you get up and go for him? The signaller paused and looked up. Say, he said sarcastically, Everyone at home is wondering and doesn't like this all quiet business. I wish everyone at home, including this uncle of mine, had been up in the trenches to die. Have a lively time? asked the number one. We had some warmish spells back here. They had the range to a dock and plastered us enthusiastic with uh, six and eight inch Johnsons and H.G. E. shrapnel. With three wounded and Lucky to get off so light. Lively time's the right word for my performance, said the signaller. Nothing of the all quiet touch in my little lot today. It started when we was going up at daybreak, me and the other telephonist with the forward officer. You know that open stretch of road that takes you up to the opening of the communication trenches? Well, we're just nicely out in the middle of that when fizz comes a shell and bang just over our heads, and the shrapnel rips down on the road just behind us. Then bang, 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 they come along in a regular string down the road. They couldn't see us, and I suppose they was just shooting on the map in the hopes of catching any reliefs of the infantry on the road. Most of the shells was percussion after the first go, and they was slam-banging down in the road and the fields alongside and flinging dirt and gravel in showers over us. Come on, says the forward officer. This locality is looking unhealthy. And we picked up our feet and ran for it. Why, we wasn't all killed about ten times each, I'll never understand. But we wasn't, and we got to the end of the communication trench and dived into it as thankful as any rabbit that ever reached its burrow with a terrier on his tail. After we got a bit of breath back, we ploughed along the trench, it was about ankle-deep in bits, to the infantry headquarters, and the F.O. goes inside. After a bit, he comes out and tells me to come on with him up to the observation post. This was about eight at Kemma, and just getting light enough to say, you know what that observing post of ours is. The F.O. has a fond delusion that the germs can't see you when you leave the support trench and dodge up the wreckage to that hedge to the old house. But I have my own opinions about it. Anyway, I've never been up yet without a most unnatural lot of bullets chipping twigs off the edge and smacking into the ditch. But we got into the house all right, and I unslings my telephone, portable, D, Mark III, and connects up with the battery while the F.O. crawls up into the top story. He hadn't been there three minutes when smack, smack, I hears two bullets hit the tiles of the walls. The F.O. comes down again in about ten minutes and has a talk to the Major at the battery. He reports fairly quiet except some germ pipsqueak shells dropping out it on our right and a good deal of sniping rifle fire between the trenches in front of us. As a general thing, I've no serious objection to the trenches sniping at each other, if only the germs would aim more careful. But mostly they aim shocking, and anything that comes high for our trench just has the right elevation for our post. There's a broken window on the ground floor, too. Looking out of the room, we use it straight at the bushes, and the F.O. wouldn't have me block this up at no price. Concealment, says he, is better than protection. 
and if they see that winder sandbagged up it's a straight tip to them this is a post of some sort and a heavy invitation to them to plunk a shell or two in on us maybe he was right but you can't well conceal a whole house or even the four walls of one so i should have voted for the protection myself anyhow he said i could build a barricade at the foot of the stairs where i'd hear him call his orders down and i'd be behind some cover well, this motion was seconded by a bullet coming in the window and putting a hole in the eye of a life-size enlargement photo of a old lady in a poke bonnet hanging on the wall opposite the row of the splinter and glass made me think of jack johnson had arrived and i didn't waste time getting to work on my barricade i got a armchair and the half of a sofa and a broken-legged table and made that the foundation and up against the outside of them i stacked a lot of table linen and books and loose bricks and bottles and somebody's sunday clothes and a fender and fire irons and anything else i thought any good to turn a bullet i finished up by prizing up a hearthstone from the fireplace and propping it up against the back of the armchair and sitting down most luxurious in the chair and lighting up my pipe that's a long ways the most comfortable chair i've ever sat in deep soft springy seat and padded arms and covered in red velvet and i was just thinking what a treat it was when i hears the rifle fire out in front beginning to brisk up and the forward officer calls down to me to warn the battery to stand by because of some excitement in the trenches major says would you like him to give you them a few rounds sir i shouts up and the f o says yes three rounds gunfire on the lines the guns are laid so off goes your three rounds and i could hear your shells whooping along over our heads number one gun had twenty-five yards calls down the f o and then gives some more corrections and calls for one round battery fire by this time the rifle fire out in front was pretty thick and the bullets was hissing and whining past us and cracking on the walls another one came through the window and perforated the old lady's poke bonnet but none of them was coming near me and i was just about happily concluded i wasn't in the direct line of fire and was well covered from strays so i was snuggin down in my big easy chair with the d mark three on my knee puffin my pipe and repeatin the f o s orders as pleasant as you please when crack a bullet comes with a almighty smack through the back of the armchair bare inches off me ear comfort or no comfort thinks i this is where i resign the chair and i slides out and squats well down on the wet floor it's surprising too the amount of wet an ordinary carpet can hold and the chap that designed the pattern of this one might have worked in some water lilies and duckweed instead of red roses and pink leaves if he'd known how it would come to be used this house had been rather a swagger one judging by the style of the furniture but one end and a roof having gone west with the shelling the whole show ain't what it might be and when the missus as it belongs to returns to her happy home there's going to be some fervent remarks passed about the germs and the war generally but to get on with the drill the row in the trenches got hotter and hotter and our house might have been a high-powered magnet for bullets the way they was coming in through that open window special the old lady lost another eye and half an ear and her sunday gown had a big uh, gold brooch was shot to ribbage a bullet cut the cord at last and the old girl came down bump but i'd been watching her so long i felt she oughtn't to be disgraced lying there on her face before the german fire so i crawled out and propped her up against the wall with her face to the window i hope she'd be glad to know her photo went down with flying poke bonnet it was shortly after this our wire was first cut about ten akema that would be it i sings out to the f o that i was a disc but what with the bullets smacking into the walls the shells passing over us the coal boxes bursting around and the trenches belting off at their hardest the f o didn't hear me and i had to crawl up the stairs to him just as i got to the top a shrap burst and the bullets came smashing and tearing down through the tiles and rafters the bullets up there was whistling and whining past and over like the wind in a ship's rigging 
and every now and then, whack, one would hit a tile, sending the dust and splinters jumping. The F.O. was crouched up in one corner, where a handful of tiles was still clinging, and he was peeping out through these with his field glasses. Keep down, he says, when he saw me. There's a brace of blanket snipers been trying for a cold half hour to bullseye on to me. There they go again, and crack, smack, two bullets comes, one knocking another loose tile off a foot over his head, and t'other putting a china ornament on the mantelpiece on the casualty list. I reported the wire cut, and the F.O. says he'd come along with me and locate the break. We'll have to hurry, he says, cause it looks to me as if a real fight was breezing up. So we crawled out along the ditch and down the trench following the wire. We found the break, there was three cuts, along that bit of road that runs from the rolling river trench down past the bomb store, and I don't ever want a more highly exciting job than we had mending it. The shells was fair raining down the road, and the air was just humming like a harp string with bullets and rickos. We joined up and tapped in and found we was through all right, so we hustled back to the post. That house never was a real health resort, but today it was sort of wicked. They must have suspicioned there was a post there, and they kept on pasting shells at us. How they missed us so often, Evan and that German gunner only knows. They couldn't get a direct with solid, but I must admit they made goodish shooting with shrapnel, and they made the house look like a second-hand pepper caster. The F.O. was having a most unhappy time with shrapnel and rifle bullets, but he had his guns in action, so he just had to stick it out and go on observing, till the wires was cut again. This time the F.O. says to look back as far as the wire ran in the trench, and if I didn't find the break up there, come back and report to him. But I found the break in the edge just outside, and mended it, and went back, the bullets still zipping down, and me breaking all the hands and knees records for the fifty yards. I found the F.O. had reined back a bit from his corner, and was busy with a bedroom poker, breaking out a loophole through the bricks of the gable-end wall. He came down and told the major about it. It was getting too hot, he said, and the two snipers must have him located with field glasses. One bullet had nearly blinded him with broken tile dust, and another had tore a hole across the side of his British warm, so he was going to try observing through a couple of loopholes. Then he went up and finished his chipping and brought the guns into action again. Just in the middle of a series I feels a most unholy crash, and the old house rocked on its toe and heel. The brick dust and plaster came rattling down, and when the dust cleared a bit and I got my senses and my eyesight back, I could see a splintered hole in the far corner of my ceiling. I made sure the F.O. upstairs was blotted out, cause it was that corner upstairs where his loophole was. But next minute he sings out and asks was I all right. I never felt less all right in my life, but I told him I was still alive far as I knew. I crawled up to see what had happened, and there was him in one corner at his peephole, and the floor blowed the splinters behind him, and a big gap bust in the gable wall at the other corner. A shell had made a fair hit just about on his one loophole, while he was looking through the other. I believe we'll have to leave this, he says, and move along to our other post. It's a pity, cause I can't see near as well. If we don't leave this house, sir, I says, seems to me it'll leave us, and in apony numbers at that. So he reports to the major, and I packs up, and we cleared. The shelling had slacked off a bit, though the trenches were still slinging lead hard as ever. We must hurry, says the F.O. They're going to bombard a trench for ten minutes at noon, and I must be in touch by then. We scurried round to the other post, and just got fixed up before the shoot commenced. And in the middle of it, whoop, goes first one wire, and then the other. The F.O. said things out loud when I told him. Come along, he finished up. We must mend it at once. The infantry assault a trench at the end of the ten minutes. There they go now. And we heard the roar of the rifle swell up again. He took a long stare out through his glasses, and then we doubled out. 
the germs must have thought there was a big assault on and their gunners were putting a zone of fire behind the trenches to stop supports coming up and we had to go through that same zone if you please truth it was hot there was big shells or little shells and middle-sized shells roaring and shrieking up and bursting he shrapnel or smashing into the ground if there was one threw dirt over us there was a dozen one buzzed close past and burst about twenty feet in front of the F.O., and either the windage or the explosion lifted him off his feet and clean rolled him over. I thought he was a goner again, but when I came up to him he was picking himself up and spitting dirt and language out between his teeth, and none the worse except for the shaking. We couldn't find that break. We had to tap in all along the wire to locate it, and all the time it was a race between us finding the break and a shell finding us. At last we got it, where well, we'd run the wire over a broke-up shed. The F.O. was burning to talk to the battery, knowing they'd be anxious about their shoot, so he picked a spot in the lee of a wall and told me to tap in on the wire there. Just as he began talking to the battery, a coal box soars up and bumps down about twenty yards away and beyond us. The F.O. looks up, but goes on talking. But when another shell, and then another, drops almost on the exact same spot, he lifted the phone closer into the wall and stoops well down to it. I needn't tell you, I was down as close to the ground as I could get without digging. I think we're all right here, says the F.O., when another shell burst right on the same old spot and the splinters went singing over us. They look like keeping on the same spot and we must be out of the line the splinters take. Well, it looked like he was right, for about three more fell without touching us, and I was feeling a shite easier in my mind. There was some infantry coming up on their way to the support trenches, and they filed along by the wall that was covering us. Just as they was passing, another shell dropped. It was on the same spot as all the others, but blow me if it didn't get three of them infantry. They fell squirming right on top of us, and the instrument, so I concluded that spot wasn't as safe as the F.O. had reckoned, and there was a flaw in his argument somewheres that the coal box had found out. The F.O. saw that too, and we shifted out quick time. After that, things quieted down a bit, and the short hairs on the back of me neck had time to lie down. They stood on end again once or twice in the afternoon when we'd some more repairing under fire to do, and then to wind up the day they turned a maxim on just as we was coming away from the post, and we had to flop on our faces with the bullets zizz, 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 zipping just over us. We took a trench, I hear, and the jocks in front of us had thirty casualties, and the guards on our left had some more, cause I seen them coming back to the ambulance. On the old been about the most unpleasantest day I've spent for a spell. What we're wading to the knees in the trench mud, getting soaked through with rain, not having a decent meal all day, crawling about in mud and muck, and getting chivied and chased all over the landscape with shells and shrapnel and machine guns and rifles. I've just about had enough of this king and country game. The signaller paused a moment but his gaze fell on the letter he still held in his hand, and he tapped it with a scornful finger, and burst out again violently, King and country, eh? <laughs> and a bald-headed blighter sitting warm and dry and comfortable by his fireside at home, writes out and tells me what the country's thinking. I come in here after a day that's enough to turn the air of an earth horse gray, and I'm told about my pals being casualtied, and to top it all I gets a letter from home, why don't yer do something? Why don't yer get up and go for em? Ah. Home, remarked the limber gunner. Home don't know nothing about it. They don't, agreed the signaller. But what I wants to know, and there's many here like me, is why don't somebody let em know about it? Let em really know. End of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable